Order, please. We'll now begin with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. Presenting reports of committees. The Honourable Chair of the Law Amendments Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee on Law Amendments, I'm directed to report that the Committee has met and considered the following bills. Bill number 233, an act to amend Chapter 12 of the Acts of 2002, the Smoke-Free Places Act, and Chapter 14 of the Acts of 1993, the Tobacco Access Act. Bill number 234, an act to amend Chapter 1, 1992 supplement of the Revised Statutes 1989, the House of Assembly Act. Bill number 236, an act to amend Chapter 11 of the Acts of 1993, the Railways Act. Bill number 238, an act to amend Chapter 231 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Insurance Act. Bill number 240, an act respecting life partners in long-term care. The committee recommends these bills to the favorable consideration of the House without amendments. Order that these bills be referred to the Committee of the Whole House on Bills. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. Statements by ministers. Government notices, government notices of motion. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Aquaculture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future day I should move the adoption of the following congratulatory resolution. I don't think that's correct, but anyway, somebody messed up. Uh, where is the Bay of Fundy Inshore Fishermen's Association, Basil Rock, 3334 Lobster Association, the Coldwater Lobster Association, Maritime Fishermen's Union Local 9, and the Scotia Fundy Inshore Fishermen's Association joined in 2017 to form SOS Lobster Science Society, a historic partnership between industry, environmental, non-governmental organizations, and regulators. And whereas the SOS Lobster Science Society with the funding from the Atlantic Fish Fund is approved for a three-year pilot project offering fishermen an alternative at sea observa uh, al alternative to at sea observers plan, collect scientific data to assist in conservation efforts. Whereas the pilot representatives of about 52% of license holders in the identified lobster fishing area, Southwest Lobster Science Society collaborated successfully to offer fishermen throughout the region an alternative to DFO's at sea lobster observation plan. Whereas, therefore, it be resolved that this program pro provide an opportunity for fishermen to demonstrate strength in, strength in numbers and participate in an industry owned science research initiatives while meeting the requirements outlined by DFO for monitoring bycatchers. And Mr. Speaker, I would uh, request waiver of notice and patches without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, may I make a, an introduction? Permission granted. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I direct uh, the members' attention to the East Gallery, uh, where I would like to introduce some special guests. Uh, Kate Camo, a dietitian with Dietitians of Canada, Media and Public Relations. And, and as, I, as I call out uh, your names or group, please uh, feel free to stand uh, so people can uh, recognize you. Uh, Jackie Spears, Dietitian and Executive Director, Nova Scotia with Dietitians Canada. Carissa Belfontaine, Dietitian with Nova Scotia Health Authority. And we have a number of graduate and undergraduate students studying nutrition at Mount St. Vincent University as well. Uh, they can all uh, please stand. And uh, I'd just like to uh, ask my colleagues here on the floor of the legislature to please uh, give our guests a warm welcome. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution.
Whereas healthy eating and proper nutrition are foundational for overall health at any age, and whereas dietitians are valued healthcare professionals who practice in a variety of settings and support Nova Scotians in optimizing their health and well-being while reducing the risk of diseases and illness through their expertise, and whereas Dietitians of Canada is a professional nationwide organization which provides credible information about nutrition, thereby enhancing and improving the lives of citizens in Nova Scotia and beyond. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly join in recognizing March as Nutrition Month in Nova Scotia, an opportunity to encourage all Nova Scotians to increase their awareness of the benefits of healthy eating through a variety of fun and educational events. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Aquaculture and Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas J.D. Compost, a new business based out of Matagan, made their debut, debut this summer by constructing a 2,000 square foot home made of approximately 600,000 recycled plastic bottles. And whereas JD Compost places recycling as the top priority of their business and having close ties with the fishing industry and one of their partners, Joel German, CEO of I DeVoe Fisheries, has expanded their business portfolio to include decking used on lobster tank houses in Southwest Nova. The 115-foot walkway is non-skid, durable, and made from approximately 8,000 recycled plastic bottles. And whereas the partners of JD Compost, David Swinimer and Joel German, are recognized by the Clare Chamber of Commerce as Entrepreneurs of the Year for their outstanding innovations and their field in developing sustainable construction material to help address the global issue of discarded plastic. Whereas the part partners of JD Compost, David Swinimer and Joel German, have been recognized as an innovative company as creating custom materials for use in the seafood sector and beyond. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage of the debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Acadian Affairs. President, à une date ultérieure, je demanderai l'adoption de la résolution suivante. Attendu que le gouvernement du Canada investit dans l'attraction et la rétention d'immigrants francophones, entre autres par un projet pilote mené par l'entremise de l'immigration pour les communautés francophones en situation minoritaire. Et attendu que le choix de, du réseau en immigration francophone de la Nouvelle-Écosse a sélectionné la communauté acadienne de Claire pour participer à ce projet de communauté accueillante en raison de son réseau d'organismes, d'associations et d'institutions francophones. Et attendu qu'un groupe de travail, en consultation avec la communauté, a établi un plan d'action sur trois ans visant à sensibiliser la communauté et à mieux reconnaître les besoins, les réalités et enjeux des nouveaux arrivants. Par conséquent, il est résolu que les membres de l'Assemblée législative se joignent à moi pour féliciter la communauté acadienne de Claire pour sa sélection et pour célébrer cette initiative qui renforcera davantage l'immigration francophone dans les régions acadiennes et francophones de la Nouvelle-Écosse. Monsieur le Président, je demande l'adoption de cette résolution sans préavis et sans débat. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the following resolution. Whereas the Government of Canada is investing in the attraction and retention of French-speaking immigrants, among other things, through a pilot project carried out through immigration for French-speaking minority communities. And whereas the Réseau en Immigration Francophone de la Nouvelle-Écosse selected the Acadian community of Clare to participate in this welcoming community project because of its established network of Francophone organizations, associations, and institutions. And whereas a working group in consultation with the community has established a three-year action plan to raise awareness in the community and better recognize the needs, realities, and challenges of newcomers. Therefore, be it resolved 
that members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating the Acadian community of Clare for their selection and to celebrate this initiative, which will further strengthen Francophone immigration to Nova Scotia's Acadian and Francophone regions. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas in the lead up to the 2020 general municipal elections, the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing is partnering to design and deliver activities aimed at improving participation of underrepresented groups in municipal democracy, including women who can often face barriers to running for office. And whereas a long-term goal through this work is to help ensure our municipal councils reflect the gender and diversity of Nova Scotia, and whereas Municipal Affairs and Housing is working with colleagues from the status of women and providing support for the local government leadership school for women happening in Port Hawkesbury in May, which is a great example of how communities are providing knowledge and tools for women who want to run for elected positions. Therefore, be it resolved that as March 8th is International Women's Day, members of the House of Assembly recognize the work being done to help promote gender equity in our local democracies and pledge to offer their support in any way possible. And Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Community Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Zonta International is a global organization of professionals empowering women th worldwide through service and advocacy, and whereas Zonta International is helping ensure women's rights are recognized as human rights and every woman is able to, to, to achieve her full potential. Whereas this year, Zonta International is celebrating 100 years of promoting the empowerment and rights of of women, young women and girls across the globe. Therefore, be it resolved, the members of this House join me in commending the work of the Zonta International and commit to doing what we can to empower women and girls in communities across Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without Minister. debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. We'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 26 of the Acts of 2019, the Sustainable Development Goals Act. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 26 of the Acts of 2019, the Sustainable Development Goals Act. Bill number 247, an act to amend chapter 26 of the Acts of 2019, the Sustainable Development Goals Act. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce an act entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 1, 1992 Supplement of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the House of Assembly Act to provide for scheduled sittings of the House of Assembly. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 1 the 1992 Supplement of the Revised Statutes 1989 of the House of Assembly Act to provide for scheduled sittings of the House of Assembly. Bill number 248, an act to amend Chapter 1, 1992 Supplement of the Revised Statutes 1989, the House of Assembly Act, to provide for scheduled sittings of the House of Assembly. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a bill entitled An Act to Require the Government of Nova Scotia to Purchase Agricultural Products from Nova Scotia Producers.
The Honourable Member for Cumberland North begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Require the Government of Nova Scotia to Purchase Agricultural Products from Nova Scotia Producers. Bill number 249, an act to require the government of Nova Scotia to purchase <coughs> agricultural products from Nova Scotia producers. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. We'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to recognize the late Bob Ferguson. Bob was a well-known member of the community in Westville who served in the local fire department, had a local store, and was the founding member of the Pictou County Rivers Association. He was a scout leader, and he even played in a well-known band called the Blue Cats. His local store not only had the best penny candy, penny candy in town, but also because he was such a fish, fishing enthusiast, it became Ferguson's sports shop, and he had the best supply of fishing and hunting gear. This year, the Pictou County Rivers Association named their annual fishing derby in honor of Bob. I ask all members to join me in sending our sincere condolences to Bob's family and friends and recognizing a good man and a life well lived. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge a local multi-use performance venue located on Goddardton Street in Halifax Needham. For 17 years, the Bus Stop Theatre has served as the city's only independently operated, accessible and professionally equipped performance space. Since 2012, it has operated as a cooperative. The theatre has hosted countless emerging and professional artists, both local and touring, and has doubled as a gallery, workshop, venue, screening cinema, and community meeting space. In 2019 alone, it hosted more than 150 public events and welcomed more than 16,000 audience members. It is in the midst of a cap capital raising campaign to purchase, renovate, and expand their space. And on February 26, I rejoice with many community members after the province announced that it would fund the Bus Stop Theatre to the tune of $355,000. This is in addition to the $250,000 commitment from HRM, and I wish to applaud the Bus Stop Theatre on its success thus far as it continues on their mission. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate William Gerhardt, who won the 2019 Film Crew Excellence Award at the Nova Scotia Awards in May. The Screen Nova Scotia Awards celebrate the talent, creativity, and passion that are in the trademarks of Nova Scotia's screen industry. William won his award for transforming Yarmouth's Kate Fourchu into an island from the 1800s for Robert Eggers' most recent film, The Lighthouse. This film was screened at the 2019 Cannes Film Festival. William has also worked on a variety of other productions which have included The Mist, The Curse of Oak Island and The Book of Negroes. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that you members of this House of Assembly please join me in congratulating William Gerhardt for receiving the 2019 Film Crew Excellence Award at the Screen Nova Scotia Awards. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the Epilepsy Association of the Maritimes and the National Epilepsy Awareness Month of March. There are between 4,500 and 9,000 Nova Scotians living with epilepsy today. The association realizes the need for awareness, communication and ed education such as seizure first aid and offers all of this to its schools, community groups and individuals alike. None of this would be possible without the dedication of volunteers who fundraise for this great cause. March 26th is Purple Day, now celebrated in over 100 countries around the world, founded by Nova Scotia's very own Cassidy Megan. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in thanking the Epilepsy Association of the Maritimes for their tireless advocacy and to recognize National Epilepsy Awareness Month of March and last but not least, Cassidy Megan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Dacia McDonald, an exceptional employee at the Cash and Goodman Library. For the past seven years, Dacia has been responsible for adult programming, newcomer services, and community engagement. Aside from being a valuable team member, Dacia sits on the Mobile Food Market Board. 
Through her position at the, li at, at the library, she has, be, uh, she has been able to supply the market with iPads, staff support, and special programs for market days. Additionally, Dacia, uh, Dacia sorry, uh, was able to find a winter home for the program on Ford Street. Mr. Speaker, I ask that this House of Assembly join me in applauding Dacia. She is a proud citizen of Clayton Park West, where she lives, works, and has raised her family. Thank you, Dacia. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to talk about one of the largest recreational adult hockey tournaments, which is held in Cape Breton. The 31st anniversary of the Vince Ryan Memorial Hockey Tournament will be held this March 19th through the 22nd, with over 160 teams participating. The tournament was launched in tribute to John Vincent Ryan's accomplishment. He was from Duncan and began playing organized hockey in the late 1940s, leading his teams to local and maritime championships. I'd like to stand here today, Mr. Speaker, to commend all the people who worked tirelessly to make this tournament such a huge success, and, and to all who participate making it worthwhile. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, tomorrow is International Women's Day, and I'd like to take a moment to recognize some special people. Thank you to Chris Hornberger, Martha Reynolds, Angelie McNeil Campbell, Linda Wilson, Marion Brown, Kelly Becky, and all the incredible women who make up my team, which is 80% women. Thank you to, to my sister in law, Teresa, who volunteered countless hours fighting for the Preston Land title claims, to Katie Dickinson, who's a wonderful, brilliant scientist, my mother in law, Rafina Moyer, and my sister in law, Rafina Callback who are always there for me. Most importantly, my wife, Rena, who is my best friend in rock, and to my daughters, Isla and Rafina, uh, you can be whatever your heart desires. Mr. Speaker, I am surrounded by incredible, strong, funny, talented women. Thank you for all you do, and happy International Women's Day. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate members of the Sackville Lions Club. On April 10th, 1970, the Sackville Lions Club was formed, which means this year they will be commemorating their 50th charter anniversary. To celebrate this occasion, they will host a dinner and dance on Saturday, April 18th, 2020, at the Sackville Legion. Members of the Sackville Lions Club are very supportive of their community, raising funds to assist numerous organizations and service projects throughout the year. Mr. Speaker, I ask that all members of this House of Assembly join me in congratulating the Sackville Lions Club on their 50th charter anniversary and thank them for their continued efforts to support the community of Lower Sackville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for King South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With 46,000 clubs and 1.35 million members worldwide, the Lions Club is the world's largest service club organization. We are fortunate to have four active Lions clubs in my area, Colebrook, New Minus, Wolfville, and Hansport. This year, the New Minus and District Lions Club is celebrating their 50th anniversary under the leadership of King Lion, Shirley Reed. Whether hosting community breakfasts, collecting used glasses for the Lions Recycle for Sight program, beautifying roadways through the Adopt a Highway program, or supporting fundraising initiatives for the Salvation Army and op Open Arms Shelter, the New Minus Lions volunteers make a significant and lasting contribution to our communities. Mr. Speaker, I invite all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating the New Minus and District Lions Club and their members on 50 years of community service, putting into action their commitment to the Lions motto, we serve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize John Stewart. He's a teacher who's been a staple at Prince Andrew High School, and he'll be retiring at the end of 2019-2020. Since 2017, John's been saying that he'll retire next year. In 2020, three years after he initially said he'd retire, he's actually working his final year as register at PA. Throughout his career, John has spearheaded many opportunities for students. Most prominently, his efforts in getting PA students to the 100th anniversary of Vimy Ridge in 2017. John is an incredibly hard worker, and without a doubt, his presence at PA will be missed by fellow staff and students alike. Mr. Speaker, I ask that members of the House congratulate John on his fulfilling career as a teacher, and I wish him luck during his final semester. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize the Samuel Prince Manor Tenants Committee. 
This group is concerned with increasing the well-being of their fellow residents at Samuel Prince Manor, a large public housing uh, high-rise for seniors in Halifax Needham. And the group keeps busy. They organize weekly bingo, uh, occasional karaoke nights, an annual Christmas dinner, and a community Canada Day barbecue and celebration that draws upwards of 200 people. These activities are made possible through their ongoing fundraising efforts. They also coordinate to bring more services to residents in the building, including income tax support, flu shots, blood pressure tests, and more. In February, they collaborated with my office to offer a meet and greet where tenants had an opportunity to share their concerns, do a fitness class, and enjoy refreshments together. Last year, they lost their beloved president, Sharon Briand. Bill Boudelier has assumed the role of president and they continue her legacy of community spirit and service today. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the UPS store South Shore Mustangs Major Midget Hockey Club. For the first time in the club's 35-year history, they have clinched first place in the eight-team Nova Scotia Major Midget Hockey League. The Mustangs finished the season with 51 points, just one point ahead of the Halifax McDonalds. The 2019-20 regular season championship team is a talented, dedicated group of tenacious hockey players who are mentored and trained by a knowledgeable and dedicated coaching staff. I would ask the members of the House of Assembly to please join me in congratulating all the players, coaches, volunteers and parents on this successful season. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Muskegon Valley, Colchester. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, join me in congratulating the Nova Scotia Trucking Safety Association on this 20th anniversary, particularly Middle Muskegon's Brian Decker of WIT Trucking Limited as the 2019 recipient of the Association Safety Representative Award. Since its formation. The NSTSA has regularly increased its programming, offered more than 20 programs and services, including occupational health and safety programs, workplace hazardous materials information, system training, and safety audits. Their efforts have paid off across the industry, but most particularly in the bulk liquid group. Despite risks and hazards associated with loading, unloading, and transporting goods like water, milk, and gas, this group realizes a workers' compensation assessment rate that is lower than the average rate in Nova Scotia. So I ask all members of the legislature to join me in congratulating both NSTSA and Brian Decker of WIT Trucking Limited. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to share some information about a Bedford business. Taste of Mauritius is a catering company opened by a Mauritian expat, Malini Verasami McDonald. Malini also has takeout nights and sells for spices across the Maritimes. Mauritius is an island in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Africa. Malini originally wanted to showcase her country of origin through its cuisine. There's a real food culture there. Her new business has had the added advantage of connecting her children to her heritage. In Mauritius, the kitchen is the centre of the family, and now Malini's children are learning about their cuisine and learning how to cook it too. Another plus is that Nova Scotians are enjoying the taste of Mauritian food with its fresh ingredients and Indian influences. I'd like to congratulate Malini Verasami McDonald on five years of business success and thank her for opening her kitchen to Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with International Women's Day coming up uh, on Sunday, I wanted to rise today to acknowledge the Millwood High School girls sports teams and the great season that they've actually been having this 2019-20 uh, year. In particular, the Millwood High girls volleyball team who won a silver at Provincials in December. Millwood High's girl hockey team, who on February 20th won their second division regional games and went on to play provincials on February 28th at Dalbray Academy. And the Millwood High girls curling team, who won their metro and regional championships on February 27th. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take an opportunity to congratulate not only Millwood High's girls volleyball, hockey and curling teams for their big wins, but all the other girls sports that are at Millwood High School and wish them all the best in the rest of the season to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member for Claire Digby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I did want to open up by wishing a happy birthday to uh, probably the most special person in my life, somebody that supports all of us uh, when we're in here, my wife, Deidre, on a, on a big day today. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank Mike Sorensen of Nashwalk Valley Farm as well as the staff of La Villa Kedian and Tideview Terrace for making Valentine's Day extra special for their residents. Nashwalk Valley Farms has a collection of baby llamas, mini donkeys and Nubian goats spend the warmer months of the year going to the fairs and exhibitions. In the winter, instead of staying at their home base in Nashwalk River, they spend some time in the winter months on the road visiting schools and senior residents. For the seniors, these are special visits during the time of the year when they often can't get out into the community. On the 14th, they waited eagerly for the arrival of Nashwalk Valley Farm and their collection of animals. They were not disappointed as the animals arrived ready to be petted and cuddled. Some of the residents were delighted to see a llama or a mini donkey for the first times in their lives. These types of visits are so important for our seniors and the many, talk, and the many of them talk for days later about the visit of Nashwalk Valley Farms. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Picto West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate the recipients of the 2020 Ed Bowden Community Wellness Award, the Kids Cooking Table, a project hosted by the Scottsburn Recreation Club. The award was established in 2010 by the Picto West and Central East Picto Community Health Boards in consultation with the Bowden family. It is presented an annually to a community group that reflects Mr. Bowden's strong community spirit, his passion for leading a healthy lifestyle, his volunteerism, and his legacy as a role model. The goals of the Kids Cooking Table project were to promote healthy eating, teach cooking skills, get kids excited about cooking, build an active community garden, and bring community members together. Mr. Speaker, please join me in thanking the Scottsburn Recreation Club for this amazing initiative and in congratulating the organizers of the Kids Cooking Table for receiving the Ed Bowden Community Wellness Award. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yarmouth Scott Jeffrey was named Baseball Nova Scotia's 2019 Coach of the Year. Scott coached the Chris Scott Construction Pee Wee AAA Gateways, helping guide them to become Atlantic champions, a huge and impressive accomplishment. Being named the province's Baseball Coach of the Year is another honour in Scott Jeffrey's involvement in the sport of baseball. He was a teenager in 1990 when he was signed by the Toronto Blue Jays and joined their minor league system. He later joined the legendary Yarmouth Gateways and helped them reach the 1994 Senior League Championship Series. I'd like to ask this House to join me in congratulating Aramis Scott Jeffrey on being named Baseball Nova Scotia's 2019 Coach of the Year and in thanking him for dedicating his time, skills and energy to our youth. His contributions to the sport of baseball and to our community will be remembered for many years to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Queen's County Sarah Mitten started throwing shot put in junior high school and never looked back. She has a most impressive list of accomplishments, victories, and personal bests, some of which have already been celebrated in this legislature. In February of this year, she traveled to New Zealand, New Zealand and threw yet another personal best of 18.84 meters. The, this performance surpasses the 2020 Olympic Games standard in means that Sarah will be representing Canada in Queens County in the shot putt circle in Tokyo, Japan. This is indeed an impressive accomplishment, but outside of the shot putt circle, Sarah has also managed to marry an honors Bachelor of Science in Biology degree from the University of Windsor. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members to join me in congratulating this impressive young woman on her accomplishments and wishing her success in to Tokyo and beyond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Preston Dartmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Ethan Firth, a resident of Porter's Lake, who is his 13th year student at Gatesbrook in the French Immersion Program. He's a member of the Arenda Canoe Club in Lake Echo and is talented in a kayak, coming third in the 16-year-old category, category in a national K6, K1 race held in Winnipeg, Manitoba. He, in, in addition, is talented also in hockey. He was nominated and won the Atlantic Division Top Male Athlete of the Year. 
I recognize and congratulate Ethan Firth for achieving this high level of athletic achievement in kayaking and wish him every success in the future. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased, along with the 1859 Royal Canadian Army Cadet Corps, to announce that Chief Warrant Officer Kelsey Waddell and Warrant Officer Angel Crow have been selected to attend Exercise Sub-Zero in Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador. Approximately 25 cadets from all over Atlantic Canada will be at Happy Valley Goose Bay for a week of winter camping and survival expeditions. These two cadets working in teams will be trekking and camping in the Labrador background covering 40 kilometres on a pair of snowshoes to meet their accomplishments and de uh, destination. Mr. Speaker, this is a wonderful challenge and experience for both of these young ladies from Spring Hill and their family, friends and community are very proud of their accomplishments and wish them all the best of luck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dermot North. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to remember and to honour a beloved member of the Dartmouth North community, Frances Hazel Hunter, who passed away January 4th of this year. Frances was married to her sweetheart for 69 years, a mother of four, grandmother to 12, great-grandmother to 10, and great-great-grandmother to three. She was an extremely active member of Stairs Memorial United Church, sitting on many boards and committees. She was also a member of the Stairs UCW, Garnet Rebecca Lodge and Topaz Rebecca Lodges, Ladies Auxiliary, Patriarchs Militant, and Queen Esther Chapter 61 of Eastern Star. Frances wrote in her own obituary, my proudest accomplishment is my 40 plus years with the North Dartmouth Outreach Resource Center Food Bank. She was completely dedicated to her work at the food bank and the kindness with which she treated the clients made a huge difference to them. A testament to her commitment to Dartmouth North, Frances' celebration of life was standing room only and fittingly at the front door, sorry, at the front of the church, there was a basket for food bank donations. I want to express my sincere condolences to Frances' family, friends and community and my deep gratitude to her and what she gave to her family, friends, and the North Dartmouth community. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings West. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize an exceptional group of young ladies and their leaders. As grade fours, the Sisters of Science entered a LEGO competition and after four years had gained provincial and international recognition. After placing third overall and winning the Innovation Solution Award to Maritime Regional Competition at Acadia in 2019, they qualified and attended the Mountain State Invitational Robotics event in West Virginia. In the 2020 Maritime Regional at Acadia University, the SOS All Girls Team won the inspirational award for their balanced emphasis on all areas, robot, project, and core values. I ask all members of the legislature to join me in extending best wishes to Amelia and Hallie Blatch, Kenzie McNeil, Kaylee Jefferson, Carmen Glavine as they end their SOS involvement. Also kudos to younger member Abby Murphy and their very special leaders, Krista McNeil and Sarah Chisholm. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to salute Lloyd Francis of Sydney Mines. This 30-year-old has had life experiences to certainly last a lifetime. For the past year and a half, Lloyd was aboard the tall ship Golden Lou, a Lunenburg-based ocean-going classroom for students aged 15 to 20. Lloyd taught political science and global history aboard the ship while, lear while learning how to sail and had the opportunity to visit four continents and see sites like the Sahara Desert and the Amaha, <clears throat> the Amazon rainforest. At some ports of call, the crew even got involved in local community projects. Lloyd is back in Cape Breton now, working as a substitute teacher for the Cape Breton Victoria Regional Education Centre. Mr. Speaker, Lloyd can bring incredible life experiences to the classroom. How much richer he will make the students' learning experience. I wonder how many future world adventurers will be inspired by Lloyd's stories. Inspiring our young can be our greatest gift that we can provide them with. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member for Dermot North. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to bring attention to Amanda Nickerson, who, among many other awesome things, coordinates the Food Fit program at the Dartmouth North Community Food Center. Amanda came to work at the Food Center by way of the Dartmouth Family Center, where she was a participant in the programs there with her two children. 
When the Dartmouth North Community Food Centre opened its doors, Amanda volunteered there, and when the centre began the Food Fit program, she took on the role of coordinator in a paid position. Food Fit is a 12-week program developed to help people become healthier through being fit. The participants learn about basic nutrition and smart goals, and then bring what they've learned to the kitchen, cooking beautiful recipes together. While the food cooks, they go for a 30-minute walk and then come back and share the meal. The pillars of this free program are to move more, to try new foods, and to make new friends. Mr. Speaker, Amanda leads this program, which is starting up again on March 28th with joy and energy, which seemed to me seem to me to be her natural state. She is one of the one of the reasons that why the Dartmouth North Community Food Centre is such a special place in our community. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Grimesboro Eastern Shore, Trackety. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize and commend the creative spirit and artistic talent found in Guysborough County, represented by visual artists and crafters of Artworks East. Artworks East is a visionary community where the skills and related products of the visual arts and crafts are appreciated, shared, taught, promoted, and purchased by residents and visitors, both young and old. <clears throat> This past fall, Artworks East planned an amazing and successful event, the Artworks East Exhibition and Sale, hosted at the Cancer Lions Club in Canso. The Exhibition and Sale provided many talented artists with the opportunity to connect with those who appreciate their artwork and provide the community an opportunity to support their local artists and crafters while enjoying their creations. Artworks East definitely gives back to the community, not only in the beautiful arts and crafts they have to offer, but also in providing open studios such as that at the Boylston Schoolhouse, where creativity and community is fostered. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to applaud Art for East for their creative endeavors. Art truly touches the soul and tells the story of a community. We're lucky to have Art Works East telling ours. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. That the Scotts Bay Community Hall Association does to improve the life of all residents of Scotts Bay. The hall hosts many events, including potluck suppers, flea markets, auctions, community suppers, breakfast, costume parties, Christmas events, and community meetings. The Scotts Bay Community Hall Association directors include Jerry Huntley, Chair, Fred Huntley, Vice Chair, William Poole, Treasurer, Hope Corkum, Secretary, and Directors Walter Huntley, David Corkum, and Peter Huntley. On behalf of the residents of Scotts Bay, I wish to thank the Community Hall Association Board of Directors for their commitment to making the Bay a great place to live. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Armdale. Mr. Speaker, after years of prayer, discussion and research, parishioners in my Maronite Catholic faith community of Our Lady of Lebanon Parish have a very exciting milestone coming up this spring when our new church opens at Clayton Park Drive for its first Mass. The new structure is impressive and includes a beautifully designed church for prayer and worship, new classroom spaces for our youth, community space for activities outside of the liturgy, and the multi-use Cedar Events Center. The capital campaign entitled Faith is Our Foundation has been underway for years, and I was proud to hear that my late father had been the first donor to this fund. His Eminence, Bishop Paul Merwan Tabbitt, will be joining us to consecrate the building, and it promises to be a very special occasion for a growing and vibrant congregation like ours. I want to thank our clergy, the fundraising committee, the planning and development committee, all groups and generous donors and partners, and especially the parishioners of our church who have continued the growth of our Maronite Catholic identity in Nova Scotia and helped bring this fantastic new structure to fruition. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to recognize Trina Clark and Allison Lair at the Cumberland YMCA for hosting the coldest night of the year walk in support of the homeless. This year, over 100 people participated in the walk, which took place on February 22nd. Their goal this year was to raise $20,000. The Cumberland YMCA and the Homelessness Prevention Program have been working in our community to help those who are homeless and those at risk of being homeless. Mr. Speaker, Trina and Allison's work um, help bring both awareness and support for the community and are a great example of Cumberland North's giving hearts. I want to give special thanks to Allison Lair, who works very closely with my constituency assistant, helping those find shelter uh, th that are in need in Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce the Holland Road Elementary School in Fletcher's Lake is recipient of a 10,000 Music Counts Canada National Award. The Music Count Band Aid Program provides $900,000 in musical instruments and equipment to 90 schools across Canada. Holland Road Elementary received $10,000, which will enable the school to grow their existing music program or to help build band new music programs. Mr. Speaker, I ask that all members of the host to join me in congratulating Holland Road on receiving this exciting and important contribution to the music program. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour, Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize <coughs> Caregivers Nova Scotia for expanding their meetings to include Eastern Passage. The group facilitator, Catherine Parent, is a caregiver support coordinator. The group offers a confidential setting where you can talk about your experiences with other caregivers, all while trying to meet their goals of empowering and supporting each other. Caregivers Nova Scotia's main office is located in Halifax, and it offers many support groups around the province. Aside from the group settings, they also provide phone and email support, as well as coordinate workshops and presentations. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in welcoming Caregivers Nova Scotia to Eastern Passage and to thank them for all of their community support. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, women represent only 2% of the world's 1.2 million seafarers, so today I rise to recognize Jennifer Allen. Jennifer is a certified master mariner and instructor at NSCC's Nautical Institute Strait Area Campus and a member of the Canadian Forces Coats Reserves. Jennifer has spent the majority of her seagoing experience within the seismic industry as a watch-keeping mate and traveling to locations including Canada's East Coast, the Arctic, the Gulf of Mexico, Brazil, and Angola as part of her employment in the marine industry. In addition to her civilian career, she has spent 10 years in the Canadian Naval Reserve and currently volunteers with two sea cadet units in Cape Breton. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I ask the House to join me in commending Jennifer on her achievements and share in my admiration of having such a valuable role model for women in our community. May the women she inspires follow Jennifer's example, confident they too can be successful in a male-dominated world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Anaganish. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in, uh, uh, I guess in the theme uh, started uh, by my colleague, the Minister of Claire Digby, uh, I too, first uh, very quickly, would like to uh, wish his wife a very happy uh, birthday uh, today. Uh, but in that theme, I, uh, I would like to wish my wife a happy birthday today as well. And for the record, uh, Mr. Chair, I, Mr. Speaker, I need to uh, let her and all members here know that in fact those flowers you received were not sent by the member from Fairview Clayton Park. I did send those flowers to you uh, today. Um, and so uh, it is now part of official record in the province of Nova Scotia. They were flowers I sent, not the member from Fairview Clayton Park. <laughs> Happy birthday. We'll see you when we get home this weekend. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Uh, th <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Shannon McKay of Lower Sackville. Shannon McKay is presently in her third year at Acadia University in Woofle and working towards her Bachelor of Music. Shannon is excelling in her studies and shares her beautiful singing voice at recitals, concerts, and sporting events. On March 3rd, 2020, Shannon was honored to have been chosen to sing O Canada during the Canadian Citizenship Ceremony, which took place at Acadia University. To her great surprise, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was the guest <laughs> speaker. Following the ceremony, the Prime Minister made a special effort to personally thank her. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask that all members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating Shannon McKay for sharing her talents with Canada's newest citizens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, earlier this year, the community of Halifax Atlantic and all of Halifax received a tremendous gift. The Shaw Wilderness, a 379-acre park, the largest green space in HRM, was announced. Thanks to the hard-working people of the Nature Conservancy of Canada, the Purcells Cove Backlands members, Mayor Savage, Councillor Steve Adams, and the member for Timberley Prospect, 
and countless volunteers for the $8 million which was raised to create this beautiful park. Mr. Speaker, as both a youth and an adult, I have spent countless hours hiking, swimming, fishing, and exploring the backlands. Now, thanks to these hardworking, forward-thinking individuals, my children and countless others will be able to enjoy and create memories. Thank you for conserving our green space and our wildlife. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Mr. Speaker, I rise to congratulate the new executive of Branch 16 of the Royal Canadian Legion, Picto. Mike Murdoch will serve as the new president, with Rob McNeil as first vice president and Mike Pigeon as second vice president. Cliff Bush will serve as secretary. Royal Canadian Legions are an important part of the fabric of Nova Scotia, serving the needs of veterans since World War I. Legions are comprised of past and present Canadian force members, as well as Canadians who wish to support veterans. The Picto branch is not just busy on November 11th. It is active all year long with a variety of events and activities. Mr. Speaker, please join me in congratulating the new executive of Branch 16 of the Royal Canadian Legion and in wishing them a successful year. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank Bob Zink of Dayspring for the joy he and his wife Marlene have brought to so many people with their Christmas village. For the past 17 years, Bob and Marlene have created a two-acre winter wonderland that lights up nightly throughout the Christmas period until the first day of the new year. Bob's display includes an animated Santa Claus, decorative polar bears, snowmen, igloos, nutcrackers and candy canes. As well, there are several sections with individual themes. New additions are made every year. Not only do local people visit, but also people from as far away as Picto. Bob intends to continue putting up the display as long as he is able. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that you and the members of this House of Assembly to please join me in thanking Bob Zink for all the hard work he does to create his Christmas village that lights up day spring and is a tradition that is enjoyed by so many. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Liverpool Privateers head to East Hants on Friday night, tied at two games each, and their best of seven Fred Fox Division Series with the Penguins after a 9-8 overtime barn burner in Liverpool on Tuesday. The Privateers are getting high-octane performance from Ian McPhee and Cam Scott, who each have four goals and 12 points through four games. The team is back in Liverpool this Saturday night uh, at 7 o'clock, and as always, I expect our crowd to be the biggest and the loudest in the Nova Scotia Junior Hockey League. I ask all members to join me in wishing the Liverpool Privateers all the best. Bring it home, boys. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize a local market in my riding that is offering a very unique atmosphere. atmosphere. The Bedford Basin Farmers Market is owned by a Greek entrepreneur, Peter Giniolis. It opened in 2015 and has created a wonderful European feel in Clayton Park West. It is both a family and a business-friendly destination. It is located on the gorgeous Bedford Basin, overlooking the water, and it's home to my constituency office. I cannot tell you how many of my, constitu my constituents I get to meet uh, because of the bustling cafe next door. This market provides so many amenities. It is a meeting place, a coffee shop, a lunch, or a Sunday brunch uh, spot. It also offers catering for parties and conferences in their gala room. Mr. Speaker, I ask that this House of Assembly join me in congratulating the Bedford Basin Farmers Market on their entrepreneurial success and for enriching Clayton Park West. Thank you. Good job. Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to recognize the Amherst Royals, who were recently featured on a stamp issued by Canada Post on January 23rd. The Amherst Royals were part of the Coloured Hockey League, which was based in the Maritimes and formed from Baptist Church congregations and ran from 1895 to 1930. This is, is an important part of Cumberland North's and Nova Scotia's history. I am proud to see the Amherst Royals get their recognition on this stamp. 
Many of the Amherst Royals have descendants in our community who love the game and can take pride in this part of our history. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much for those member statements. We'll uh, enjoy a couple of moments of peace and quiet before question period. <laughs> We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, recently all Nova Scotia ran a report with, with respect to who knew what about the alleged DUI from November 2018. The report was a timeline of the Premier's comments on the situation. On October 15, 2019, the Premier was asked in a scrum regarding the Thanksgiving DUI, is this something you had no inkling of before? The Premier's response was, I knew he was in recovery for sure. Last week, the Premier stated that, I found out about his alcoholism when he was picked up for impaired driving. First, the Premier said he knew about the issues prior to Thanksgiving, and then he claimed he didn't know prior to Thanksgiving. Mr. Speaker, both of those statements can't be true. Uh, I'd like to ask the Premier, will the Premier please explain why he gave one version of the events uh, in 2019 and then a totally new version just last week? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, answer the Honourable Member's question. Uh, the reality is I didn't give two uh, answers, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when the, the incident happened in Thanksgiving weekend of 2019, I was informed on Sunday morning that Mr. McKay had been picked up uh, I was interviewed on the 15th, Mr. Speaker, which is the Tuesday of that week. The first time that I had heard, or my chief of staff, or anyone, uh, that Mr. McKay uh, was a recovering alcoholic uh, was when he was picked up. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that is the first time that I had heard about it. Uh, and I want to tell the honourable member, uh, I spoke to him on the, fifth, on the 14th, and I spoke to the media on the 15th, and when I spoke to him at that point, he told me he was in recovery. And immediately upon hearing that he'd been picked up, my chief of staff and the clerk had him in treatment in 14 hours. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, on Wednesday of last week, I asked the Premier if either of his chief of staff or the Liberal caucus chair knew about the November 2018 incident. The Premier answered that the constituency president didn't notify the Premier, which isn't exactly an answer to the question, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Premier then went outside of this chamber into the lobby and told the media that his chief of staff knew about the allegation. The next day I asked the Premier why he gave a non-answer to my question on the Chief of Staff when he clearly had the information, but he responded by saying that he was one of the few Liberal provincial governments left, Mr. Speaker. Not even close to an answer. Again, an inconsistency in his story. Can the Premier explain why he thinks it's okay to tell one version in here and another version out there as he travels the province saying one version of events to one people and another version to another people. Can the Premier explain why he thinks that's okay? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I say someone's a bit sensitive. Uh, doesn't like the fact, Mr. Speaker, that Nova Scotians have noticed in one community he says one thing and in another community he says something else. One thing, Mr. Speaker, I've been consistent. Mr. Speaker, I've been consistent with Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, and sometimes they don't like the message, Mr. Speaker, but the reality is we have to do what is right for the entire province and every Nova Scotian, and one of the things that the leader of this province has to do is be upfront and honest with our citizens, and that's exactly what I've done, Mr. Speaker, whether it's in this chamber or outside, Mr. Speaker, to the media. I've been factual every time when it came to this issue, Mr. Speaker, and every other issue. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, it seems a few more facts evolve the more questions you ask. That's the issue. We never seem to get the full story, uh, Mr. Speaker. We know, though, uh, that on November 6, 2019, a member of the Liberal Caucus staff uh, learned of an allegation detailing a dangerous events of November 2018. We have been told that the Premier's Chief of Staff received a phone call that made her aware of this incident. What we don't know is who made the call, that call. 
Um, I understand that it could wear, very well have been the caucus chair, but we don't know who the caucus chair was that week, Mr. Speaker. On, last, on Wednesday last week, the Premier said he believed it was a staff member who received the email. On Thursday, the Premier identified that person as a party official. Again, the story is, shall we say, Mr. Speaker, evolving. Uh, so my question to the Premier is, will he clearly answer for this House <laughs> how many people in his government both MLAs and staff knew about the May incident prior to the email last week, and I can guess the it is quite a few, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Premier. Speaker, I'm not sure uh, where the Honourable Member going. In his beginning of this question, he said, uh, someone in my office, Chief of Staff, knew in November. That's just simply not true. That is not factual at all, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is, uh, in, in May of 2019, uh, the mm -hmm. allegation came forward, Mr. Speaker, six months after the fact. Six months after the fact, Mr. Speaker, my Chief of Staff, I received a call, Mr. Speaker. We addressed the issue. Uh, Mr. Speaker did not see the substance of it. There was no evidence. The Honourable Member has not presented a single shred of evidence in this House. Not a single shred of evidence, Mr. Speaker. As a matter of fact, he blacked out the name of the author of the email. Why, Mr. Speaker? If someone gives you an email, they're giving it to you to be able to use. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable uh, Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, no unsolicited comments, please. This will be the only warning for everybody, for the Honourable Premier. The reality of it, Mr. Speaker, he blacked out that name when we have no reason to believe that it was actually the author of the email that gave it to him. It could have very well been someone in his political party looking for political chief shots on the floor of the legislature instead of letting this thing be dealt with in the court of law, Mr. Speaker, not here trying to get political points on the back of somebody suffering from an addiction, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the Premier about vulnerabilities in our health care system in light of the growing likelihood that COVID-19 will spread to Nova Scotia. Reliable access to emergency rooms will be vitally important if Nova Scotia experiences an outbreak of COVID-19. However, last year, unscheduled ER closures more than doubled. In Cape Breton, we have emergency rooms that are only open around a third of the time. Mr. Speaker, where will patients facing COVID-19 go for necessary treatment and testing with so many of our emergency rooms closed so much of the time? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the gentleman for the question. Uh, spe speaking with uh, Dr. Strang today, he's been working uh, with his partners across the country and the national government to ensure that we continue to provide a standards uh, from province to province to ensure that we deal with this uh, potential outbreak. Uh, we have, as a province, uh, testing that takes place uh, inside of our province where currently there has been ongoing testing for people who show up uh, with the uh, flu symptoms, Mr. Speaker. Uh, fortunately, there's been no uh, positive tests. Uh, and if there is one, Mr. Speaker, that test would then be sent to uh, Winnipeg to be confirmed for a second time. Uh, but there's been ongoing uh, uh, public uh, announcements. Uh, one of the things Mr. Strang was very clear about, uh, people need to continue to do the normal general hygiene, uh, making sure you continue to wash your hands, keep your hands away from your face, uh, Mr. Speaker. And if anyone feels those symptoms, uh, they need to go uh, and first of all self-identify, uh, and then we can provide that test. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. What I'm asking about, Mr. Speaker, is the question of the readiness of our health care system. N nursing home employees have been reporting for some time that the funding cuts of 2015 and 2016 had real negative significant implications uh, for hygiene and cleaning operations, and these are very important when it comes to the spread of infection. In light of heightened concern for protecting this vulnerable population from the spread of infection, will the Premier restore the funding that his government took away over those two years from the nursing homes in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We continue to increase uh, the health care budget across the province. Mr. Speaker, every budget we've introduced had an increase in uh, health care funding. Uh, the Honourable Member will know we continue to make strategic investments working with our partners. Uh, and as I said uh, before, uh, Dr. Strang and his team are working very hard to ensure uh, that we continue uh, to monitor and control uh, if uh, uh, this infection arrives in our province. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party.
Mr. Speaker, we have hospitals with entire floors of patients who are only there because they're waiting for a place in a nursing home. The fact that the government has still not opened up a single new nursing home means that there continue to be shortages of available active hospital beds all across the province. In this situation, how can the Premier be confident that our hospitals will actually have the capacity to receive expanded numbers of infected patients? The Honourable Premier. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is we're building 60 new beds in New Waterford. I hope the Honourable Member doesn't vote against that. We're, we're building 60 new beds in the north side, Mr. Speaker. I hope the Honourable Member doesn't vote against that. We've announced building long-term care beds in Eskasoni. Uh, we've introduced uh, 30 new beds here, Mr. Speaker. There's a redevelopment taking place in, in Clare. I believe there's some additional beds associated with that, as well as in uh, Mahone Bay. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are additional beds associated uh, with that uh, redevelopment that's happening there. Mr. Speaker, we're continuing to make those investments across the province, and we want to thank all those healthcare workers who continue to work with us, and quite frankly, the private sector who have also been working with us to help provide the care that Nova Scotians require. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the Premier's many versions of events is that his Chief of Staff only spoke with two individuals who had a personal stake in these allegations. We do know that the allegation was sent to a caucus outreach wor worker. We do know that that caucus outreach worker and at least the Premier's Chief of Staff had an unredacted version of that email and we know they had it for almost a year. But are we to expect that an outreach worker had a direct line to the Chief of Staff who was travelling with the Premier while they were in Europe? Is it not more likely that the outreach worker went to her direct supervisor, who then took it to their supervisor and so on? Is it not reasonable, Mr. Speaker, to assume that the caucus chair was aware? Uh, can the Premier confirm who is the person that actually realized that this imp information was important enough to call the Chief of Staff and advise her of the allegations? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the Honourable for the question, as he knows, uh, as it's been uh, well uh, talked about, Mr. Speaker, here and beyond. Uh, the fact of the matter is, this incident was happened in uh, November of 2018. The allegations that are out there, they're before the Court of Law. We weren't notified until May, six months after, Mr. Speaker. He's very right. There are other issues associated with uh, this incident, Mr. Speaker, personal and private information associated with people that are involved, Mr. Speaker, some of whom do not sit in this House, uh, quite frankly. Uh, and one of the things that we uh, did very quickly, Mr. Speaker, when it, uh, we learned in October, Thanksgiving weekend of 2019, for the very first time, uh, that one of our colleagues, Mr. Speaker, had an addiction to alcohol, we put him in treatment. That's exactly what you should be doing uh, with anyone that you know, Mr. Speaker. The very first thing you should do is getting them treatment associated. No one, and let me be clear, no one knew uh, the member from Chester St. Margaret's had an addiction to alcohol, myself or my chief of staff, until that October weekend, Mr. Speaker. We did the right thing by having him in treatment, Mr. Speaker. And now with their allegations and evidence, that will be before the court, and the courts will deal with that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we have a situation where you have two people uh, who are both alleged to be part of a conspiracy, and then you have the Chief of Staff going to those two people and saying, hey, are you guys conspiring to do something? And they say, no, we're not conspiring. The Chief of Staff says, good enough for me, uh, case closed. Is that the extent of the investigation? That's what we're being asked to believe. The extent of the investigation was to ask the conspirators if they were conspiring. Uh, based on these facts, as they have been described by the Premier, Mr. Speaker, I have serious concerns about the cal calibre of the investigation. I'd like to ask the Premier, uh, would the Premier confirm that that is in fact what he would have this House believe uh, is the accurate description of the Chief of Staff's investigation? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I would have this House believe exactly what we've told them, Mr. Speaker. There are other parts of this uh, uh, situation, Mr. Speaker, and the personal and private information of individuals, Mr. Speaker. And that information is theirs, Mr. Speaker, personal and private. Uh, unlike the Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to stand in this House and reveal information about individuals for cheap political points. The Honourable Member standing in this House to take advantage of someone who's suffering from an addiction, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly what he's doing. Someone who's gone into treatment. There is an allegation, Mr. Speaker, that is before the courts. And I'm going to let the court of law determine the innocence and guilt of everyone who stands before it, Mr. Speaker, and I'm not going to try to do it on the floor of this House, but let me be very clear, Mr. Speaker. My chief of staff and anyone in my office had no idea 
Mr. McKay had an addiction, Mr. Speaker, before Thanksgiving weekend of 2019, and we will continue, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that he stays in treatment, Mr. Speaker, whatever his political future may be. And I can tell you for certain, Mr. Speaker, no one in this caucus, under my leadership, will try to gain political points on someone else's suffering, Mr. Speaker. That is just a reality, Mr. Speaker. It's what's called being a good human being. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yet, that's exactly what they did, Mr. Speaker. The accusation clearly indicated that there was more evidence to support the claim. Perhaps text messages, pictures, videos, uh, evidence that would either clearly support the accusation or would possibly quickly uh, clear the, the, the member's name of any wrongdoing. The evidence was a simple phone call away, Mr. Speaker, but all indications are that that phone call was never made. Uh, the evidence uh, could, could, have, could have shown possibly what the Premier didn't want to know because he put his party before a person in the rest of Nova Scotians. Can the Premier confirm uh, if his Chief of Staff even bothered to ask for that additional evidence? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've been through this many times, Mr. Speaker. There was no evidence. Uh, presented, Mr. Speaker, in that weekend, Mr. Speaker, or nor has there been any evidence on the floor of the legislature, Mr. Speaker, presented by the honourable member who's used up almost a week on this very topic, Mr. Speaker. He can't attack our government and policy, Mr. Speaker. He can't take us on on the things that are happening in Nova Scotia, the, the building of an economy, more young people staying here, Mr. Speaker. He can't take us on, Mr. Speaker. So what does he do? He attacks the reputation of someone who has an addiction. <coughs> The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Actually, actually, I'm not sure if the Premier noticed, but it's his reputation that is being questioned, Mr. Speaker. The Premier's constant uh, response to many of my questions has been, it's before the courts. There's no evidence. It's up to someone else to take it to police. This is a Premier's stance because he doesn't want to know uh, what, 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 he, what he didn't want to know. And it speaks to a culture that I've referenced many times uh, uh, that this Premier only concerns himself with behaviour once it's been caught. Once they've been caught, that's when the Premier's concerned. Is it the Premier's stance that it is only a court conviction or a guilty plea that is the standard for ethical behaviour amongst his team? Thank the you, Honourable Mr. Premier. Speaker. Speaker, uh, finally, uh, the Honourable Member has uh, verbally uh, identified his strategy to attack people personally, Mr. Speaker. He's talking about attacking me personally. He's not presented one single policy idea on the floor of the legislature, Mr. Speaker. Not one. Not one, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the leader of the Democratic Party put two on the floor. Two on the floor. He's not brought one idea to the floor of the legislature about improving the lives of Nova Scotians. What he's attempted to do is try to tear down the reputations, Mr. Speaker, of whether it's people sitting on this side of the house, Mr. Speaker, or people who, Mr. Speaker, who are challenging in their lives. Imagine, imagine your motive. What, what goes through an individual's motive? when you're going to try to build your own reputation on the backs of those who are suffering. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Last spring, uh, my colleague from Queen Shelburne asked a question uh, about the mandate and effectiveness of the anti-bullying coordinator. Now, during the course of that question, it became clear that the task force on bullying and cyberbullying and the minister had differing ideas about what the mandate of the anti-bullying coordinator was. The minister indicate, indicated that there was continual evaluation of positions in the department and an appetite to adapt to meet the needs of students. My question for the minister is this. What changes and adaptations uh, has he made to make sure that the anti-bullying coordinator is as effective as possible as a student advocate? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've had a, a serious incident that's happened recently. Our hearts uh, and thoughts are obviously with the, with the victim of that incident and those that might have been traumatized. Uh, the appropriate actions uh, have been taken um, in terms of 
uh, investigations, uh, both within the Regional Center of Education and uh, the police also in this particular matter, Mr. Speaker. And we do trust the folks on the front lines to make the best decisions um, in the best interests of our students and uh, the issues of this case will be, will be ongoing. Honourable Member for Dermot East. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this morning one of the founders of uh, Pink Day, Pink Shirt Day, commented on that disturbing incident which I know is on the, the, the minds of all of us today. That I know. Mr. Speaker, he lamented that our province, which was the birthplace of the nation's largest anti-bullying movement, it continues to experience high-profile incidents of bullying. Now this is a person who understands the issue and he recognized, and he's recognized nationwide uh, as an anti-bullying advocate. And this is what he has to say about the anti-bullying co coordinator. Quote, no one has seen or heard from this person, and I'll table that. There isn't a parent in Nova Scotia at this moment who looks at that student in the video and the student who recorded it and says, enough is being done to curb bullying. My question to the Minister is this, will the Minister admit that the mandate of the anti-bullying coordinator needs a review? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of, of course, this incident is, is extremely upsetting. Um, one of these incidents is, is one too many, and uh, we all get tired of seeing these things when they happen, um, particularly when there's groups of people around that are filming uh, this stuff and putting it online uh, and enhancing the harm and trauma associated with these things. Um, we have had some success in our anti-bullying strategy. We have seen the stats show that uh, reported violent incidences have, have been decreasing uh, steadily in Nova, in Nova Scotia. Um, but we want to keep that work, uh, positive work going, Mr. Speaker. We, we want kids to feel safe at school. We want them to be safe. And the investments we're making in mental health and Schools Plus in putting child and youth care practitioners, behavioral experts in our system, the comprehensive approach we have to anti-bullying from restorative justice, uh, uh, restorative practices to um, punitive uh, action as well, Mr. Speaker, I, I think uh, is having uh, some success, but of course we're reminded that we always have more work to do when an incident like this happens. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, just this morning I received an email from a constituent. It reads, a friend is getting pushed out of her apartment because she cannot afford to pay the second annual $100 increase to her rent. Come July 1st, her rent will have increased $200 in two, year, two years, so she is forced out. Rent control in Nova Scotia is a problem. There is no control. Mr. Speaker, it's so obvious that what would protect renters right now is rent control. Why is the Premier so opposed to enacting this protection for Nova Scotians? The Honourable <laughs> Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Uh, you know, the purpose of Service Nova Scotia and the Residential Tenancies Act is to try and find a balance um, of fairness between landlords and renters. And we're constantly looking at ways to um, make it more accessible uh, for people to find safe, affordable housing, but also for people to just find housing, find, find places to rent. Um, we have looked at rent control within the department, and we see the studies that show that it does not prove to be effective. But that being said, we are always looking for new ideas ideas and, and looking at different cities to see where something could be put in place that would be effective for Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, initially this government claimed that rent increases are not significant enough to warrant rent control. I think the story I shared uh, speaks for itself, but it's far from the worst story I've heard of dramatic rent increases. And, and, and then it declares that rent control doesn't work. But the government believes that rent control works well enough when it's the one paying the rent. And that's why it negotiates rent control into housing agreements with landlords. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please clarify for the thousands of renters in precarious situations, is it that rent control is not needed? Is it that it doesn't work? Or is it just that this government only listens to landlords? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Uh, this government is working with multiple partners. We've said that all along, Mr. Speaker. We also have said, Mr. Speaker, there are challenges. We know that with housing. We've made investments, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to make those investments. Housing support workers who are out there working every day to assist people to find homes. We realize that, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work within our communities, Mr. Speaker, right across this province, where there are housing support workers and various other programs that have been enacted by this government that we will continue to support and grow and help assist people find housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, cannabis legalization has resulted in a rise of reported cannabis use overall. And with increased use from legalization, a study from May 2019 found the harms on mental health from cannabis use increase as well, and I will table that. And last month, the head of the Nova Scotia Early Psychosis Program, Dr. Phil Tebow, reported that 80% of his patients had exposure to cannabis. 20 to 25 percent would meet the criteria for cannabis use disorder, and I, I just tabled that. The impact of cannabis on the brain is a matter that is still developing is more, more significant as well. So my question for the minister is, has the government been consulting with studies like this to better understand the disorder and impacts of legalized cannabis? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for bringing this uh, important question forward uh, to the legislature. Uh, the fact uh, is, Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, department and our partners who deliver uh, health care services, including mental health and addiction services, uh, the clinical uh, health care providers, uh, professionals on the front line, uh, continue to uh, stay up to date uh, on uh, information as part of the professional development as well as policy development. Uh, so, of course, uh, information uh, as it's developed, whether it's here in the province or from other uh, sources, uh, national, international, uh, is exactly the type of information that's used to help inform uh, the evolution of care uh, delivery services. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister for the answer. Mr. Speaker, the potency of cannabis products can vary among underground market and legal sources. A Stats Canada report examining changes since cannabis was legalized found that the people who consume the most cannabis are more likely to purchase from illegal sources and excess consumption is li linked to cannabis use disorders. That means the people at the highest risk of cannabis disorders are more likely to consume cannabis from illegal sources in excess and have less contact with health information provided through legal sources. My question, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister is, have we seen a rise in cannabis psychosis since legalization? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, he raises a very important uh, point, uh, Mr. Speaker, about uh, the uh, additional harms uh, presented by uh, the consumption of uh, illegal and unregulated uh, products, uh, in this case specifically as it relates to uh, cannabis products, uh, and the unique challenges that the uh, continued existence of uh, black market illicit uh, products uh, pose to the health and safety uh, of Nova Scotians. So that's why uh, departments, uh, uh, including uh, the justice departments and law officials, uh, work to uh, get uh, the, close down the illicit uh, market, and my health officials continue to work uh, to provide uh, appropriate addiction uh, services to support those in need. The Honourable Member for Victor West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. The Commonwealth Fund International Health Policy Survey results were released at the end of January 2020. This edition focuses on primary care doctors and how well primary care is delivered. Across Canada, only four out of ten doctors coordinate care with social services, and I can uh, table that document. Additionally, 36% of doctors say they do not know about all the social services within their communities. And my concern is that this information, Mr. Speaker, is reflective for Nova Scotia as well. So my question to the minister, does his department collect similar stats and how would they fare relative to the national numbers just presented? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for uh, bringing uh, that information to the floor of the legislature. Uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, what the member is highlighting is 
uh, exactly support for the uh, policy uh, position that this government took under the leadership of uh, the former Minister of Health and Wellness, the current uh, Minister for Community Culture and Heritage, which 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 saw uh, us as a government uh, focus on uh, bringing and expanding collaborative care practices, which brings social workers uh, as part of the health team and other uh, allied health professionals to help support and meet the community needs. Uh, I believe during estimates I provided uh, a specific example uh, that uh, was brought to my attention uh, about a collaborative practice established in Cape Breton that highlights that very uh, point that the member brought about the value that social workers can provide to medical practices. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. I support anything this government can do to get more doctors in Nova Scotia. The survey also reports the number of hours doctors work each week. And 60% of doctors in Nova Scotia report it working 45 hours or more, the second highest percentage across Canada and well above the Canadian average of 55%, and that was just tabled in that report as well. Doctors in Nova Scotia work more hours per week than most in Canada, and yet this report um, tells us that they are the most dissatisfied in the health care system. So 57% say that the health care system has become actually worse compared to three years ago. And the Canadian average for this response is 25%. So I'd like to know, can the minister explain why Nova Scotia lags behind in so many of these measures? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for uh, raising the question. Uh, one thing uh, I'm not sure that was uh, referenced uh, in the information, but uh, she mentioned that she tabled it, so I'll take a, a look at that. Uh, although the report was released in uh, January of this year, uh, when was the, the, the data collection uh, that it took place? So the timing uh, in which that uh, information was uh, collected and, and reported uh, perhaps doesn't take into account many of the steps that we've taken uh, more recently uh, to help support many of those concerns that have been brought forward uh, since uh, I came uh, into this role as uh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, we've taken several steps, including the most recent uh, contract established that was supported by over 90% of physicians just this past fall. The Honourable Member for Dermody. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, my question is for the Minister of Education. In May of last year, the Minister indicated to reporters that the way money for inclusive education uh, was spent would be geared towards student needs and, quote, it's not just about how much money is being spent, it's about how we're spending it and we are working diligently to do it in a way that better helps the system meet the needs of our kids. And I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. Now, during estimates, the minister indicated that there were no real specific outcomes uh, for the investments in inclusion and uh, the aspirational goal was expressed that we want our kids to do better. And certainly, Mr. Speaker, uh, I won't dispute that. I know we all want our kids to do better. My question to the minister is this. How can the minister know if funding for inclusive education is helping the system meet the needs of our students if there are no specific outcomes to measure? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in fact, when the Hansard record is available, I would ask the member to review that because we were very explicit on what the outcomes are. There are achievement outcomes that we talked about that are collected in the classroom. There are well-being outcomes that are collected during student uh, surveys every single year. These outcomes are actually reported, uh, Mr. Speaker. These are specifically the things that we're looking at. I made that very clear to the member in estimates. I'll make it very clear to him right now. We've invested now over $45 million into inclusive education. We are able now under the new governance model to direct these funds where we know the greatest needs are, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're also conducting independent third-party evaluations to ensure that we're achieving the goals that we set out to do, and that's to help our kids do better in school, higher grades, and to feel better and more supported while they're there. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dermot East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Everyone supports more resources for inclusive education. And we want to give students all the supports they need to reach their full potential and achieve their goals. Mr. Speaker, parents want to know that the funding is being used in the most effective way. So my question is this, will the minister commit to increasing accountability by measuring the, the effectiveness of funding for inclusive education and making those findings public? Thank you, Mr. The Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education. M Mr. Speaker, the member says he supports increased funding for inclusive education. He's voted against every single budget that has increased our education budget by about 35%. 
Mr. Speaker. We've put an additional $370 million into this education system. That member voted against every single one of them. He said he supports investments in students. He voted against pre-primary and argued against it and still argues that we should delay implementation of pre-primary. So I'm sorry, actions speak louder than words in this chamber, Mr. Speaker. The fact is we are engaged in a one of the most transformative moments in, our, in, our, in the system of our education, in the history of our education system. One where we do take accountability very seriously because we want to achieve the, the, the ends that we're seeking to achieve. That's why we have a third party that's going to be evaluating this, providing an independent report to the public. That's why we're working with Inclusive Education Canada uh, as we roll out this program, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we'll keep improving our approach every single year to make sure that we're doing the very best for our kids. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Roseway Manor in Shelburne was built 44 years ago, and I'm sad to say the facility is showing its age. The staff at Roseway do everything they can to make residents feel safe and well cared for, but the building is letting staff and residents down. Recently, staff from Departments of Transportation and Health joined me on a tour of Roseway, and we saw conditions that are alarming. Black mold, holes in the ceiling, leaky roof, to name a few. Roseway Manor does not have a single bed that either works properly or has the bed rails that are within Health Canada's recommended guidelines. My question to the Minister is, does the Minister believe the conditions at Roseway Manor are appropriate for seniors and vulnerable Nova Scotians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for uh, the question. Uh, as the member uh, noted, uh, senior staff, uh, both of the Department and Transportation Infrastructure Renewal, uh, attended uh, to visit the facility. Uh, and I believe, uh, as the member uh, may also, I assume, uh, being active in her community, would be aware that there are several changes taking place uh, within that facility. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for the response. The former NDP government stated they would begin planning to replace Roseway Manor in 2015, and the former Health Minister said the Liberal government would honour that commitment. Sadly, the residents and staff are still waiting. Uh, when will the Minister put an end to the deplorable conditions at Roseway and start building a replacement? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for the question. I, I believe uh, the member uh, would be aware that government uh, continues and has uh, for a, a number of years continued to provide funding to that facility for uh, appropriate maintenance and uh, facility uh, upgrades uh, to uh, get uh, work done there. And we uh, continue uh, to support uh, the uh, capital uh, improvements and maintenance uh, through the funding programs that we uh, have, just like we do with uh, facilities uh, right across uh, this province. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dermot North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment. It's easy to forget through the winter months that next summer will be another summer when Dartmouth lakes are plagued by invasive weeds and algae blooms. But winter is the time when we need to be planning ahead. Despite a hopeful first meeting with the Minister and staff last year, recent attempts to follow up with the Minister on community demands for Dartmouth lakes have been met with silence. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister please provide an update on his department's work to protect Dartmouth lakes? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. I thank the honourable member for the question. Um, certainly, these urban lakes are under pressure. There's, there's no question. Anytime we have uh, the development that we see in HRM um, and these beautiful watercourses uh, coinciding, there are, there are challenges. And, and obviously, invasive species, which by the way is, is mainly under the auspice of lands and forestry. But we do take this seriously. I appreciate the work that's been done also by the, uh, by the members from not only Dartmouth South but Dartmouth North uh, in bringing this uh, to our attention. There's a multi-jurisdictional uh, approach that we have here. It's not just environment, it's not just lands and forestry, but also HRM. And we do have a, um, a water course advisory group that I think that represents that area to, uh, to look into what we can do to make things better there. The Honourable Member for Dermot North. Mr. Speaker, hundreds of community members came out on a summer evening last year to share their thoughts and concerns about Dartmouth's urban lakes. The lakes have tremendous ecological, economical and recreational value. They are part of Dartmouth's identity. The challenges facing the lakes are complex, with multiple contributing issues, governing policies and cross-jurisdictional responsibility. The resident, the resident ask from the community was that an Urban Lakes Commission be convened to work collabor collaboratively towards solutions. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister commit to establishing an Urban Lakes Commission as requested by the community? 
The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Again, I, I do appreciate the, uh, the passion and the work that has been done by, um, by my colleagues uh, from Dartmouth North and Dartmouth South. I've also uh, met with uh, one of the councillors, Councillor Mancini, for that area. I believe the uh, Member of Parliament for that area. We've also sat and talked about that. And, and uh, my commitment will be, as, a, as I have stretched my arms before, I certainly would love to sit down with the members across the floor as soon as we can possibly, again, to work on how we can find collaborative ways to work together on uh, solving this problem. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, many constituents from Colchester, Muscadabit are concerned with the development of natural gas storage. The media is reporting that there are documents indicating the salinity of the water released into the Shumanakity River will violate federal fisheries regulations. The Department of Environment has authorized an extension until May of 2021 for the company to obtain environmental assessment approval. Uh, my question is, could the minister provide an update on the status of environmental assessments on Alton Gas proposed development? The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, very happy to have a conversation with uh, the member at any time uh, to provide an update. I know they're going through that environmental process, and, and what I can say to the to the member and any member with any project uh, that happens within the province, whether it's the Alton project or not, these decisions will be based on science uh, to ensure that uh, not only are we uh, accessing economic opportunities, but at the same time protecting our environment. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muskegon, Valley. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, people are reaching out to me for answers because they, uh, they don't seem to be informed or feel they're being informed. Uh, does the Minister have community consultation opportunities that are, in plan that are being planned for now? The Honourable Minister of Mines and Energy. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and thank the member for the question. So, uh, any any decision provincially to uh, to go forward with the project would, would have to, re of course, it would require the uh, federal law to be followed. So, uh, to the member again, uh, uh, happy to meet and discuss the project with him if he's looking for additional information uh, on where it stands at this point. It is going through uh, the proper environmental assessments, and again, uh, with any project, uh, we ensure that uh, the balance is struck between uh, the economic opportunity and the environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, mercury is a toxic pollutant requiring only 22 milligrams of contaminant uh, to contaminate uh, 22,000 litres of water. In 2015, in partnership with Nova Scotia Power Efficiency, Nova Scotia Lock launched the Mercury Collection Program, which offered a free of charge recycling and mercury collection business. <clears throat> and the residents of Nova Scotia, to businesses in the residents of Nova Scotia. This program was uh, forecast to run for 15 years, Mr. Speaker. Suddenly the program was abruptly, abruptly cancelled without notice after the targets that were set by Nova Scotia Power were reached within only four and a half years. A constituent of mine has called and has suggested that the recycling fee is so high that it's approximately $2,000 for half a ton of mercury, and he's worried that uh, contractors will be looking at uh, disposing of uh, these illegally. My question to the Minister is, will the Minister commit to continuing this program to ensure the protection of public safety and to protect jobs for Nova Scotians? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. So uh, I also thank the member for raising the, uh, the uh, conversation around Mercury. Uh, we heard it uh, last week from the members uh, opposite uh, with the NDP party. It certainly is something that might surprise a lot of Nova Scotians to know that there is Mercury still floating around and uh, what, what concerns that we have with it. Uh, yes, he uh, is right in pointing out that Nova Scotia Power has cancelled their Mercury Diversion Program, which was one that was uh, brought forward by them. Uh, I would want to note that we do have other ways of disposing of mercury. Uh, there are ways for thermostats uh, to be collected. There is also in our HHWs, our household hazardous waste depots with municipal units that they still do and I would encourage all Nova Scotians if they do have them to reach out to their municipal counterparts to find out how to dispose of them. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I do recognize that uh, members from the NDP party had brought this up uh, last week, but I, I'm concerned that uh, the impacts of mercury getting into the water system, um, you know, the, the answers uh, that the minister gave last week just didn't seem to be uh, really good answers, so I wanted to bring them up here again today and, and ask again, because uh, I recognize uh, you're saying that there are uh, a few alternate uh, places, but uh, I really think that that uh, this program needs to be reinstated, it was working. And uh, so I won't ask a question. I will just state that uh, I guess that from what I've heard from the minister, they are, uh, the government is not willing to reinstate this program. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. I, I, I would like to again uh, emphasize the fact that uh, um, you know it is important to raise the awareness of mercury. Uh, I would like to note that uh, you know mercury is banned, being banned, and the and we are seeing that uh, in fluorescence that that is a, a practice that is stopping. Uh, Efficiency Nova Scotia is another one that that does collect um, uh, light appliance switches. Uh, and again, there's also the um, and I'll, I'll point directly to it. It's the um, uh, it's a it's a group that's called the Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning, and Conditioning Institute of Canada that collects uh, also. So there's several ways uh, that mercury can be collected. I would encourage all Nova Scotians not to throw them in landfills, but they uh, should contact their municipal units to make sure that they're disposed of properly. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Président, en octobre dernier, j'ai posé la question au ministre de l'Éducation à l'égard du projet d'école Wedgeport qu'on anticipe d'avoir completed in 2021-22. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last October I asked the Minister of Education regarding the Echol Wedgeport replacement project and it's anticipated to be completed in 2021-2022. And I again want to reiterate the uh, group of parents' strong desire to have this project be the greenest uh, school in the province, if not in the country with renewable energy involved. So my question for the Minister is when will the residents of Wedgeport find out the location and construction start date for the new school? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I think it's been communicated to the community that land adjacent to the current site has been chosen. I believe TIR is in the process of uh, trying to reach a uh, purchase agreement with the private landowner. Uh, the feedback I've received from the community thus far has been positive uh, for that location. CSAP is supportive. Uh, I know the community is very uh, interested in making sure that this project is as green as it can be. We share that objective. We do have green standards built into our procurement process. Um, and if there's any additional uh, projects related to creating green space uh, in that school, I know that the Minister of, uh, of Energy and Mines has been uh, very keen to be involved in that conversation. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that response. You know, students deserve to learn in an environment that's safe, healthy, and provides all modern amenities of education. And parents are wondering about the design and consultation that was promised by the Minister. So my question for the Minister is, will he commit to work with me to host open community consultations for the residents of Wedgeport and area to discuss the design and construction of the new school? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I've, I have been meeting uh, with members of that community, uh, members of the SAC, uh, including its chair, and uh, what I've heard is that that school community actually really likes the um, design of the new Bible Hill uh, Elementary School, and if that is indeed the case, uh, CSAP's confirmed that with me as well. That will actually shave some months off the design uh, process, and we'll get that school built uh, uh, hopefully sooner than we hoped. An honorable member for Victor West. Mr. Speaker, in the first month of 2020, the Aberdeen Hospital had more surgery cancellations than in the total of cancellations in, 19, in 2019, and this was all due to the lack of beds. The hospital recently lost four of their 10 ICU beds. Mr. Speaker, these cancellations are certainly getting out of control. Just yesterday, I received a call from a gentleman who waited four hours for knee surgery after waiting for two years to have it canceled. This is just unacceptable, and it doesn't have to be like this, Mr. Speaker. The system is broken, and it's causing chaos between patients and staff. So how does the minister justify these cuts to beds, which then causes surgery cancellations and drastically uh, compromises the safety and proper care of patients and staff? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the member uh, raising this question. Uh, provides me the opportunity to clarify uh, 
uh, exactly uh, what happened with the uh, bed uh, reconfiguration at uh, Aberdeen. Uh, as I understand it, the Nova Scotia Health Authority has not closed uh, beds uh, within that facility. Uh, what was happening was that the uh, cardiac monitoring or tele telemetry uh, services were being provided in the ICU unit. That was a process that was taking place only at that hospital, the only regional hospital that was uh, having that service provided in the ICU. What they did is they reconfigured uh, the facility to have that service provided in another uh, area of the hospital to be consistent with all other hospitals within the province. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. So the reality is, is that there's not enough beds. Here's the letter from the doctors, the staff, with their concerns. I hope that the minister will take a chance and read them. Recently, the ER at the Aberdeen Hospital was in severe overcapacity, and that's because of the loss of four beds as stated in that letter. Yesterday I received a letter that is tabled as well indicating that there is high rate of flu-like symptoms throughout Glenhaven Manor causing temporary closures to visitors. However, Mr. Speaker, the issue is if one of the residents need to go to the ER to say let's for a broken toe, they can't go back home. So my question is simple. Where do these seniors go? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the member again uh, for the question. Uh, as I noted, uh, the health authority uh, has uh, uh, explained uh, the situation that, uh, in fact, uh, telemetry uh, services for cardiac uh, monitoring were taking place in the ICU unit. Uh, that uh, service uh, was uh, moved. No beds were closed. The services are still being provided, uh, but has been uh, reconfigured to be consistent with all other regional uh, hospitals uh, within the uh, health system in the province. Uh, as it relates to uh, nursing home uh, facilities, Mr. Speaker, the nursing home uh, providers and the uh, hospital uh, administrators work Order, together please. to ensure Time that allotted residents... For oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call public bills for second reading? We'll now call public bills for second reading. Mr. Speaker, would you call Bill 246, Opioid Damages and Health Care Cost Recovery Act? We'll now call Bill number 246, Opioid Damages and Health Care Cost Recovery Act. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill 246, the Opioid Damages and Health Care Costs Recovery Act, be now read a second time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, for the benefit of the members, uh, I think it's important to understand the um, driving force behind uh, this piece of legislation. Uh, we all know over the past two decades the use and misuse of prescription opioids has become a growing problem in many jurisdictions. Nova Scotia may not have seen the same number of overdose deaths as some other provinces, but on average of 60 Nova Scotians die every year from confirmed and probable opioid-related overdose. So, Mr. Speaker, there's no question that uh, this has taken a personal toll on many Nova Scotians and their families. It's also a significant strain on our health care system. Opioid overdoses needlessly take lives, place stress on communities, and can overwhelm our first responders and emergency departments. Opioid misuse has also taken a financial toll on our province, Mr. Speaker. We continue to invest millions of dollars every year to treat opioid use disorder, provide naloxone kits for overdose reversal, and train health care providers. But Mr. Speaker, government believes that opioid manufacturers and distributors need to be held accountable for the harmful impact of their drugs. The Opioid Damages and Health Care Cost Recovery Act will ensure Nova Scotia has an option to proceed with action against opioid manufacturers and distributors. Mr. Speaker, this means that we may include, or, or this action may include, supporting British Columbia's class action lawsuit or taking legal action of our own to recover health care costs and other direct costs incurred due to opioid related disease, injury, and illness. The bill will also simplify the procedure for proving damages caused by opioid manufacturers and distributors by allowing the use of aggregate health data instead of individual health records. And that, in essence, is what this bill uh, performs, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues as this bill proceeds. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and it is a privilege to say a few words on Bill 
246 and uh, recognize that the uh, the minister has covered most of the uh, facts on the bill. We realize that this is being modeled against uh, on Alberta's legislation and and with the potential of the as the minister stated of the province joining in on uh, BC's uh, class action lawsuit and uh, or, or maybe doing it, or doing it ourselves. We recognize the human cost of the opioid crisis has been in, incalculable. The dollar cost is calculable and is immense also and ongoing and continues. And uh, certainly if there is opportunity for uh, the province to have recourse with the manufacturers, if that can be demonstrated uh, that the manufacturers were culpable and knew what they were uh, and maybe didn't uh, explain or knew what they were selling and didn't uh, give adequate warning, then uh, certainly uh, the PC caucus would uh, endorse the, uh, the bill and the intent of the government on this one. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we in the NDP believe that opioid addiction is an insidious issue facing our province. Um, in essence, Opioids are a prescribed version of heroin, um, and that includes uh, fentanyl and, and pain relievers such as Oxycontin and Vicodin, among others. We support the ability to acknowledge damage and recover costs when a product is made available without adequate warnings, uh, knowledge or protections, and as such, we support the legal right uh, on of the government to sue with the view to recover healthcare costs uh, incurred for opioid-related disease, injury, and illness. Um, while this act highlights the opioid crisis, in principle and in the way this legislation works, it is in direct opposition to the Financial Measures Act, in which uh, it is asserted that the government cannot be sued for damages incurred for gambling-related problems. We agree that the government should be able to sue to recover health care costs related to opioids. Uh, but similarly, we feel that the population should be able to sue the government for losses associated with gambling, another dangerous addiction about which much is known. Uh, we feel that we need to invest in supports for all those who are living with addiction and also striving to protect people from addiction when it is in our ability to do so. Thank you. Trying to recognize the Honourable Minister of Health, it will be to close second reading of Bill Number 246, the Opioid Damages in Healthcare Cost Recovery Act. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, the comments uh, from uh, my colleagues. Look forward to this bill proceeding through the rest of the uh, legislative process. And with that, I move to close debate on Bill 246. Motion is for a second reading of Bill Number 246, the Opioid Damages in Healthcare Costs Recovery Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 246, an act to recover op opioid damages and health care costs. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a committee of the Hall House on supply. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to uh, uh, take a few moments. Uh, I, told this, uh, I told this story when I was elected in 2013. Uh, some of the, uh, the new members may not have heard it. It's a story of uh, one of the classes in the Brookfield Elementary. Uh, the teacher had a session on the election, how it was uh, conducted, uh, the various folks that were going to be running. And one young man, he listened very, very carefully. And his grandmother came to pick him up from school, and while they were driving home, he had a few questions. He asked, is Mr. Harrison going to be running in the election? And she said, yes, he is. He said, isn't he a minister of the church? And she said, yes, he is. And he looked at her and said, isn't that a sin? <laughs> um, I thought about those words often, and uh, just how people look at us as, as politicians. I'm sure that uh, to this day, many people feel exactly the same way as that young boy. 
But it, uh, it was and still is my vision for all of us uh, to put issues on the table and for every one of us to commit to listening to each other and then finding the best possible solution uh, to some of the issues. For me, um, without the vision, uh, I don't think I could move ahead very much. We're going to react to situations that are before us and we're going to spin wheels sometimes. But it's my vision that if we are at our best when we're in here, uh, I really believe that we can change the culture of how we do our job in the house. And, um, and I think we'll find that people will look at us with, through a different lens. Uh, none of us uh, was going to happen if we don't have a vision to work towards. We have a budget before us. Uh, the budget has to touch so many areas in this province. We see the holes and then we try to plug the holes up the best we can. In the budget itself, it is plugging up the holes with money. If we put more money in the areas of concern, we will arrive at our destination. At least that's the belief. My vision is not to just to look at the monies that we put into the programs. Um, my dream goes far beyond just the budget coming in. We have an education budget. This budget has to look at facilities, has to look at busing, has to look at teachers and administrators, look at programs of, school f of, uh, of the school for our youth. We try to create a budget that's going to meet the needs of our education. Having all of these things is a part of a vision, no question. But the other part has to do with a culture of education to supplement what the budget uh, puts forth. Part of my vision is to have the teachers and administrators tell us what is needed in order to teach to the best of their abilities. I believe that if the teachers and administrators are tuned into the vision, then they're going to look forward to going to the classroom and the students are going to look forward to the learning process. Right now, uh, in many areas, that culture is really not in place. I would like to help create a different environment in that. There's a budget for transportation and infrastructure renewal. We put more monies in the budget, but we're still behind the eight ball in having our roads safe and smooth. There are many reasons for this, and it goes beyond putting dollars and dollars into the system. There's a culture in place where work is not being maximized to its full potential. There's a culture in place where we don't get the most from our machinery. My vision is to look at each area, decide on areas of most importance, have the workers go out on their day activities with the attitude of doing what they can to make our roads safe. It's a culture of having a vision to make this province safe and comfortable to drive in. If the department from the top down buys into the vision, there could be a new culture in play that will get the work done and the public will support even if it can't be done in one fall swoop. We have good people. There's no question in the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. But we have to get the best out of the resources that we have to give them. And that's going to be a major part of the vision. There's a budget for health care. This is a huge budget and it does cover so many areas. It's about putting facilities in place. It's about having doctors and nurses and other competent technicians to tend to the physical and mental needs of the people in this province. The budget tries to address a lot of these needs, but is nowhere close to meeting all of the needs. We need to have a vision of how we approach the health care system in this province. It's going to be a matter of being um, very creative in what we do. To me, the vision is having those who do the day-to-day -day work give us the ideas of how we can make our system better. I believe 
there is that desire on the behalf of doctors and nurses, pharmacists, technicians, and so many more to point us in the right direction. We will not go in the right direction until we have a vision of where we want to be. There's a budget for community services. So many folks in this province are struggling in so many different ways. Many do not have jobs, and they rely on social service programs on which to live. Many do have jobs, but they don't make enough to meet the demands on their income. Many people struggle with addictions and therefore do not have the resources needed uh, for what is of benefit to them. There are folks who are homeless, who live in inadequate housing, seniors on limited incomes, and of course, I could go on and go on and go on with a variety of folks who find living from day to day a huge struggle. We do try to create a budget that will address the needs of as many people as possible. It's a huge task and it's very difficult to achieve. Part of my vision is to have the resources available to meet the needs. But again, the vision goes far beyond the budget. There are no two people with identical circumstances. I would like to see some flexibility in meeting the needs of the people before us. But in order to do this, we're going to need a staff in community services that are totally knowledgeable on all the programs and help people navigate the programs. We need that staff to be compassionate, empathetic with the people who come through the doors. You know, it's amazing how people respond to someone who seems to care about them and what they're going through. I'm not saying these people are not in place now, not saying that at all. They are, but the system does not always lend for the workers to do their job properly. I do support what is trying to be put in place by government, but that's only part of what is needed. We need to have people deal with people in a respectful and compassionate way. To have this is a mantra in how we manage the budget, and I believe we will pay great dividends. I know that what I'm saying is a dream, that the workings of the province are more complicated than what I'm proposing. Yes, we do need a budget, but yes, we do need to have a vision of how to accomplish that budget. I have been in this house for seven years, and I know we're a long way from accomplishing the dream. But what has taken place will not take my dream away, because without it, I couldn't function here. We have to be an environment that is going to work for all of us. Sometimes it's caring, Sometimes it's toxic, but I have my vision and, uh, and I'm not going to reality to take that vision away from me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I am uh, pleased to rise today to speak uh, uh, and use a bit of this uh, allotted time to talk about an aspect of the 2020-21 budget that is sorely lacking, both in dollar amounts and in vision. In my community of Dartmouth North and in many other parts of the province, there is a housing crisis. This is something that I have mentioned many times, my colleagues have mentioned many times, and even other members in this house have mentioned many times in this house, but unfortunately, uh, this issue bears repeating. I wanted to remind, uh, use some of this time right now to remind uh, the House uh, about some of what's happening in Dartmouth North. And I dare say that uh, we may be uh, in Dartmouth North uh, uh, a canary in a coal mine, as it were. Our community is, in a way, a canary in a coal mine when it comes to this crisis. Uh, I've been talking about it for many months, and it seems to be spreading now. So, um, to remind you, in August, since August, I should say, the number one reason that folks have, uh, have been coming to my office, my very busy office, I will say, uh, for help, is because they are facing eviction 
or they're living in unsafe or unstable situations. They can't find anywhere to move to, and they have been told, or they've been told that their rent will be getting raised by an amount they simply cannot pay. And therefore, they'll have to move or face eviction when they start getting behind on their rent. And of course, that when someone faces eviction or, or is evicted because of rental arrears, that puts a, a, a mark on their record and it's extremely difficult to, to find any other place to live. The other reason uh, that people are coming in to my office is to get access to the heating rebate program applications, and that points to, to a, a very high level of energy poverty in my area, which is another thing that this budget doesn't do a whole lot to help, but maybe we'll talk about that later in estimates. So why are people getting evicted? Rising rents, uncontrolled raises in rents, uncontrolled rent increases. They're also uh, being evicted because of renovations, mass evictions because of renovations. Currently in Dartmouth North that I know of, there is one building in which all the tenants are being told uh, that they must leave. Many of them have already gone uh, in order that the building can be totally uh, renovated and then um, of course they will be the first to know when they can apply for new units. So they haven't even been given a first right of refusal for the renovated units, but they will be told first when they can start applying, but Mr. Speaker, the rents will be raised at least $200 from what the people are paying now. So when you are on a fixed income uh, and making very little money, if you are a senior on uh, CPP or you're um, uh, on income assistance, a $200 uh, rent increase is impossible. So that's one building that I know of, and then there are at least three others that I know of that are that the tenants have been told by landlords, new landlords I might add, that this exact thing is coming down the pike in two or three weeks once they get their permits in place and everyone will be out. That's how they've been told. So um, that's happening. The other reason people are getting evicted, weird, strange, and unlikely reason, reasons. So um, this was not really happening. We didn't see this happening before this, uh, the, the low vacancy rate in HRM, but I had a, a person come in my office one day who um, had been a model tenant for 11 years and then all of a sudden was told she was being loud and abusive. I don't think that happens out of the blue, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and there are many other examples like that. People getting evicted for strange reasons. Um, so what happens when someone gets evicted? Well, first thing is they basically are homeless because there's nowhere else to move to. They can't find a new place to live. Dartmouth North has always been a place where you can get a cheap apartment. That's not the case anymore, Mr. Speaker. Dartmouth Housing Help, which is the best place to go, the place that we navigate people to uh, to help people uh, who are looking for, um, for uh, uh, affordable rentals, uh, they're no longer accepting new clients. In a release last week, they said that, the, that Dartmouth North is now saturated and they're unable to help, uh, and that means saturated in terms of uh, no vacancies, uh, and they're not able to help until something shifts, until they can, they can help the people that they're already uh, involved with. They will, just for the record, uh, still have some drop-in hours where people can get help filling out forms for housing and rent, uh, rent supplements, but that's all they're able to do for new clients. So. What happens when people get evicted? Uh, many are going to shelters, but the shelters fill up very quickly. So when someone comes to me and says, I've been evicted, we call the shelters, shelters are full. If they're connected with DCS, we give them a call, Sometimes they get put in a hotel. Well, we all know, uh, based on news stories for the last several weeks, what's, what's, what's um, that situation? It's not, it's not tenable, it's not sustainable. There are families with children living in hotel rooms. It's impossible, Mr. Speaker, it's an impossible situation. So I guess the other option is, well, like what happened to one of my uh, constituents in the summertime when it was a little bit, a little bit warmer out, into, I guess end of summer, uh, she was told by her worker that, the, that DCS would buy her a tent. So I guess when the weather's a little warmer, you could start a tent city, uh, you could live in a hotel with your family of young children, you could couch surf, uh, you could go back to a housing situation which is wholly unsafe for you. There's basically those are the options, Mr. Speaker. 
So, why can't people find places to live? The vacancy rate is at 1%. This is an all-time low. This is lower than large cities in, in Canada and North America. And in Dartmouth North, uh, or in Dartmouth, the, rate, the vacancy rate is, uh, is thought to be 0.5%. Landlords are very able to be choosy over who they rent to now. People who rely on income assistance or child benefit or who need a rent supplement, which are uh, the rent supplements, by the way, we all know this government loves to talk about rent supplements. Well, they don't do any good if there's nowhere to live. And they also don't do well, they don't do good when a landlord has 30 people lined up for a unit. Landlords are not going to choose to house people who would use rent supplements because they're administratively burdensome. Why would they do it if they can just get a regular old check from someone who can pay the rent? By the way, it is illegal for landlords to discriminate based on source of income, Mr. Speaker, but it doesn't seem to be stopping many of the landlords in HRM and in Nova Scotia right now. The Human Rights Commission has uh, you know, put out uh, uh, information releases about this situation, and um, yet we still see ads on Kijiji, adults only, uh, or, um, or people who are getting um, d basically refused because they're on income assistance or, that they're, or their child benefit, which is like frankly a good source of income uh, and can pay m fairly high rents with child benefit. Uh, uh, they're getting refused. So, we also know that there's a wait list of thousands for public housing and for rent supplements. So I've already outlined a little bit of what happens when someone can't find a place to live. Uh, tents, shelters, but shelters are always full, uh, hotels, people are couch surfing, or staying with friends or former partners in very or potentially dangerous situations. But Mr. Speaker, one thing that I want to point out right now is that this is not just a problem for poor people. Mm -hmm. It is a very bad problem for poor people, for people who don't have a lot of money to make ends meet. It is definitely uh, a, a it is the big issue. Uh, but I also know of a retired teacher in Dartmouth North who lives in a very nice apartment building but is on a fixed income and is extremely worried about the rates at which his uh, um, rents are raising. I know of someone who has a unionized job that pays a living wage for Halifax, whose awesome apartment that, that was perfect for their, their family, their life, uh, is now in question because the building is being sold and the landlord may change the rental agreement or raise the rents to amount they cannot afford. We know that most people are $200 away from not being able to make ends meet. So what happens when a, when a rent gets increased by 300? Mm -hmm. We are seeing this happening all the time. And so, who cares? So what it, why is this even a problem? Well, it's obvious. Stress and fear about not having a place to live make people sick. Living in crappy conditions makes people sick. Living outside makes people sick. For people who have mental health conditions or illnesses, stable housing is the first requirement for getting or staying well, Mr. Speaker. If people are spending all their money on rent, there is nothing else for food, healthy food, or not healthy food for that matter. Uh, there's no money to, 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 to spend on anything that would be a, a, at all uh, resembling you know, a, a, a social life. There's no money to go for coffee with a friend. There's no money to go to a movie. If people are spending all their money on rent, they're not contributing to the local economy. They're not going to restaurants. They're not going to consume an art piece, or they're not going to the theater. They're not going to go see a professional basketball game or the Thunderbirds. They're not going to do any of those things. They're not going to buy new clothes. They can't. I feel like we've talked about this so much in this house that, you know, possibly people are becoming, you know, you know, deadened to this issue. So I'm not really sure how else to paint a picture of how bad this situation actually is. I do know that daily we have families coming into my office, families with young children who are being evicted and don't know where to go. In, in our, this, it, it, it's bad. <laughs> Rent control exists. These are things, oh sorry, I forgot my final heading. What can we do to solve the problem? 
uh, rent control. Rent control exists and works in many other jurisdictions in Canada. So to, pardon me? And also here. And also here, it did exist. Oh yeah, you know, I'm getting to that part. I'm getting to that part. It's a big, important part, actually. Uh, but uh, it does exist in, in many other jurisdictions. So when I hear the government say it doesn't work, it's simply not true. It's simply not true. The government already uses rent control for its own contracts and rent supplements. Uh, and also the renovation program. Uh, you know, when the government gives money to, to buildings that are going to be renovated, they, part of the contract to, for that money is that they can only raise rents that are indexed to the CPI. Sounds like a good plan. If it's good enough for the government for its own contract, it should be good enough for all Nova Scotians. When we ask about this, we get no answers from the government, which is frankly infuriating. We get talking points over and over again that don't actually address the questions, and we get fluff. We also know that co-op and not-for-profit not housing works. We need to see significant investments in those things, not a little bit of money thrown over from this budget. Uh, I'm glad to see the, that the Premier was actually using the words co-ops and not-for-profits. That's an improvement. That's, that's progress. But we need to go a lot further. We also need inclusionary zoning, and we need to strengthen the Residential Tenancies Act so that the landlords are more, more accountable to tenants and are penalized for intimidation. Rent supplements are fine in certain situations if you're okay with the government spending public money to prop up for pri private, private for-profit investment REITs. But the solution offered in this budget of 560 new rent supplements will not work in the environment we are currently in. There is nowhere to use them, Mr. Speaker. And I am at personally not fine with the government using public money to prop up private for-profit investment REITs, by the way. The housing units announced in this budget are fine too. Great, 39 houses, that's awesome, but not nearly enough. Also, I, I have to say I'll believe it when I see it, Mr. Speaker, because this government has announced for the last two budgets funding for small options homes, or actually three budgets. Since I was elected, they've announced funding every year, and so far we've seen four open and four more being built at some point and will open soon. Mr. Speaker, people are suffering. This. Uh, the, the poorest people are suffering, seniors on fixed incomes are suffering, middle income people are suffering, and there are solutions at our fingertips. Not one solution, not one great solution, but many that work together. The government needs to show leadership on this issue and admit that there are solutions that it is ignoring or refusing to even take a look at. The government owes it to Nova Scotia to tell us why it refuses. Uh, to, to collaborate in this way, and it needs to address this issue before it gets any worse. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pico Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to, to uh, speak in supply. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's an old expression that a budget is a moment where science students finally admire commerce students. I want to begin, uh, Mr. Speaker, by thanking everyone involved in the preparation of this year's uh, budget. Uh, it does address several concerns facing our province, and uh, there's uh, perhaps I'll start off with a couple of positive uh, points there, Mr. Speaker. Cutting the corporate uh, tax rate from 16 to 14 percent is positive, and saving businesses uh, 70 and a half million, and a small business tax credit, Mr. Speaker. 0.5% to 2.5%, uh, uh, however. However, Mr. Speaker, while the government is claiming a balanced budget, I wonder where we would be if we were not receiving approximately $393 million in transfer payments. That certainly makes a difference in the final line. It appears, Mr. Speaker, that the sources of revenue are going down while federal assistance is increasing. Mr. Speaker, it depends what Nova Scotian you talk to, if they think this year's budget is a good one or if it falls short. The ordinary middle class person, Mr. Speaker, wants to know how the budget is actually going to change their life. They look at the projected $33 million surplus and suggest numerous places where that can help the lives of people in need. I realize we need extra dollars for unexpected circumstances. However, Nova Scotians are faced with many obstacles. Mr. Speaker, looking at the extension to the film tax credit, 
I've had a number of people ask me if, if the amount of money the government is providing to the film industry is greater or equal to what the industry was receiving originally before the tax credit was cut. If you look back at that period of time, Mr. Speaker, and what, is, what has happened, there was a, a great deal of chaos. Lost several employees, employees uh, selling their homes, employees moving, forced to move. So again, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure if we were to, to do an audit on that uh, and compare the money that they were getting in the first place compared to now, there, there might be a discrepancy. Mr. Speaker, approximately $30 billion has, has been spent since 2013 towards our health budget. Two of the most glaring needs are the tens of thousands needing a family doctor, and secondly, the family's frustration that they face when attempting to obtain proper help for a loved one suffering mental health issues. 550,000 extra for mental health is a major disappointment. This does not even come close to addressing the demand for improved accessibility to adequate mental health care. In fact, 550,000 works out to approximately 55 cents per Nova Scotian. Mr. Speaker, we have several visits to our office, people seeking help. We desperately need more mental health services. However, it is more than that. We have to address the root causes. Residents suffering from stress, anxiety, depression, and the cost of living is certainly a factor to rising rates of these mental struggles. We need a clinic in Pictou County. Mr. Speaker, there's no shortages of pressures in our province. Highest income tax rates in the country, 358 vacancies in the health sector, unemployment rising within the forestry sector, shortages of space in many schools attempting to accommodate pre-primary students, the list goes on and on. Mr. Speaker, the province's budget will increase our net debt by $2.7 billion over the next four years. That is a concern for the next government in waiting. Net debt is ready to begin in the new fiscal year at $15.18 billion. Record capital spending will add $535 million to the debt in the coming year. Fiscal plan projects will see a bigger debt increase in 2021 of approximately $727 million. Our net debt is scheduled to continue rising during the next two years, reaching a record of $17.866 billion. Mr. Speaker, the middle class Nova Scotians are still waiting for the income tax part of the budget speech. We all know that the middle class are the backbone of our economy. They were hoping for some significant changes in that area. Needless to say, they were disappointed. Mr. Speaker, a community needs assessment identifies the struggles and resources available in a community to meet the needs of everyone. Children, youth, homeless, families, seniors. Every day, constituents visit or call my office. The following are some of the issues they would like to see addressed in the government's budget. Also, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to be in a position as their representative to give them hope. What's important to constituents living in Pictou Centre, and I am sure elsewhere, what are the issues important? What answers do they require? Well, for example, Mr. Speaker, what, <clears throat> a resident wondering why he cannot receive gas money for taking an income assistant recipient to Truro to the methadone rehab clinic. Students or residents requiring dialysis assistance. That's an ongoing concern. When you have an 87-year-old gentleman in your office that's telling you this, no circumstances can he drive to Andy Ganesh or Truro because of a waiting list at the uh, hospital in Picto. Mr. Uh, Speaker, industry landscape has changed in Picto County. You look at the uh, Trenton Rail Rail Car Plant, and as we speak, the uh, Lands Division are completing tearing down uh, several more buildings. I believe leaving probably two buildings left on the uh, 
120 acre site. We have Maritime Steel now that is an empty lot. We have Northern Pulp that's closed. So the landscape certainly, uh, and with the rail car plant in Trenton closing down, that was a financial tax uh, blow to the, to the town of Trenton. Mr. Speaker, residents are searching for better health care. We have fantastic health care workers, doctors, nurses, primary care workers. Do we have enough? Residents are worried about hospital closures. They're concerned that the budget did not address dollars for additional nursing homes. They want a positive economic climate in rural Nova Scotia. They want an efficient road system, and that includes paved and gravel rural roads. They want a commitment to environmental protection. They often talk about an efficient transit system. Mr. Speaker, there's a wide variety of issues arriving at our constituency office. You may have a parent who lost custody of their child, feeling helpless in attempts to acquire their child from Child Protective Services. Well, Mr. Speaker, what a gridlock. Dealing with CPS is similar to a traffic jam affecting a whole network of inter intersecting uh, streets. Mr. Speaker, lack of enough CAAs in our nursing homes. Constituents experiencing hunger, drug use, poverty. Constituents not getting a fair shake with WCB. Denial after denial after denial. And I have personal experience in that, Mr. Speaker. Imagine not accountable for their decisions. <clears throat> or if you're appealing, you must provide new evidence. We have residents, constituents coming to our office, Mr. Speaker, complaining about the cost of fuel, that they're relying on vehicles due to the lack of transit opportunities and the lack of transportation options. Long ways to acquire access to specialized medical care. It's not unfounded, Mr. Speaker, to have a young single mother with a child coming in pleading for food, pleading for money to purchase food. Another resident will come in, Mr. Speaker, telling us they need help because their electricity is going to be cut off by the provider. They cannot afford to buy food and essential medicine and have enough dollars to pay the power bill. Mr. Speaker, we have people in crisis that are unable to get medical forms completed because they don't have a doctor. And often these uh, forms are to have this particular constituent uh, suffer mental health issues to be transferred to Truro. Mr. Speaker, we have seniors on fixed incomes calling us, finding it difficult to purchase medicine, groceries, home heating. Every, everything to them is getting more expensive. Many of them are worried about the wait times in ER, lack of enough hospital beds. And as my colleague from Pictor West just mentioned uh, today, I have constituents coming in to my office saying that they were at the hospital at, at the uh, 6 o'clock in the morning waiting to have surgery and having to cancel because no beds. These are the things important to my constituents and most Nova Scotians. So they do not see this help in the budget. They feel they will have to keep struggling. I have witnessed too many times where the health system has failed our constituents. Whether it is the person whose addiction was treated as a crime instead of an illness, or the parent that is pleading for help because their child needs to be referred to a psychiatrist, but this cannot happen because they have no family doctor to refer them. Imagine, Mr. Speaker, an area of 46,000 people and our mental health clinic was closed at the Everdeen Hospital and we don't have a psychiatrist working there. I believe there is an answer for this growing problem of not being able to obtain a doctor in order to get referral papers filled out and passed on. Perhaps we should have a, specifically a clinic available for Nova Scotians that have no family doctor where they can go and get a prescription or a referral with OTIAN. Other pressing problems for many Nova Scotians, uh, Mr. Speaker, is limited housing options, wait lists for rentals, 
Affordable housing is a major concern. Difficult to find appropriate places to rent. Seniors wanting to stay in their homes. I believe we make it difficult for them, Mr. Speaker. You basically have to be living in poverty to stay in your home. My understanding, someone with a household income in Pictou Centre of over $2,700, the cap which prevents eligibility for our residents to repair windows, shingling a roof, replacing a furnace. The above issues I'm sure are facing every MLA in this chamber. These are the everyday issues that many Nova Scotians are faced daily. While a budget may be balanced, the increase in debt is concerning and more disciplined fiscal prudence will be required to tackle future challenges. When you look at personal and business taxes, competitiveness continues to be a huge problem for Nova Scotia. Without question, I am sure my colleague from Northside Westmount would agree that high personal and business income taxes cast a very negative dark cloud on economic growth. High taxes will always be a deterrent to obtaining businesses in this province. Mr. Speaker, this budget showed no relief in personal income taxes. As we begin year 2020, this province had the highest top combined federal and provincial personal income tax rate, 54% of any province or state in North America. Numerous constituents look at the highlights of the budget, the big increase in capital spending, over $1 billion. Many residents in my community have stated the following. Is the government attempting to curb the economic follow by the closing of Northern Pulp, a $50 million transition fund, while the annual salaries of Northern Pulp were approximately $40 million? One can examine the spending during the past three budgets and compare that with this current budget and make your own conclusion. Common sense will indicate that the closing of Northern Pulp will harm our growth and our province's GDP will show that at year's end. Mr. Speaker, the current virus has temporarily halted many exports, including a percentage of fish products, railway blockages across our country, and this was not factored into this year's budget numbers. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to finish with my opening comments. My, dig my biggest disappointment is the lack of urgency towards addressing the mental health crisis. The need for a mental health clinic at the Aberdeen Hospital is critical, a place close to families where they can be there to support their family member. We have too many constituents visiting our office because they are not getting any results elsewhere. They are often at a critical stage and it is nerve-wracking thinking of what the possible outcomes could be if the help is not available. Someone in crisis cannot wait for an appointment weeks and months away. They need immediate attention. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Motion carried. The House will now recess for a couple of minutes while it resolves itself into the Committee of the Whole House on Supply.
order. The Committee on the Whole House of Supply will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call the estimates for the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Resolution numbers E37, 44 and 47. I, I, call the min I will now invite the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure to make some opening remarks and also introduce the staff. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Good evening, uh, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about the great work we do at Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal on behalf of all Nova Scotians. Today, I have uh, the pleasure of uh, the company of Diane Surrett, our Executive Director of Finance and Strategic Capital Planning, and Deputy Paul LaFleche, <coughs> who needs no introduction. <laughs> Madam Chair, the mandate of the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal is to ensure we deliver safe, quality roadway and building infrastructure to support the ability of Nova Scotians to live and work in their communities. Last month, we announced the largest single-year capital funding in the province's history, a total investment of more than $1 billion. That means families and communities across Nova Scotia will have improved access to health care, schools, highways, and public infrastructure. Investments in capital across Nova Scotia will provide modernized facilities and infrastructure for today and for future generations. <clears throat> Through our focus and investments in health care, education, highways, and public infrastructure, we will continue to strengthen our communities and generate economic activity. We are continuing with an accelerated highways twinning and safety enhancement plan, as well as undertaking safety measures to improve the efficiency and safety of these roads. Nova Scotians expect us to provide trans a transportation network that is safe and allows for the efficient movement of people and goods. We also have a mandate to focus on improving the delivery of health care across the province, most notably the QE2 New Generation Project and the Cape Breton Regional Municipality Health Care Redevelopment Project, two, two uh, capital projects that we're extremely proud of. We will work to ensure that these projects and all the other infrastructure projects under our department are delivered, delivered in a timely and fiscally responsible manner. We continue to manage the greatest share of the government's capital budget that helps to pay for substantial road and bridge networks relative to the size of our province. We manage and maintain 23,000 kilometers of roads that spans four regional districts from Yarmouth to Amherst to the northern shores of Cape Breton. Our network also includes more than 4,200 bridges and nine subsidized provincial ferries. Like my fellow MLAs and my fellow Nova Scotians, I know many of these roads well. Well, especially the road uh, from Halifax uh, uh, to uh, Guysborough Eastern Shore Trackety, the number seven, and the 316. I travel back and forth frequently and I've had the opportunity to see the service provided by TIR's employees, from plowing and salting in the winter to filling potholes in the spring. I can see the results of their hard work. TIR's more than 2,000 employees are committed to the delivery of safe roads that help keep people connected and the economy moving. We do all of this with an overall operating budget of $535.8 million in 2021. The operating portion of our budget is used for the day-to-day -day operations of the department such as snow and ice control, highway and bridge maintenance, field operations, fleet amortization, ferry operations, vehicle compliance, engineering and construction services, administration, professional services, employee benefits, rim work, and smaller highway and building projects. In December, 
We released the province's five-year highway improvement plan for 2020-2021. It's the 11th year that the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal has unveiled our five-year plan for building, repairing, and maintaining Nova Scotia's 23,000 kilometers of roads and highways and our 4,200 bridges. And that provides an advance notice and a framework that people can see what the plans are for the upcoming five-year period. Sharing this plan with Nova Scotians lets them know about the improvements being made in their communities and when they can expect the work to be done. It also helps give Nova Scotia companies a better opportunity to prepare for the more than 150 highway improvement projects planned in the coming year. You'll be pleased to hear that 2020 will be another busy year for us. Almost 400 million will be invested in major construction, road improvements and bridge work. This is the largest investment in the history of the province in roads. Our highway plan includes more than 150 major construction and improvement projects that will make roads, highways and bridges safer for our citizens. It's all part of our commitment to ensure safe and connected communities. Our $400 million investment includes more than $210 million for major construction. This includes the new highways and bridges. $136 million for asphalt, resurfacing and bridges. $20 million for the gravel road program. Uh, I'm particularly proud of the gravel road program. Uh, I think this is an accumulation of $70 million in the gravel road program, which is aimed at our rural communities uh, over the, since it was introduced. And it's been very successful and uh, I think is, is providing uh, a great service in, uh, for, for both the residents of our communities, but also uh, for the department too, uh, to be fair, because having better roads means less maintenance uh, uh, for us. So another 20 million for the gravel road program this year, 17.3 million for equipment, machinery, and ferries, and 7 million for land purchases. Major construction on new highways and bridges accounts for 100 million of the overall increase from last year, with much of the additional funding focused on twinning portions of Highway 101, 103, 104, and Highway 107, or the Sackville Bedford Burnside connector. Folks, roads are expensive. Each twin kilometer costs three to five million, depending on the complexity of the road. An anticipated 550 kilometers of asphalt paving will be laid on roads and highways this year. 550 kilometers. I would like to highlight our $20 million again annual gravel road program for the repair and reconstruction of gravel roads. Well-maintained, good quality roads are essential for rural communities. We have 8,700 kilometers of gravel roads in our province, and we need to have the ability to repair more of these roads than we have in the past. And the program is a proactive approach that will build these roads to improve the structure and drainage. This will result in longer lasting driving surface and make regular road maintenance easier. We have 46 gravel road projects planned for this year. We're also very pleased to receive an additional $10 million towards J-Class roads. We will work closely with our municipal partners on rolling out this program and uh, it, for 2021. And 12 bridges are scheduled for replacement or rehabilitation. I want to talk for a moment about the uh, strategic partnership that we have with the Government of Canada. The significant expense of twinning and constructing new infrastructure points to the importance of working with our federal partners on the new Building Canada Fund. The Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, the National Disaster Mitigation Fund, and the National Trade Corridors Fund. We are pleased with the investments made to date with our federal partners. Our focus on road safety through our investment in highway twinning and other safety and major projects will cost over a billion dollars over the next few years. We are very proud to say that with our federal partners, we have been able to leverage almost 400 million for 13 projects <clears throat> to help offset the costs. Some examples include uh, 
the Bridgewater interchange on Highway 103 and the Highway 104 twinning project uh, where we received a $90 million uh, support uh, under the uh, Trade Corridors Fund. The Highway 103 Bridgewater Interchange, the government is supporting economic growth and improved road safety with a $20.4 million investment in new highway infrastructure in Bridgewater. The total cost of the project is $48.8 million. Our federal partners are also contributing $20.4 million and the town of Bridgewater is contributing $8 million. The project, which includes a new interchange between exit 12 and 13, will have a positive impact on the growth of the Bridgewater Business Park and road safety in the community. It includes a new diamond interchange, including ramps, roundabouts, bridge, and connector roads. The road through the Business Park will also be realigned, and there will be upgrades to five existing intersections. It's a, a, a complex project. Construction on the new interchange is expected in 2021 with the official opening plan for 2022. It will create 480 jobs plus additional economic and employment benefits from the investment. It will create access to 125 acres of developable land north of Highway 103. The Bridgewater Business Park is home to 50 businesses. The new interchange will make our highway safer and provide a dedicated interchange for the Bridgewater Business Park, making this important business center more accessible and attractive for investments and future growth. The Highway 104 twinning project. The 100 series highways are the backbone of our transportation system, carrying people and goods from one end of the province to the other. The Highway 104 Sutherland's River to Antigonish twinning project was identified several years ago as among the highest priorities by Nova Scotians during our heavily attended public consultations. What we heard loud and clear was that Nova Scotians want better and safer 100 series highway. We also heard very clearly that they want these improvements without tolls. Twinning the Sutherland's River to Antigonish is a priority as it will improve safety and efficiency along this stretch of highway. Given the financial constraints of the province and the price tags of over $2 billion to complete all of the 100 series sections that were desired, we needed a look, to look at ways to upgrade or twin 300 kilometers of highways quickly and affordably without the use of tolls. We considered various options and determined that the design, build, finance, operate, maintain, or a P3 model for this project would deliver the best value for money, plus deliver it on time. The P3 approach will mean that we have 38 kilometer twin portion of highway open earlier than through the traditional approach. In January, we announced Dexter Nova Alliance as the preferred proponent for the Highway 104 twinning project. The twinning of Highway 104 is to be completed by the end of 2023. The successful proponent will be required to operate and maintain the highway for 20 years following substantial completion of the project and to standards that Nova Scotians set. We are also getting a substantial contribution from Ottawa. As I mentioned, uh, the federal government is contributing $90 million to the project through the National Trade Corridors Fund. I want to turn to our provincial ferries for just a moment. Uh, our federal partners are also supporting us in that regard. The Little Narrows Ferry in Cape Breton and the Country Harbor Ferry in Guysborough County are both being replaced by a cable ferry that can carry 15 cars, increasing passenger capacity and improving overall operational efficiency, a testament to our commitment to maintaining our highway system in rural Nova Scotia. The new ferries will make daily travel more reliable and comfortable for area residents and visitors allowing them to travel to and from our region's top destinations and attractions safely and efficiently. The Country Harbour Ferry and the Little Narrows Ferry are $6 million each. Our federal partners are contributing 50% toward these ferries to a total of $6 million. The Country Harbour Ferry is expected to be completed of late summer of 2020. Construction for the Little Narrows Ferry is anticipated to start in spring 2020 with an estimated completion date in spring 2021. 
The new ferries will have improved mechanical systems and engines, ensuring that ferry services remain in operation for many years to come. From ferries to the art gallery, the art gallery of Nova Scotia is moving to a new modern space on Halifax's waterfront. This will enhance the province's position as a leader in the visual arts, inviting the world to celebrate our culture. It will also better showcase Nova Scotia's culture and excellence in visual arts nationally and internationally. The federal government, again, is contributing up to $30 million for this project, while the gallery itself will lead a capital campaign which is expected to raise $30 million. The province will contribute more than $70 million to this project, with the exact amount to be determined following the competitive processes. Earlier this year, we've launched an international design competition for the new gallery, which represents a big step towards a new gallery that will, part, will be a part of a new arts district on the Halifax waterfront. The response to the competition was overwhelming. It will be narrowed to three design teams in the summer of two, 2020 during the final stage of the competition before a qualified jury selects the winning team. The conceptual designs of all finalists we on pub, will be on public display for feedback, which will be provided to the winning design team. The successful design team will carry out an ongoing public engagement process. There's no question that there's a lot of global excitement for our new iconic art gallery. Cobquid Pass. Our government has committed to taking the tolls off the Cobquid Pass for Nova Scotian motorists once the bonds are paid off. At this time, no decision has been made on the removal of the tolls for truckers or non-Nova Scotia residents. Transportation and infrastructure renewal officials are reviewing the Highway 104 Western Alignment Act and the agreement with the bondholders, as well as maintenance and other costs for the Cobbequid Pass to provide government with the best option for moving forward. Give you an update on the TSA, the Traffic Safety Act. In addition to highways and public works, works we are responsible for policy development related to road safety. In October 2018, we introduced and passed a new modern Traffic Safety Act that will help make the province's roads and highways safer. It replaces the sorely outdated Motor Vehicles Act. The Motor Vehicle Act had not been rewritten since the early 20s and had been amended numerous times. As a result, it was uh, unclear and inconsistent and uh, uh, not reflecting the modern conditions uh, of, our, of our times. The new Traffic Safety Act will enable us to quickly address the more technical and day-to-day -day issues that ar arise in the administration of road safety. Staff continue to work on developing the regulations to support the Traf Traffic Safety Act. Similar to the new Act, the regulations will be easier to read and modernized to reflect the current and future motoring environment. <laughs> The regulations will also contain a significant portion of technical detail which is in the current Motor Vehicle Act. It is expected that the content of the new regulations be shared with stakeholders and the public prior to consideration by government. It is planned to have the new regulations complete by the fall of 2020. Madam Chair, our department is, more, is about more than just roads. Our employees are responsible, also responsible for managing the delivery of provincial buildings, such as schools, hospitals, correctional facilities, and to maintain public structures such as provincial museums and the Nova Scotia Legislature. We're investing $154.4 million to support the QE2 New Generation and the Cape Breton Regional Municipality Healthcare Redevelopment Projects that will transform how we deliver health care services to Nova Scotians. On the QE2 New Generation Project, government continues to work closely with the Nova Scotia Health Authority on the province's largest health care project to date, the QE2 New Generation Project. The QE2 New Generation Project is a $2 billion dollar investment, the largest health care investment project in Nova Scotia's history. 
The heart of this project is the expansion of the Halifax Infirmary site. Almost 1.5 million square feet of new space will be constructed at the Halifax Infirmary site. The HI expansion includes a new cancer care centre, which will be located on the former QE2 high school site, a new inpatient centre, which includes hospital beds and operating rooms, and that will be a tower built where the existing parkade on Roby Street is located, a new outpatient centre uh, that will be built on the former CBC building site, a new research, innovation and learning centre that will connect the new inpatient centre to the cancer centre. Every decision we make on this project is centred on patient needs. More than 14,000 people come to the QE2 Health Services Centre every day. 14,000 people every day. It serves patients and families from across Nova Scotia and indeed the Maritimes. A parking study conducted for the province indicated the following. About 92% of the visitors either drive or are driven and use on-site parking. 40% of the visits are from people and families traveling from outside HRN. About 2,700 parking spaces are needed at the HI site. We know that hospital parking is a challenge now and this challenge will grow with the expansion of the HI site. We don't want to add to the anxiety of patients and families by not having suitable parking. Safe, convenient, on-site or close by are the essential attributes. To meet future parking needs, our parking strategy includes underground parking at the new cancer centre, inpatient centre and outpatient centre buildings and the use of existing lots on the Halifax Infirmary site. However, more parking is required to meet the future parking needs. We are working very closely with HRM staff to address these future parking needs and are looking at options. We're pleased with the progress of our parking discussions with HRM and hope sincerely to have some parking solutions soon. I would like to highlight some um, of our QE2 project milestones in this fiscal year. At the HI site, the demolition of the CBC building will start soon. Removing the, the former CBC building is an important step to make way for an outpatient centre that will serve hundreds of thousands of Nova Scotians each year. We've approved almost six million to add six more dialysis chairs at the Halifax Infirmary. As a result, 24 more patients will be able to be treated at the Halifax Infirmary each week for dialysis. Work is progressing on the HI's third and fifth floors that will result in Atlantic Canada's first hybrid OR and two interventional suites where surgical procedures are performed with state-of-the-art equipment. I want to turn to the Bears Lake Community Outpatient Centre. As part of our commitment to provide care closer to home, the Bears Lake Community Outpatient Centre will deliver a variety of services that don't require a trip to the hospital in a more effective and convenient way for patients and their families. We anticipate construction of the Community Outpatient Centre uh, in Bears Lake this summer, 2020 summer. Dartmouth General. The Dartmouth General Hospital expansion and renovation, an important component of the QE2 New Generation project, celebrated a milestone. In December, we officially opened Dartmouth General's new three-story wing. The, name, the wing is named after a lifelong resident of Dartmouth and community business leader, the late Neville J. Guilfoy. The Neville J. Guilfoy wing includes eight new operating rooms, doubling the number of operating rooms and increasing surgeries performed, new clinical space with more exam and procedures room, larger waiting and reception areas and office space, and a new space with state-of-the-art equipment for cleaning and sterilizing medical instruments. Government also approved 7.46 million to add six more dialysis chairs at the Dartmouth General. As a result, 36 more patients, patients will be treated in Dartmouth each week, bringing the, the total close to 100 patients. 
Construction there is expected to be completed this summer. We've also completed Dartmouth General's parking lot that includes almost 300 new parking spaces. The expansion of the parking lot improves flow and meets the needs of our patients, visitors, staff, and community. We're very pleased with the progress of the Dartmouth General Hospital's expansion and renovation, which is anticipated to be completed in the fall of 2021. I would also say that uh, the Dartmouth General serves uh, Guysborough Eastern Shore Trackety in the Halifax portion of the riding uh, from uh, Ecom Seacom West. And the folks uh, that I talk to in that section of my riding are over the top in the improvements that are made to Dartmouth General. Overall, we're making good progress on the QE2 new generation project that will change the way we deliver health care for generations to come and one that we can be proud of. CBRM Healthcare Redevelopment Project. We're also making great progress with the CBRM Health Redevelopment Project that is transforming Cape Breton's health system to better connect patients and their families to the care that they need. This 500 million plus plan includes a new building at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital for a larger emergency department and a new critical care unit and cancer care center. It will see an expanded emergency department Department at the Glace Bay Hospital and new community health centers and long-term facilities to replace the aging Northside General and new Waterford Hospital, which will remain open until the new facilities are completed. The project team, led by Kay Bretner, as I might mention, has met with hundreds of doctors and other healthcare professionals and dozens of community groups from community health boards and service clubs to business leaders and advocacy groups. The project is about replacing aging buildings with modern facilities that not only meet people's health care needs, but are places where doctors, specialists, nurses, and other health care professionals want to practice. This will make recruiting doctors and other professionals in the health care field more attractive. It's a multi-year project that will cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Redesigning and rebuilding the health care system in CBRM will be the single biggest health care investment in the island's history. It will also create thousands of jobs during the construction phase. I'm proud of the progress so far, but we must keep moving so we can achieve a modern, high-quality health care system and CBRM and rebuild the aging infrastructure. Other health care investments, along with our investment in the new QE2 new generation CBRM health care development projects, we are also investing $54.3 million for construction, repair, and renewal of other hospitals and medical facilities. Uh, this investment includes additional dialysis units in Kentville, Digby, Glace Bay, Halifax, Dartmouth, and Middleton, a new larger health care center in Middleton, and a major expansion of the IWK Health Center. These investments clearly demonstrate the government commitment to improving health care across the province. Boat Harbor. With the Boat Harbor Remediation Project, we are taking a positive approach towards addressing a decades-old problem. The project team at Nova Scotia Lands has worked closely over the past several years with Pictou Landing First Nation, with scientists, researchers, with multiple departments and agencies, and with other community partners on the shared goal of returning Boat Harbor to a tidal estuary. Cleaning up Boat Harbor is a long-term project that will benefit the entire region. Last July, the remediation team completed the pilot scale test that helped give valuable input onto how to approach the full remedi remediation process. The team is currently finalizing its environmental impact statement to submit to the federal regulators. State-of-the-art research is being done down there, Madam Chair. It's absolutely fabulous, the expertise that we've involved there. Once the federal assessment process is complete, the team anticipates that cleanup could begin by late 2021. The full remediation is expected to take between four and seven years. Projects of this magnitude are certainly challenging and complex, but they are vitally important and we are committed to it. The project is a step towards righting a historic wrong. 
We, we cannot undo the harms of the past, but we can do best to create a healthier environment for the future. We can do our best to ensure that community members will once again be able to enjoy the use of Boat Harbor and surrounding lands for generations to come. The Nova Scotia Main Ferry Service. The Nova Scotia Main Ferry is a vital part of our transportation system, like the Transcanada Highway, and important to our tourism industry, particularly in southwest Nova. We are disappointed we were unable to offer a service last year. It's probably an understatement. When trying to establish an international ferry service at a different location, it is complex. At the end of the day, we've secured a long-term solution that will bring economic benefits to all of Nova Scotia. The ferry is good for our rural economy and is good for Nova Scotia tourism. We are pleased that Bay Ferries is in a position where they have begun selling tickets for the 2020 season. We look forward to welcoming passengers from Bar Harbor to Nova Scotia this year. That's a traditional port that had operated for many, many years. Businesses, large and small, benefit from the money spent by visitors who choose to come to our province via the ferry. We're working closely with Bay Ferries, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and other partners to ensure a successful season this year. Bar Harbor will provide long-term stability for the service. This means no blackout dates, a dedicated ferry space, which we didn't have in Portland, a long-term lease, and a long-term charter. And those are the elements that will make it successful. All parties are working closely and collaboratively together to get this right and to get the service started for the upcoming tourism season. The province did not have an option to remain in Portland, as the town's long-term objective was focused on cruise ship business well beyond the 2019, with the 2019 season. Work on the ferry terminal includes a fixed span and pier deck, pile repairs, as well as moving the transfer bridge from Portland Terminal and reassembling it at Bar Harbor. Work also includes the demolition of some outer buildings, construction of Customs Plaza facilities, and reinstallation of the security equipment moved from Portland. Renovation to the existing terminal will provide retail space for Bay Ferries, public space for customers, and modernized secure security screening facilities for U.S. Customs officials. We are confident the move to Bar Harbor will provide greater long-term stability for the service and for a successful 2020 tourism season. Madam Chair, with that, I'm ready to uh, accept questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. We will move on to the PC caucus for one hour. I recognize the Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the Minister and the, and the team um, for all the preparation of the budget. Um, Minister, I want to start with the, with the um, QE2 redevelopment. Um, I know that uh, moving the cancer care program to the infirmary site will cause the loss of um, a number of parking spots, I think somewhere in the range of eight or 900 parking spots. Um, that'll be at a time when the consolidation of the cancer program will mean an increased demand on, on the unit and the corresponding parking spots. So you'll have demand going up and supply going down. We know there's a bunch of issues with that. We've all been following along. I'd like to ask the minister, if we kept the cancer care program at its current location, uh, would the need to establish additional parking at the infirmary site uh, by avoiding and demolishing the existing Roby Street Parkade be mitigated or removed? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Transportation and Infrastructure.
Minister. Thank you very much, and thank the uh, member for the uh, for the question. <clears throat> and I think the the question actually uh, speaks to the uh, complexity of the QE2 new generation project uh, in its totality. Uh, it, as I mentioned, it is the largest uh, uh, project we have under, ever undertaken uh, in the province, and really the. Uh, Planning is more than four years old, and through that, in, in terms of its genesis, and through that period of time, we have been started where you would want to start, and that is with the uh, clinicians, uh, the users of the facility, the health professionals, uh, who gave have given us excellent advice uh, through that period of time. Uh, we, there are 43 committees set up uh, that ha have been meeting uh, with various aspects of the project uh, uh, in, in mind. Uh, on, the, on the parking uh, issue, I've mentioned in my remarks what the uh, traffic numbers are at that facility and how important parking is to the, uh, to the um, users, to the patients. Uh, I mean, just think for a moment, uh, somebody from my riding, which could be as much as three or four hours away, who have never driven in Halifax before and have rece received a, a referral uh, to an oncologist who was at the, uh, at the uh, infirmary and in the, pro in the process, they uh, have to drive in Halifax. That in itself is a daunting undertaking for lots of lots of folks uh, and that I think underlines the importance of the parking uh, process uh, requirement in in the total redevelopment with regard to the uh, cancer center and its location uh, obviously in uh, uh, the uh, world of, of uh, appraisals and value uh, there is a principle called the highest and best use uh, for property. And it, it's quite obvious that the site where the cancer facility is going uh, is the highest and best use for that rather than a surface parking lot uh, facility. So uh, we have followed the advice of the people who know this business, who understand the relationship between the uh, cancer facility and the operating hospital, which is the current situation uh, in, the, in the process, uh, in that uh, the existing Dixon Center is close to the uh, facilities that we will be, uh, uh, we will be uh, um, moving out of. And the, the new facility uh, will be close to the to the OR, uh, much more convenient for uh, the uh, uh, for the uh, patients there, uh, and um, actually, when you think about, uh, it always occurred to me anyway, driving driving down Roby Street, and and what you're looking at is the is actually the rear of the uh, facility when you're on Roby Street because Summer Street is the front entrance to the facility. But the, on that busy location, and with the value of real estate there, to have a parking garage there, at the time, it obviously was a, was a decision that was made. They had to probably struggle with parking at that time, uh, the same as, as uh, we, we are doing. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be the highest and best use to me. And a facility that has been designed by Cajun, uh, which is one of the globe's uh, uh, foremost um, uh, hospital consultants and designers uh, ha have uh, designated that uh, section, uh, that piece of property, to uh, be uh, the location of the new uh, uh, tower that's a part of the development. Uh, and again, uh, that uh, striking piece of property that's on the corner, 
which is a former location of the QE, two, uh, QE High School, uh, is at the advice of our uh, uh, advisors in the, in the clinical community, uh, said that's the place for the new cancer center. It will, it will not require shuttling, which is going on at the Dixon uh, Center now. And it also provides us with a clean slate at the current uh, site uh, of the VG and the Centennial Building uh, for uh, the great uh, uh, opportunities that will await uh, Nova Scotians on that, uh, on, at those valuable uh, uh, sites. So in the overall, what we have uh, relied on here, and I think as we should, is the advice that we've gotten from the uh, uh, clinicians and the medical community as to what they see as uh, the best uh, uh, design, the best use. They know best what uh, they need to work with in providing that, that bricks and mortar arrangement uh, so that they can uh, do their best work and so that with new facilities, Nova Scotia can continue to be a leader in the medical field in Atlantic Canada. The member for Pictou East. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. There's no room for error on this on this situation, and um, uh, the minister referred referred to four years of study and 43 committees. I think he said. And yet, uh, when the light went on just a little bit around this parking situation, it was a mad scramble. And I think in the minister's opening comments, he, he referred to trying to find a, a, a solution, which obviously acknowledges a problem. Uh, so that's the very first little glimmer we've got of this project, and there's a pro problem that's got to sort of be sorted out. And uh, uh, certainly oncologists are, are raising concerns. Um, about the move of the cancer center and the and the wisdom of that move, and um, it's um, it's very concerning to Nova Scotians that this, this government will take on a debt uh, to do this project. Which we're, there's no do-overs on this project, you know. And, and the history, the history of managing good projects is not good under this government. The blue nose, the ferry. We can talk about all these things. So um, the current park parking situation is in fact well suited for those that are in and out of the hospital, uh, as opposed to indiv individuals out there for a long time. It's very well suited for those that are in and out. Uh, it's near the registration area. It's near several bus busy outpatient clinics, x-ray lab services, uh, as well as same day patient surgeries. So if parking were shifted to another location, uh, the ambulatory patients would, would be, um, would be would, there would be a shuttling service, which is not uncommon. Uh, that's not uncommon. Um, but, um, I'm just questioning whether this move places patients first, as the minister has indicated that he believes it does. So um, um, we heard from the Minister of Health in estimates that the Minister of Health uh, believed that building these new buildings would, would re lead to more uh, modern equipment and the most modern treatments. I'd like to ask the, the, the minister, does he share that view that we can only have modern equipment and modern treatments if we have a brand new building uh, to, to house them in? Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess uh, if I had a uh, 1992 Honda, uh, I might like to upgrade to something, of, to something a little newer. The deputy says that's what he is. But, 
uh, and, and a sort of that's that's uh, part of the principle that's here. But for clarity, the cancer care center is going on the old uh, Queen Elizabeth High School site, which is where the uh, where the uh, uh, garden community garden was. The clinicians told us that we had to spend money, new money, on either the Dixon Center or a new alternative. And because we had committed to what we're doing at uh, the uh, new gen QE2 New Generation uh, project, we did an analysis and, and uh, it became apparent that uh, having a new state-of-the-art facility would be uh, the, uh, the way to go. The tower that will be going in uh, where the existing parkade is, is has to be matched up to the operating rooms uh, that are in the existing facility. So they have to, there has to be a seamless flat floor between the uh, areas so that uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can access that uh, uh, completely. Uh, with regard to a shuttle uh, service, uh, we, uh, the information we have is that that's not best practice, uh, that it's avoided uh, where it can be avoided. And, you know, I actually would invite uh, all members of the House to go up and park uh, at the rear entrance to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the Halifax Infirmary and just for a few minutes, because no parking zone there, but you can probably get away with a few minutes and see the folk who are going in there in the morning, through the day. You know, they're in walkers, they're in wheelchairs, they're in casts. They have a look of terror on their face because they may be from some rural part of the province. They've just harrowed the traffic coming in and they're freaking out and they're going to see an oncologist for what could be a death sentence. So that's the people that we are trying to help. That's the people that we want to provide new services for with state-of-the-art equipment. It does cost money, there's no doubt about it, and we are committed to doing it. We are doing that with our fifth balanced budget, increased our, our uh, highways budget from a short uh, three years ago, $215 million in capital, to over $400 million this year, all with delivering to Nova Scotians in a fifth year uh, of balanced budget with a 55 million dollar surplus forecast. So five, five, five. <laughs> that's, our, that's our commitment to, uh, to uh, Nova Scotians. And uh, is it expensive? It's expensive. Uh, how much uh, uh, can we afford to spend? We're at 4.8 billion now in our health care uh, budget uh, in, in, the, in the province. Uh, uh, we are committed to upgrading these facilities that we know served us well. The Centennial Building in 67, you know, 50 some years old. It's at the end of its best before date. We know they have to be replaced and that's what we're committed to doing. The member for Pictou East. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. We just want you to get it right. That's all we want. I mean, this is, this is a government that says opposition's against kids at some points, against Nova Scotians, against this, against that, against health care. No, we want you to get it right. That's what we want. Um, and when you're going to commit Nova Scotians to a 50-year project, $2 billion, get it right. Uh, we're asking the questions because it's, 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 it's not clear to health care professionals, let alone to us. Um, uh, that that all the all the different uh, concerns have been raised. So, um, the redeveloped uh, Halifax Infirmary site is projected to have 626 beds. That's a very very precise number. Um, it's an increase in the number of existing beds. This is a number that I can only assume would have been ri arrived at using. Uh, uh, projections about future patient needs. It would have been arrived at adjusting for demographics, uh, consideration of rates of illness by age and by sex, consideration of new technologies. Um, and, and it would have listed a number of assumptions. I wonder if the, if the minister can, can uh, share with the House the analysis that arrived at the number that 626 beds what was necessary. Is that an analysis you can, you can share with the House? <coughs>
Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank the member uh, for the uh, uh, question. It's a very uh, good and rele re relevant uh, question uh, and, and, uh, in terms of the why isn't it 630 or 620? It's 626. Uh, we, uh, after there was a, a bit of a stutter in uh, 2012 about uh, going ahead with this uh, particular project and when it was relaunched in 2014 uh, the approach that we took was to again consult the people who know what uh, the answer is uh, uh, to these questions and uh, there was a master clinical plan uh, conducted uh, and um, feasibility studies assisted by our, uh, by our uh, consultant uh, that uh, accepted the input from the, the folks who were going to be working sometimes 24 hours a day in these, in these facilities, the cl clinical people, and that's how uh, the process was uh, arrived at. Now you have to also take this into context that at the, the, the QE2 new development uh, plan is also affected by the Dartmouth General improvements. New beds in Dartmouth General, new, new services over there, new operating rooms over there, new operating uh, rooms uh, in Hans County at Windsor, uh, the, uh, the, the, the center that we're putting in, uh, uh, out in, in Bears uh, Lake Park, and even the work that's being, improvements that are being made in Cape Breton. Uh, chain, will change the intake and the landscape uh, a little bit. So the uh, number is one that is uh, uh, the result of significant input from people who know what the uh, uh, requirements are and uh, their, their uh, input into uh, uh, what the uh, facility should, uh, uh, should look like. Uh, you know, Madam Chair, in uh, um, different countries approach uh, health care uh, uh, differently. Uh, I know, uh, for instance, in, in Germany, uh, the hospitals, some of them are private, actually, and the clini clinical care is in one building, and next door is a accommodation that is built for the uh, to for for the for the patients. So they've kind of separated the rehab section from the uh, clinical care process. Uh, that's not our style here in in Canada, where we uh, you know we continue the care after significantly after the uh, event. Uh, but you know there's very uh, different uh, uh, approaches to. Uh, uh, how that <clears throat> how that should look. Uh, one thing I do want to say, though, is that uh, I want Nova Scotians to really think about the quality of care of health care that we have in this province, in terms of comparisons to other uh, regions, other other countries. And think about, uh, uh, in a positive way, how, how uh, really how good we have it. We have seniors' pharmacare, which is really a lifesaver for many, many uh, of our seniors. We have uh, availability in, uh, and, and of course there are glitches, there's no doubt about that, uh, to uh, quality health care, particularly on an acute basis uh, in, in particular. So uh, it, it's often a question, I think, if the glass is half full or half empty when it comes to this process. The other thing is, too, is that we, you know, we really don't start paying attention until we, are, until we need uh, the service or somebody close to us needs the surface, service. And uh, our uh, demographic uh, is changing. The Minister of Seniors uh, in this presentation uh, in the Red Room indicated that, that by 2030, one in four Nova Scotians will be 65 plus. And we all know that <clears throat> uh, as we age, the requirement for, uh, for health services 
escalates. That's what we're headed for. That's why we are putting such emphasis on uh, uh, immigration, about youth retention, about attempting to try and improve that ratio so that um, we can obviously uh, uh, improve our pr productivity, uh, our economic uh, uh, status, which will give us more resources to be able to service the, uh, the uh, expanding uh, number of seniors that we see uh, in, uh, in, in Nova Scotia, and it is projected to be the case over the next decade. Thank you. The member for Pictou East. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I didn't hear about the analysis that came to the 626. Maybe that came from the Deloitte report. I'm not sure. Um, but we'll take that as asked and answered, I guess. Um, has the province considered or is the province reconsidering retaining the Roby Street Parkade and building a new parkade adjacent to the new ambulatory care centre on the former CBC site? Is that a consideration right now? Minister. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, you know, as I indicated, um, the, the uh, intricate planning process that has brought us to uh, the decisions that we have taken up to this point in time uh, started a long time ago. Uh, the input from the medical community uh, required that what we're doing, because this is a renovation rather than a greenfield uh, uh, site. We need, it's like a, a giant Lego uh, situation. We have to fit the various pieces in to accommodate the activities that are currently undertaken at the site. Okay, so we've got all this, the, the uh, various, uh, the various services that are offered there. And of course, the, one of the major ones is the access to the operating rooms uh, in a convenient and sensible manner. Uh, and uh, so that's why the tower is going where the parkade is. That car parkade is actually a, a, a giant Lego operation and can be unbolted and uh, uh, there may be some residual value uh, in that. That'll be up to the successful bidder uh, on the contract. Uh, so we were limited by the fiscal requirements, physical requirements, uh, that uh, were made apparent to us by the people who are the users uh, of the facility. Uh, every uh, conceivable um, configuration was extensively reviewed uh, through the uh, process and uh, the, uh, the acquisition of the CBC building became uh, uh, apparent to us that that would be a, uh, uh, a requirement and we were able to successfully acquire that uh, particular uh, piece of property. Uh, but it's, it's not uh, conceivable that we can uh, uh, use that particular site for, for parking. As uh, the, the House would know, we are looking at uh, alternatives currently to uh, the proposal to build a, the uh, parkade uh, um, across the street, across Summer Street, uh, that uh, we scoured the area uh, for possible uh, uh, parking locations. I think. At the site, we looked at uh, eight different uh, options. We are putting uh, a thousand underground uh, sites there. Uh, I believe the cost comparison between uh, surface and underground is 135,000 versus 35,000. 
So it's definitely a fiscal consideration. But there are other issues at that site. There's essentially a huge water uh, underground river close to the surface there uh, that if we went any deeper, we'd be intercepting in the process. And it's just not feasible for us to be able to, uh, to do that. So there are physical limitations uh, that exist. But more importantly, I think, is, are, are the design requirements and the design limitations that are dictated by the people who know this business and understand what it is uh, that we uh, are going to uh, require there to uh, continue the great uh, health care uh, offering that we have. And we also uh, have a duty to our, um, uh, our workers in, in that uh, facility and their dedication to give them the best uh, 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 facility that we can and the best working environment uh, that we can. Uh, there's a transition that's going to be required. We're in the during the construction period. We also we actually uh, looked uh, and and worked with the city uh, at the former St. Pat's High School site as a possible temporary uh, site uh, in the city uh, who. Uh, have recently uh, uh, dispossessed themselves of that particular site. Uh, we're unwilling, and, and I can understand why, uh, to uh, commit that site to a longer-term uh, option. Uh, and uh, that in itself uh, is, is, is really not that convenient because it involves one of the busiest intersections in the province that people would have to, uh, have to uh, wrestle with. But that option really is, is off the table at, uh, at this time. So uh, yeah, we did look at uh, what our options were and what the highest and best use was for the uh, former CBC site. And it was concluded that that wasn't one of them. Member for Picto East. Thank you. In terms of the, um, the Yarmouth Ferry, if the ferry does not sail this year, what action will the uh, province take? Um, if it doesn't have a, a full, complete sailing season, what action are you prepared to take as minister to protect the taxpayers of this province? Minister. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, we're uh, very happy that uh, the operator Bay Ferries is in the market currently uh, selling uh, for the upcoming uh, year uh, <clears throat> and uh, that the uh, new facility in Bar Harbor is uh, nearing completion and particularly delighted to see, I call it the catching facility that's being constructed in, uh, in uh, Yarmouth as a new terminal uh, receiving center. Uh, and the reason I, I like that one in particular is because of the commitment that's been shown by the municipal governments in that area, which is a testament to how valuable they see the ferry is that they are putting municipal money into that new uh, uh, ferry terminal there, the three municipal units uh, affected in the area there. Uh, so, of course, that's a hypothetical question, and uh, uh, we would deal with that uh, should it evolve, but at this point in time, uh, uh, we don't feel that that's, uh, that's uh, very likely. The member for Picto East. Thank you, and if only we hadn't heard that. <laughs> those same statements quite a few times last year about the likelihood of missing an entire season. I know at, at, a, at a committee across the street, uh, the CEO of, of the operator was there and I asked him that very question and he completely dismissed it as impossible that the season would be missed and sadly we know how that, uh, how that story ended and uh, I, um, I'm not convinced that we won't see a rewrite of that story but um, uh, I hope we don't. Uh, Nova Scotians deserve a lot better. So um, with, with that, those few words, I'll, I will uh, cede my time to the member from, uh, from uh, Picto Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you want to see anything? Who knows? 
sitting there. Okay. The member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, I, I want to thank uh, again, as my colleague mentioned at the beginning of his comments, uh, I want to thank the staff for being here, uh, also the staff upstairs, and and all the great work the staff does in uh, in your department and uh, across the uh, across the province. Anyway, uh, uh, Minister, my I'm going to throw you a lob ball. My first question is. Um, and uh, of course, I'm going to be looking for short answers also. That'll give me the opportunity to ask, to ask a lot more questions, Madam Chair. The, um, some comments on the uh, uh, lands division with regard to the uh, Trenton rail car uh, facility that's uh, disappearing as we speak, uh, building by building by building, approximately 120 acres. Um, we've, we've talked from time to time about this here. Um, I guess the former DSME facility, I like to call it the former Trenton Rail Car, Greenbrier. Anyway, the uh, couple things, uh, just an update on what's happening right now, what the plans are for the future of that particular 120 acre site, and what are perhaps some of the possibilities uh, with regard to that piece of land in the town of Trenton. Minister. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, one of the uh, delightful things that uh, this uh, ministry has brought to me is a, a deep appreciation for the industrial history uh, of Pictou County. Uh, I really didn't understand or know before what a great history the Pictou County had in steel manufacturing and uh, what a powerhouse it was uh, back in the day on the rail side and even uh, as recently as the 90s when Greenbrier uh, was in there and how important uh, uh, it was and remains in the memories of folks in Pictou County. Uh, times change. Uh, we have to uh, change with the times. Sometimes it's uh, government is uh, not able to bob and weave as, uh, as uh, flexibly as the private sector can. But then at the same time, that's probably a good thing because there's a lot of consideration that goes into uh, spending the public funds of the uh, Nova Scotia taxpayers in a, in a way that brings a public good and a, and a, and a good return. Uh, when I, uh, with my uh, able executives at Nova Scotia Lands, uh, took over the uh, responsibility uh, for the uh, facility, uh, at, uh, at Trenton, for me it was looking at it with a new set of eyes. Uh, and I understand how uh, it tugs at the heartstrings of people, the glory days, the days uh, when uh, members of the House actually worked there, and uh, it was in their families, uh, and a, a tremendous tradition that uh, uh, that existed. We have seen this evolution in Nova Scotia in many uh, in many forms. You might say we're also almost going through it again now with Northern Pulp. Uh, we certainly had it with with uh, Sydney Steel, with Cisco, uh, with the glory days of the coal mining industry in. Uh, in uh, Nova Scotia with St. Rose, Calgary and Inverness. Things, things change. However, there is inherent significant value in the former Trenton Works site. That inherent value consists of a 120 acres 
of industrially uh, zoned property accessed by both water, does have a limited water access, and uh, a, a current rail uh, access. Uh, these uh, are strategic uh, qualities for global development. There are people who are searching the globe looking for uh, these kinds of opportunities. There's, there's, a, uh, there's a, an inherent value in being right alongside of a major uh, generating station. So uh, electrical availability is, is big. In uh, the uh, existing site that we had there when our department were asked to uh, absorb it into Nova Scotia land, uh, we did a, an analysis of the uh, a, B, and C buildings, as they were referred to, I think it is, uh, that were there. And I remember the day that I walked in and, and the ceiling was higher than this place <coughs> in here because it was an industrial site. I think the building was 1,390 feet long, 60 feet wide, and, and close to probably 70 feet to the, to the ceiling. And at the very top was a 1,900 vintage roof. No insulation, made out of wood, and problematic long term. On the sides was crumbling bricks, bricks that were over a hundred years old, falling apart. The uh, folks who were building the towers in there were able to make that work. It was an elongated uh, area, great for long. Uh, matters uh, that, uh, that they uh, uh, wanted to uh, build the, uh, the towers with uh, and, and suitable for putting into heavy industrial equipment that they would require to welding and to lift the, the, the cranes, <coughs> the gantry cranes that uh, uh, were there, which all ended up being sold uh, uh, after the uh, exit of the, uh, the company. Unfortunately, they failed to anticipate the fact that the wind turbine manufacturing business was changed, that the nacelles, the part that's the turbine on top, have to be matched and the companies like to build them themselves to their own plans and ship them to the sites, break them up, reassemble them on the site, weld them together, put them up, and they maintain control. So off-the-shelf uh, towers uh, were really not the answer for that uh, particular industry. And I think there was a misapprehension of the opportunity that was there in terms of uh, what the sales opportunity, what the, what the volume opportunity might uh, have uh, been at, uh, at the time. Uh, which resulted in them exiting after the government of the day had put significant money into the, into the operation in a probably a sincere uh, effort to uh, maintain that facility there. I think our approach is a little bit different. To get to that inherent value that I mentioned to you in terms of the 120 acres of industrial land with flat access, with a rail line, water access to the river, the existing structures that were there were liabilities. A potential uh, purchaser would have to, uh, would take a look at that and, ha and realize they have to incur the costs of uh, demolishing those uh, buildings. There are two buildings there that we have deemed uh, uh, recoverable uh, and uh, could be uh, used by, for, for alternate uses. They're more uh, modern facilities, and uh, one of them is quite is quite good, and they're large facilities, uh, Madam Chair, and I'm sure the member is uh, is very familiar with what I'm talking about there. Uh, so those those have been maintained. Uh, the removal of the uh, 100 plus year old facilities uh, will enhance the uh, saleability of that uh, property. Uh, for a prospective uh, purchaser. So let me turn to that for just a minute. Uh, we have had a lot of tire kickers in the uh, uh, analysis there. 
A lot of people off the, right off the bat came in and probably incentivized by the, uh, by the deal that was given to the former operator, who walked away with $60 million uh, of taxpayers' uh, money uh, at the time. And, uh, the, the, you know, there's people out there who think that all governments are vulnerable and that uh, desperate uh, people will make desperate decisions and accept any kind of, of uh, proposal. But uh, that's not uh, the way we see it. We feel we have a valuable asset there. We are committed to uh, unlocking the value in that site. Uh, the demolitions that have taken place are part of that process to unlock that, val that value. And we are constantly dealing with people who have uh, ideas about what they want to see there. But as you know, uh, Madam Chair, uh, the idea is great, but you need to have the capital to implement the uh, project. So we do a fairly deep dive uh, with the folks who are talking to us about their wonderful uh, projects that they have, and some of them are very exciting, uh, but it's the, uh, like the movie, uh, Show Me the Money. Right? We're not going to go down the road that others have gone down in the past at that site and uh, uh, end up with something that will, uh, the taxpayers in Nova Scotia will be left holding the bag for. One of the things that uh, I, I uh, want to explore at that site is a... Uh, there is a federal endowment to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, uh, which has a, uh, it's called the Green Fund, and it has a brownfield rehabilitation component to it. Uh, and I'm, I am hoping that we're going to work with the municipalities in the area to see if we can access some of the, uh, uh, the, the, the funds for uh, uh, for that particular site. Uh, redevelopment on, on these sites is happening all over uh, Canada, all over the world, uh, and uh, what were uh, previously contaminated and uh, um, invaluable, worthless properties because of the nature of growth have become very valuable and uh, the, uh, the, the Municipal Green Fund has a lot of money that uh, it's looking for projects for uh, for the uh, brownfield redevelopment. So I think that's an option too, that might be able to uh, help us in that uh, in that particular uh, in that particular situation. Uh, so I think, Madam Chair, I can understand on, on the outside <clears throat> how people who were used to that wonderful industrial history that Pictou County enjoyed that made it a powerhouse uh, during two wars uh, might feel about uh, the changes that are coming. But we're planning for the future. We want, to, we want to put in place an opportunity that will regenerate that kind of opportunity in that situation. We think it's a valuable property and we're working very hard to extract uh, the value out of it as we uh, go forward. Was that the short answer you were looking for? I recognize the Honourable Member for Pictou East. Madam Chair, so much for law balls. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Madam Chair, I could talk here for probably hours and days uh, with regard to the history of that place, uh, and time doesn't permit. But uh, I had relatives working there back in 1878. But uh, so we'll leave that at that. And and I had. The opportunity to work in there also and uh, the minister referred to the uh, high ceilings and of course they had to be high because of the uh, the, the uh, distance for the cranes uh, that were working in the plant but they were I, I can agree with them they were massive buildings uh, bigger than football fields anyway thank you for the answer uh, minister the um, I think uh, we'll move on with another question and, and I think uh, this particular question here is uh, it's the only one I have, and I, I think it's an important one. It's dealing with the uh, the uh, ferry from Yarmouth to uh, to Maine, and uh, and I'll, I'll I'll mention a few things that you're very aware of prior to the to the question, and uh, I'll, I'll see what the answer is with regard to the question. But the the uh, subsidy for the Yarmouth Maine ferry is projected to be 16.3 million. 
Uh, we all know some people, you know, some people across the province have criticized uh, this service. Others describe it, describe this service as great for uh, tourism and the economy of rural Nova Scotia. Uh, and we all know we, uh, we need this service. We need a link there, just like we need a link to PEI, we need a link to Newfoundland. The uh, 2020 subsidy is, appro is approximately the same uh, grant given to the company in 2019. Uh, on top of that, Nova Scotia taxpayers passed out $13.1 million in 2015 on retrofitting the boat and beginning the service, with an additional $10.2 million spent during the 2018-19 fiscal year for um, the, uh, I believe it was the gearbox that uh, was damaged, um, and of course 8.5 to the uh, Bar Harbour Terminal. Including the projected $16.3 million grant for the 2020 season, Nova Scotia has spent $95.5 million on the ferry service since 2015. My question, uh, Minister, is this. Uh, it, it won't be possible to do it this now because of the circumstances last year, but maybe every year going afterwards. Uh, will the government uh, conduct an economic impact assessment that would provide details on what effects, if any, the service has had in rural Nova Scotia. Are we getting a good return? Are we getting a bang for the buck? Yeah, in, in other words. You have 11 minutes, Mr. Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for the, uh, uh, for the question. In response to the economic uh, uh, study, uh, I would contend that we had that done last year. The numbers in that section of the province dropped by 29 percent. 29 percent, the most precipitous drop ever experienced in a tourism region in Nova Scotia in one year. So how did that happen? That happened because of the very unfortunate circumstance that we found ourselves in and our sincere efforts to solidify that service there, which we are going to do this year, failed, and we didn't have a sailing season. And uh, 55,000 American visitors were unable to come across and spend uh, time with us in, uh, in Nova Scotia. And we know uh, Tourism Nova Scotia tells us that these are the highest spending folk that come uh, to uh, spend time with us in Nova Scotia. <clears throat> I mean, you know, uh, I remember uh, clearly growing up in, in, in Inganish in Cape Breton, great Victoria County, <laughs> with my former schoolmate over there, uh, uh, the member from Victoria. And knowing and seeing the number of Americans that came and spent time with us in, uh, in uh, Cape Breton, uh, you know, that's sort of changed, as, as, as I mentioned before in the, in the Trenton Works project, nothing remains the same. And uh, the American uh, visitation changed, uh, the, the bus tours became less popular, and we received fewer uh, visitors in, via that particular uh, avenue. However, during that period of time, right, from 1955 until 2009, the ferry ran consecutively between, well, actually Bar Harbor and Yarmouth uh, at the time. So we did have that support that was put pouring money in. It's changed completely. You won't find those tourists now in Bedeck and in Inganish, in the numbers that we saw back in those days, because of the nature of the changing travel market. Uh, we're getting more people from Europe, people are coming by air, but more importantly, you will find them in Halifax and in Sydney coming in by tour boats. That's how people travel uh, a lot uh, uh, these days. So uh, the precipitous impact that the loss of the ferry traffic had on the Nova Scotia tourism numbers across the province and particularly in, uh, in South West Nova 
clearly illustrates the importance of this particular service uh, to the uh, to to the people of Nova Scotia, in particular, to people of, of Southwest Nova. But I want to I want to put the 95 million, I think, is what the member mentioned uh, over that period of time, in some perspective. We spend 10 million dollars a year in Nova Scotia on our interprovincial ferries. Times the same time period, that's 60 million bucks. We don't question that. That's our highway system, right? That's our commitment to the public good. That's what the Nova Scotia to Maine ferry is. It's an extension of our highway system. But it brings lots of money to the province. Talk about Pictou for a second. Pictou County, that great county that uh, I've, I've talked to you about. It is a wonderful county. $74 million. That's what the subsidy was to the Pictou Ferry during that same period of time. And that ferry is an interprovincial ferry. It doesn't have to contend with the, uh, with the uh, uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. There's none of the kinds of costs that are associated with that uh, process there. And I'm just pointing that out because that's essential to Nova Scotia, that ferry is. It's essential to PEI. You know, it's a seasonal ferry at that and it runs in a period of time. $74 million spent during that same period. Digby, Digby Ferry, 60 million, 60 million uh, dollars. And on Canada's commitment to Newfoundland as a result of the, uh, as of the, of the uh, 1949 joining of that great province to our confederation, 547 million dollars in subsidy to that ferry. Across the world, ferries are subsidized. They are subsidized everywhere they are found. They're subsidized in BC, uh, they're subsidized in Nova Scotia, and probably will continue to be, to be so in the same way that our highway system de facto is, uh, is uh, subsidized uh, when, we, when we look at our nine modest ferry operations uh, in, uh, in Nova Scotia that are there to Order. The Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure has the floor. Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, in in terms of uh, of uh, the money that has been spent, uh, Madam Chair, during that period of time, uh, I accept the the, the member's uh, math. I haven't checked it. Uh, there would be caveats that would be in there. You mentioned a gearbox. Uh, there was a credit received off the charter cost there. But anyway, well, I won't get into that. We'll accept that number. But I want to put it in context. I want to put it in context for the amount of money that is being spent uh, on ferries across, uh, uh, across the province. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll, I'll ask the minister if he could table those uh, those figures that he was referring to. Uh, I'd be delighted. To, I'd be delighted to see them, even with a name, if possible, uh, Madam Chair. The um, one more question, I guess. I was going to leave leave that topic, but um, my good colleague from the Army wouldn't be happy if I just. Had one question, uh, so I'll, I'll ask another one. Uh, Minister, is there any indication from Bay Ferries uh, how the uh, ticket sales are going for this coming year? Any indications yet? Minister? Uh, we, we've only been in the market, I think, a very short uh, uh, time, and uh, the, the, the I haven't asked that question. Uh, we need to get a little bit of uh, time in the marketplace to uh, be able to uh, to do that. We're also very busy uh, uh, working with tourism in terms of the marketing package uh, for this year, uh, which is which is exciting, and the company is uh, working on how they're uh, going to uh, uh, pump up the volume on their uh, uh, marketing things too, so I, that, that hasn't been discussed. 
The member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And the uh, minister knows that uh, I'm, in a, you know, I'm in a constituency of uh, three towns, so I don't have to worry about too many roads. And my constituency, uh, constituency assistant, Brenda Wilson, never thought she'd be handling uh, road questions and transportation until I became the critic. So we, we do get calls from across the province, from one end to the other, on bridges and roads and so on. The, uh, I'm going to take the last few minutes and uh, mention one road. Uh, we have lots of constituents that uh, call me about a piece of road near North Nova Education Centre, which is uh, it's in, in a little place called Walkerville, not all that far from the Aberdeen Hospital. There's a, there's a stretch of road there, Minister. I'm going to say it's no longer than half a kilometre, if it's that long. And it's in deplorable shape. In fact, I think it would be a, a great place for uh, amateur golfers to practice their putting. There's just so many holes. And it's very difficult to... Uh, you can't drive in the road without hitting many of them. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's in that shape every year. It has been for, you know, for a few years. I, I've inquired about it and, and so on. But uh, I guess my, my question is, with uh, my, my time running out, uh, how can I uh, push this little piece of road uh, forward? Because buses use it, students use it, bicycles use it. It's a shortcut from, uh, from avoiding going downtown to get out to other places out in the highway. I understand, uh, Minister, that uh, they may even do something about it this year, but I'm, I want to verify that. Minister? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank the member for the uh, uh, advice. Uh, and I think the, the first step would be doing exactly what the member is uh, doing, which is servicing it uh, uh, here so our, uh, our uh, uh, executives can be aware of it. And we can certainly uh, determine if there is any uh, activity uh, planned for this, uh, for this particular uh, year. And uh, there's, there's various uh, options. It's, if it's clearly in the uh, provincial uh, arena rather than uh, municipal, uh, then it's our responsibility. If it was in a, a part of the town, it could be, uh, yeah, Walkerville, yeah. Time for this year. How much? How long are we? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good news. Order. Time has lapsed for the PC caucus. <laughs> You'll have to hold your answer for their next round. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North for the NDP caucus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your comments. I'm, I have to apologize in advance. I am uh, up tonight in um, Energy and Mines and TIR at the same time. So, uh, uh, but I think I have a full hour with you. Um, uh, also wanted to thank uh, the staff that are with you tonight and, uh, and all the staff in the department who work so hard uh, for Nova Scotians. Um, so moving right into it, on page 22.2 .2, under the Highways Program, the Line for Health and Safety Division is about $200 million less than the estimate from last year. Can you explain that difference? Or, so page 22.2 .2, under the Highways Program, the Line for Health and Safety Division is about, well, now, <laughs> it says 200,000 in my book, but I think it means 200 million. <laughs> Less than the estimate from last year. Can you explain the difference?
Minister. Yes, thank you. Could I ask for some clarification on uh, precisely which particular uh, line item on 22.2 that we're talking about? M member for Dartmouth South. Uh, well, I don't have my budget document in front of me, so maybe I will pause that question and I'll come back to it in my next round. How's that? Okay. I'll come back to it with more sp uh, specifics. So, um, on page 22.12, there is a significant e increase in the estimate for environmental remediation. Can the minister provide a breakdown of the specific costs and sites included in that estimate? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank the member opposite for the question. It's a very relevant question. We have decided uh, this year to proceed with the uh, demolition of the former uh, uh, Colchester Hospital, uh, which uh, is a, uh, a dominant structure. It's a hospital structure. It's a very sophisticated uh, structure uh, with all of the goodies in it that tend to be in old buildings and particular old medical facilities such as lead and asbestos and, and uh, radiation uh, associated with the x-rays. So the remediation tends to get a little bit more expensive and that's what that is. Three million in, uh, followed by five million in the following year. The member for Dartmouth North. Thank you for that answer. Um, I'm going to ask some questions now about the QE2 redevelopment um, and TIR's involvement with that. So my first question is, where in the budget, which, um, what amounts and in which lines could I find any costs associated with the QE2 redevelopment? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the member for the question. Uh, <clears throat> and I can appreciate the, uh, the uh, challenges of interpreting the budget document, uh, which I think weighs around 25 pounds here for my department. Uh, the the uh, QE2 expenditures are actually in the uh, capital portion of the budget which resides with the Department of Health in the capital side. So you'll find it under Department of Health and Capital. On the operational side, which is the resourcing, uh, the staffing and that sort of thing, that would be in the Nova Scotia land section of our budget, uh, which is where the, uh, where the uh, uh, operational costs associated with mobilizing the uh, effort are uh, housed. So, capital budget health for uh, the uh, for the capital associated with the project, and operationally in the Nova Scotia lands portion, in, in as it relates to our our budget. The member for Dartmouth North. Okay. Well, I'm going to in a sec look up some some things to see if there if I can find what I'm looking for, but. Um, how much has the government spent to date on architects for the redevelopment project?
Minister. Aaron, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Brian Ward, who is our senior director with Nova Scotia Lands Health Division. Uh, that uh, is the portion of the uh, operating budget that I referred uh, to earlier as the Nova Scotia Lands uh, handling the operational matters for the uh, QE2 redevelopment. And uh, he has been able to uh, advise me that uh, it would be in the range of less than $7 million uh, in uh, total for the design process uh, associated with the, uh, with the project uh, to date. The member for Dartmouth North. Thank you for that answer. Now, I just, in that break, I just looked up the health and wellness budget. Uh, in, our do in our budget documents, and now I may be looking the wrong place again, but I've come to where it says capital grants and healthcare capital amortization. And it appears that there's actually a decrease in the budget from last year to this year, um, but we have a hospital that was, is being built. So where in the budget, in, in, you, as you just pointed to this line, I believe, in the budget, where is the money that we're spending on the hospital redevelopment? Minister. Very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank the member for uh, the question. Uh, I, I would refer uh, the member to uh, the uh, capital plan, uh, 2020-21 capital plan that has been released, page three. So there on page three is the capital funding summary and the second item in that summary is uh, buildings and land for $446 million. And the uh, uh, health portion is in that number. And also in the capital grant section of that uh, 
uh, same uh, summary for 131.5 million uh, for a total of uh, 577 million approximately. Of that portion, uh, for hospitals across the uh, width and breadth of the province, uh, there is $219 million. And again, that appears in the health budget. It's capital money. It doesn't appear in the TIR uh, budget. But the, the capital spending portion, which I think is the number you're looking for, is 200, would be $219 million of that to $577 uh, that is in the capital plan under the capital funding summary, page 3. Thank you. The member for Dartmouth North. Thank you. And I've also looked up my uh, first question. Uh, so I will refer you to the main budget document. Uh, as I said, page 22.2 uh, under the highways program in the health and safety division. In the, so that's like basically the second section and the second line. Uh, in 2019, there was a forecast of 622 million. Uh, and in 2020, there's an estimate of uh, 601 million, uh, million. So I'm wondering what is the um, difference? Why, why is there uh, less money being spelt, spent in the health and safety division by, by a considerable amount? Minister? Thank you, thank you. Uh Yes, thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, the two hundred thousand dollar difference is a result of internal restructuring, moving staff around uh, in the department, so they're in a different section. Then that particular number dropped. The member for Dartmouth North. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, now I'm going to move back to the hospital. Uh, in 2013, when the uh, Liberal government was elected, there was already a plan developed by the NDP government to complete the hospital redevelopment in Halifax, Dartmouth by 2020. I'm wondering if the Minister can explain why in 2020 we are still in the planning stage of the redevelopment. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I thank the member for the, for the question. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I guess uh, if you look at the, uh, at the beginning, the genesis, which uh, did start in 2012, uh, at that time, uh, was, uh, I recall, the total uh, project capital costs was uh, in the vicinity of $400 million. And uh, time, time went on, and of course the government changed in, uh, in 2013 in October, and the period in between was taken, taken up by the beginning of the consultative uh, period with <clears throat> the clinicians which uh, has, result, has uh, resulted in the comprehensive design that we have now, a better understanding of what we really should do in the long term uh, in, the, in that this 
iteration and undertaking that we have locked into currently is much more comprehensive than what was originally anticipated. You know, it's perhaps it's like uh, uh, a renovation that you might do at your uh, at your own house, and you start off uh, thinking that you, you're going to replace the siding, and you take some of the siding off, and then the sills are bad, and then the roof is needs. So it it sort of uh, escalated uh, to that point. So as a result of that, and as a result of relying on the advice from the clinicians to make sure that we get this right, uh, that's why we are now uh, where we are uh, in, 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 the, in this period of time. It's been a huge pile of planning that's gone into this over the last uh, uh, four years in particular, uh, and uh, uh, we want to make sure that we, uh, that we uh, get the, uh, uh, the uh, project correct and that we understand the needs of the uh, communities that we are looking to uh, uh, serve uh, in the process. And I go back uh, uh, to look at the, uh, how this has evolved. You know, we did, we, we've got Windsor added into the mix. Uh, the Dartmouth General would have been a part of that uh, also in terms of bringing that in comprehensively to uh, the, the work that we, uh, that we have to do. So. Um, I guess, from my own perspective, uh, Madam Chair, it's kind of the nature of government. We tend to be very premeditated in what we're doing, and, 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 and quite frankly, when you look at the fact that we are uh, spending the public purse, uh, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. The member for Dartmouth North. Well, uh, thanks to the minister for that answer. I, I totally um, appreciate the analogy of a home renovation. I get that. Um, but I'm wondering, um, so in the, in the plan that originally the NDP had, had created, the plan was uh, in place in 2013 was to begin the work on the Dartmouth General and the HI uh, sites in 2016. Uh, all construction and realignment of services would have been completed by 2020, and so, um, and we know that the Dartmouth General will essentially, I think, be done by 2021. Um, so that's not too bad, but um, I'm wondering, uh, as I said, I, I buy the argument that, you know, once you start looking at things, you realize that other things need to be done, but I'm wondering if the minister can table the analysis that explains uh, why the government chose not to proceed with the original plan and why it has a new plan uh, in place. Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I would ask the member uh, to uh, cast her mind back to 2013 uh, in particular, uh, in October, uh, when uh, this government were, was asked by the people of Nova Scotia to <clears throat> represent them here in the legislature. And the first thing we discovered was the $700 million operating deficit in our, uh, in our uh, operating account. Uh, I think that might have caused us a little, ca a little uh, uh, pause uh, to consider uh, not only the uh, long-term uh, plan for the QE2 redevelopment, but many of the other uh, situations that we face as a government. Uh, you know, it did take us two years uh, to, to reach balance, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in our, in our economy. And as you know, uh, it's pretty hard to, uh, do the kinds of, have the kind of aspirations that we have in government, which we are seeing realized, uh, if your fiscal house isn't in order and it wasn't in order in 2013 when, uh, we were asked to, uh, to manage the, uh, the government of the province of Nova Scotia. 
the plan that was put forward at that time did not have the support of the uh, physicians in the province. And it was quite evident to us that, uh, you know, um, that was an unacceptable circumstance and we needed uh, to understand what they knew. They had the knowledge, they knew what they wanted. And uh, it, it also uh, behooved us to consult with the medical community to uh, determine the best uh, route forward. And all of those uh, things take time. Now, in the meantime, the Dartmouth, Ge Dartmouth General, which is a major component of our process and which I'm so proud of, actually, and, and, and the feeling that we get and the vibrancy that's in that community and the support that the community lends to that facility is, is really breathtaking. It's, it's, under, it's, it's wonderful. It's what makes Nova Scotians Nova Scotians, I think. It's nearing completion. It's just about done. And uh, that we're very proud of. And that was a keystone part of the original plan that was put forward. And we're moving piece by piece to implement the, uh, the entire plan. Thank you. The member for Dartmouth North. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So I guess, um, yeah, I mean, listen, there's lots of reasons for um, the decisions governments make, to absolutely 100%. What I'm asking for is, a, is to, to have those decisions and the analysis that went into those decisions tabled for, that, for uh, our purposes. Uh, so I would love to see, um, um, sorry, the, uh, I would love to see the specific changes uh, uh, between the first plan and the second plan. What was the rationale for those? Like, in, uh, surely there were minutes taken at meetings. Uh, is there anything that can be tabled to, so that we understand what exactly is the difference between the two plans? Um, and also, um, I'm wondering if the minister can table any analysis to su support the cost difference between the two plans. Uh, um, I'd love to see the cost difference tabled, the, the two different the two different budgets, and then the and then the analysis to support the cost difference. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's all I want, Madam Chair. Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
It's, it's, uh, um, shouldn't be any surprise to the House that we don't have such a comprehensive review available to uh, enter the record here uh, this evening, but we would like to comment on uh, uh, some of the various factors associated with the, uh, the change in scope, essentially, for the project. Uh, during the extensive consultation that took place with the medical community, again, uh, to emphasize the people who, uh, who uh, we rely on for advice in these matters, uh, took some time and uh, resulted in the realization that, you know, we have uh, the ancient infrastructure uh, in the Centennial Building with the operating rooms that have been challenged uh, for, for some time uh, for viability and uh, that a new facility would uh, bring together all of these services under one specific campus that would uh, better serve the needs of, uh, of uh, our uh, Nova Scotians uh, in, the overall, uh, in the overall picture. Uh, at the same time that I say that, much of the information that I believe the member is uh, requesting actually resides in the Department of Health uh, rather than the Department of Transportation. Uh, because remember, our uh, department is responsible for the engineering and the design and the construction based on the advice that we receive from the uh, professionals who are in the industry, uh, both in the uh, medical industry and in, in, in uh, the Department of, of Health. But uh, we can uh, perhaps uh, think that this government's creation of a special health committee uh, in, at, at public accounts would provide an opportunity for um, that particular uh, request uh, to be dealt with in a more comprehensive manner because that committee is, is focused on uh, the, uh, the health matters and uh, uh, my best advice would be maybe to seek some of those uh, uh, answers at that venue. Thank you. The member for Dartmouth North. Now, Madam Chair, uh, we're going to get into a little area of questioning that I know the Minister uh, expects from me, um, but hates, no doubt, <laughs> um, and it's about P3s. So I know we're going to agree, we're going to, we're going to disagree on a lot of things. So moving beyond that already, we don't need to talk about, you know, uh, wh how amazing the good pass is tonight, I, I beg you. Um, but uh, I'm wondering if... Um, the department has calculated the full lifetime costs of delivering the hospital redevelopment through a P3 compared to a public alternative delivering the same level and quality of service. So the, I'm just wondering if you have calculated the full lifetime cost of the difference between the P3 and the uh, traditional build.
Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank the member for uh, the uh, completely surprising question that uh, she asked. Uh, I guess if you look at, uh, uh, to start with, uh, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, application of the uh, engaging of the private sector uh, in uh, construction of public facilities uh, across the world, across Canada, uh, it is a, 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 an extremely uh, common practice. Actually, in the province of Ontario, uh, uh, anything that's over $50 million in capital costs is, is uh, automatically uh, a P3 facility, and uh, anybody who is spending government money knows that it doesn't take much to exceed a $50 million threshold. So this particular project involves the, the period of the, the full, the period we look at is the full construction uh, cost plus the 30-year operating uh, period. Uh, it's uh, delivered on time and on budget, which are two major uh, considerations for us. Uh, certainly the on time, uh, the time issue is, as we know, time is money. And though the, uh, uh, the, the saving there is, is uh, related directly to the lesser period of time that you have to pay for the, uh, uh, for two facilities operating and the savings that you would have from the old, uh, uh, facility, which would be less efficient than our new uh, uh, facility, uh, they, there, there, is, there is significant value in that uh, uh, consideration. Um, recently, uh, the province elected to purchase uh, significant uh, P3 constructed schools uh, from the uh, uh, operators of those schools. And the reason that those were so attractive to us, and the analysis uh, said buy, was because of the essentially pristine condi condition uh, that those facilities were kept in by the operators of those properties during that 20 or 25 year period for the P3 schools. In this instance, it is a 30 year uh, amortization period, which will uh, result in uh, the uh, upkeep of those facilities to be at a superior level and that the residual value that it would exist in those facilities beyond the 30 year amortization period, which might take us to another 20 years out, is really where the extensive uh, value is for uh, uh, the P3 uh, uh, process. So the, the, the P3 brings us that value for money, uh, which is not, doesn't, is not the same value that we get in a conventional uh, uh, design build uh, uh, operation. So the analysis has been extensive. Uh, I can assure the uh, uh, the, the, the House and the people of this province that we didn't just pull this out of the sky, that we looked at what's happening in such facilities across the way, and the value of being able to deliver these services to our citizens years earlier than a conventional process would be uh, is priceless. Thank you. The member for Dartmouth North. Um, well, thank you for that, um, or thank the minister for that answer. Here's the thing. <laughs> the people of Nova Scotia might agree with the minister. Sounds like a compelling argument. However, we have never seen the value for money analysis. The minister assures us that the, the value for money analysis has been done, but when we ask for it to see it, we don't get to see it. So when is the minister able to uh, let the people of Nova Scotia see that analysis? 
Um, I guess that's my question. Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and uh, thank the member opposite for the uh, question and the opportunity to explain to Nova Scotians uh, what uh, we're, uh, we're up to. And let me just say that we do have uh, examples of, of, of P3 in uh, Nova Scotia uh, with, as I mentioned, the, the school construction project, which we ended up uh, uh, buying those facilities back from the operators at the at the time, and we have the uh, the new uh, convention center, which, from all reports, seems to be performing well in terms of what it is. And that was a P3 uh, uh, project, which was uh, uh, a credit to the party that she represents uh, as having uh, put that one forward. And of course, then. The, a uh, shining example from my perspective of the P3 success would be the uh, Cobgood Pass, where we have, uh, have accumulated a significant uh, uh, reserve account, which we are looking at de re redeploying to improve the safety of that uh, particular facility uh, and, uh, and are in a position to look at removing uh, tolls for Nova Scotia motorists as we uh, as we proceed with that particular situation so the efficacy of the p3 process i don't think needs to be uh, defended uh, here but the reality is is that uh, there is a competitive significant competitive market uh, uh, considerations with the p3 process which uh, prohibits us from revealing uh, the kind of information that the member is asking for in advance of the financial close. Uh, once the uh, successful bidder has been selected uh, and uh, the, the, the fiscal rationale that is, is being sought here will be made available, but that won't be until after uh, we have wrung every cent of value out of the marketplace that we can get on behalf of Nova Scotia taxpayers. And that's the, uh, th that's the reality. We uh, can't give up our, uh, uh, show our hand or our cards. It would not be uh, um, good uh, business practice uh, to do that. And uh, I can assure the member and, and all Nova Scotians that it will be revealed once we have uh, reached a financial close with the successful bidder uh, in, the, in this particular project. I'd like to remind people in the chamber to keep their conversations low. Um, it's very distracting and it's hard to hear what's being said by the um, 
member of the opposition and also by the minister. So please be respectful uh, so that everyone can hear. The member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not going to belabor this point. As I said before, we definitely disagree on, these, on this subject. However, I would say that you know, the minister has mentioned that the efficacy of P3s is undebatable in Nova Scotia. And I would say uh, that's not true. I, I would say that, that I think it's a very debatable uh, point. I would say that uh, more and more we are seeing reports from other jurisdictions. Uh, P3s are not being used as much as they were for a variety of reasons. Um, and so, you know, Nova Scotia, this is a $2 billion project. Nova Scotians want to make sure that it is being done right before the contracts are signed. It is, it, is, it is flabbergasting to me that the minister maintains that uh, we cannot even see a value for money analysis, which has no, no mention, it's not an RFP, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's only comparing P3 to traditional build and that like a, a, a value for money analysis. It doesn't have to be specific, specific to the, 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 what, the RFP. Uh, I, I am flabbergasted that the minister refuses to let Nova Scotians know how the department came to this decision before that contract is signed. I think it's frankly irresponsible. But that being said, I'm not gonna change his mind tonight. Madam Chair, so I'm going to continue asking questions. Uh, can the minister explain if the province will be responsible for guaranteeing the private sector's revenues and who will be liable for cost overruns or project deficiencies? Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the, uh, for the question. Uh, I uh, spent some time uh, in uh, uh, Toronto a couple of months ago uh, at a, uh, a, a conference around uh, construction of public facilities across the globe, really, uh, a very large uh, gathering of people who were involved in various construction modes. And it was shocking to me to hear that the province of Ontario 
is entering into a $65 billion P3 public facility construction program. That was uh, this year. I forget when that was in January, I think. So if the member has uh, information around uh, P3 failure, around uh, that there's a trend away from P3 construction and public facilities, I would request that she table that uh, for the edification of the uh, uh, of the of the house. Uh, that would be uh, interesting to uh, uh, to see and and be informative uh, for us. The way that uh, the so-called P3 process works is based on essentially on risk transfer. Uh, that in the the uh, method of uh, constructing public infrastructure, uh, that the two things that she talked about, uh, that the member talked about, uh, which was uh, uh, cost, uh, uh, capital cost overruns and, and operating costs, are the very uh, attributes of the P3 process that essentially eliminate that risk in the uh, uh, in, in the, the contract that uh, the, uh, co the 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 financial close and contract settles on what the cost is going to be, and unless the owner requires uh, that there be change, if the plan is comprehensive and that's what we're going to do, then there is no. There can't be any cost, uh, any cost overruns. Uh, and in terms of the operating, this is, is really advantageous to uh, the uh, taxpayers, is that the cost of operating is performance-based. So any kind of operating interruption that uh, impedes the a uh, good operation of the facility. So for instance, a, an operating room went down because of some deficiency in the process of operating, then the, 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 uh, the, the P3 company uh, are responsible uh, for uh, losing revenue. We don't pay for that service for that period of time. So the incentive is built in for them to be operating at, at 100 percent, and of course, uh, that's that's what we uh, what, what we get uh, uh, when we go through the the P3 uh, uh, process. The the actual f triggers uh, for this involve at substantial completion, when the project is finished. Okay, a 50 percent of the agreed upon value is. Uh, advanced to the P3 operator at the end of substantial completion, and then the additional 50% uh, is amortized over the, the following 30 years. Uh, so uh, in, in the instance of this particular project, it's a 30-year amortization uh, um, project. Uh, and as, as I mentioned before, uh, the uh, expected life uh, expectancy or uh, uh, full cycle, life cycle costing uh, tells us that we are good for 50 years. So in that ensuing 20-year period is a real value uh, for money and payback to, uh, uh, the, uh, to the taxpayers. So <clears throat> I would contend <coughs> that it would be foolhardy and jeopardize the interests of, uh, of Nova Scotians who are depending on us to make the right decisions on their behalf if we actually revealed the kinds of information that uh, uh, is being requested of us uh, tonight, that that would indeed be uh, jeopardizing the, the best interests of, uh, of Nova Scotians uh, uh, in the overall picture. Thank you. The member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair, and yes, I will uh, get some of those documents. I don't know if I can gather them all up, uh, but for the next hour, I hope to have something to table for the Minister. Um, will the P3 contract allow the province the flexibility to make future changes in service delivery or other po public policy decisions? Uh, will the contract allow uh, um, the ability to end the contract in the 
procurement stage and to terminate the contract if it's not meeting the public interest. And of course, we're talking about healthcare here. So uh, lots of things can happen in 50 years in, in healthcare. So the question is, Will it allow flexibility to make future changes in service delivery or public policy decisions to end the contract in the procurement stage uh, and to terminate the contract if it's not meeting the public interest? Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, I uh, thank the member for the question, and it's a good question. And the short answer is yes, but uh, uh, I want to elaborate a little bit on that. Um, there, is, there is flexibility in the arrangement, uh, but uh, remember that it is a very complex uh, and comprehensive uh, contract uh, which sets out rights and obligations in the, uh, in the contract. And there is a, a, a process, as I mentioned, uh, for a variation. Uh, if there is a variation that uh, we want in the process, then uh, the contractor will uh, is obligated to take that into consideration, but the costs, if there's additional costs for that, would be on us uh, as the uh, 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 owners of the contract, which is the standard. It's called a uh, change order, essentially, in in regular tender language. Um, in terms of uh, 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 termination, uh, there is a significant section that would be dedicated to dispute uh, resolution. Uh, 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 termination would be a very, very serious, uh, worthy of very, very serious consideration. Uh, and therefore, the dispute resolution section, uh, which uh, usually exists in most contracts and there's arbitration and all that sort of stuff. It's not the same in this instance here, but it's quite articulate in terms of how uh, uh, disputes would be, uh, would be settled. But remember that really both sides, particularly the private sector partner, <clears throat> is significantly uh, incented 
for success here in these in these processes because uh, these are these are widely observed and uh, uh, there are reputational uh, implications associated with uh, uh, for for the for the companies that are involved. So they don't want to have uh, failures or uh, get into uh, uh, into fights and the. Uh, comprehensiveness it relates back to the planning process that is required to get us to that point is intended to as much as we can to identify the areas where things might go wrong what we need this is the design of that particular floor I right, guess everybody up put your hand up everybody's there the medical people are there the engineering folk are there boom it's there and that's the the the, the recipe that we use to uh, uh, to go forward. So, in in the overall uh, 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 answer uh, to the member's question is yes. The member for Dartmouth North. I'll ask my question in the time I have left, and then we'll probably have to come back to it. But when we receive an estimate from a potential P3 proponent, are we given a line by line breakdown? And are they required to provide us with their anticipated rate of profit? Order, time has lapsed for the NDP caucus. We will turn it over to the PC caucus for one hour. I recognize the honorable member for Pictou Center. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, I have so many questions I want to ask the minister that I might have to ask for the consent of the House to do this on Saturday also, if that's possible. But the, uh, my first question to the minister is, um, a couple of weeks ago I had uh, approximately 10 uh, independent truck drivers into my office, uh, most of them from Pitcher County, a couple from uh, Andy Kanish. They were in to talk about the twinning of the highway, uh, the 104, from, uh, you know, Southern River to any condition. The two questions they wanted an answer to was uh, one, uh, will they, as independent truckers, will they get a fair shake of, uh, of the work and will they get uh, uh, a reasonable fair pay for, for the work on the 104 uh, when, it, when it starts, when they need the trucks? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, the uh, Nova Scotia Truckers uh, Association, or the Truckers Association of Nova Scotia, TANS, as they are uh, most widely known, 
are an important component to our construction uh, season uh, throughout uh, the province and uh, are relied upon by the uh, uh, contractors uh, uh, across, the, uh, across the, the, the region. And uh, to their credit, they're always uh, uh, interested in, in making sure that they are a part of the projects and that they are uh, given consideration uh, when it comes to the highway work. As I mentioned earlier, we are uh, embarking on the highest single season spend that uh, we have uh, seen in uh, the history of the province. And uh, I, I, I know that uh, that will certainly increase the demand for trucking uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, province. And uh, there'll be, uh, certainly the 104 will create demand uh, contractors, uh, the contractors involved at this point do not have a signed contract with us. We're moving towards that, uh, uh, that process. We've got the preferred bidder. Uh, we're, we're in the final or, or moving towards the final uh, stage of negotiation. But it's unlikely that their needs will be identified until they are completely secure and that contract is executed between the parties. At that point in time, uh, with the volume of uh, work that uh, this project is going to generate and the, uh, the, the overall commitment to the road budget in the province, uh, I'm quite sure there'll be lots of work for, uh, for our good friends at TANS. The member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Minister, your department dedicated $265.5 uh, million to bill, renovate, and purchase schools. Of, of this $265 uh, million, how much will be spent on purchasing the, uh, the 30P3 schools? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, that information I do not have. Uh, I would uh, uh, redirect that to the Education Department. Uh, that portion of the expenditure that we would have some input into would be the new school construction built under the conventional system for the schools that are announced uh, for the uh, current uh, uh, fiscal uh, year, so I'm sorry I can't answer that question. The member for Pictou Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, department has uh, numerous vehicles on the road. On average, how old are the vehicles and equipment you'll be replacing with the 13.8 million in new vehicles and equipment replacement this fiscal year? Uh, once, once again, uh, you, you have lots of vehicles on the road. Okay, you have. Uh, 13.8 million set aside for new vehicles and equipment. Um, so, on average, how old are the vehicles and equipment you'll be replacing this fiscal year?
Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank the member for the question. Uh, the cost of, of uh, operating our highway system in, in Nova Scotia uh, is uh, um, extensive, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, much of the expenditure that the uh, member uh, surfaces there is uh, goes towards the replacement of uh, heavy equipment, so-called heavy equipment in our uh, uh, bases. Uh, as an example, uh, I, I, I'm quite sure that this year we bought five new graders, which are run in the five to six hundred thousand uh, dollar range. Uh, snow plows, which are half million dollars. Uh, a piece, excavators, rollers, uh, loaders, uh, trailers, and tractors that we have uh, in uh, in the department, uh, and then there is a, um, a smaller amount uh, dedicated to uh, our uh, small fleet of vans and cars. But most of the uh, and the, where we get our biggest bang for the buck is in the replacement of heavy equipment. We have a great team of mechanics in our bases that do a tremendous job of keeping these, uh, these pieces of equipment uh, operating and uh, uh, they, they, uh, uh, they, uh, they're really to be commended for uh, the work that they can do to keep these, uh, these uh, projects uh, uh, going. On, on average, our, our, much of our fleet is, is 20 years old. So. We've got a lot of people who uh, work very hard at keeping those uh, uh, those guys going, so uh, keeping that, that equipment going. And we are gradually inserting new gear uh, as funds will allow into the process so we have a, 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 a better to, to bring that average up to reduce the uh, age of our, uh, of our equipment. But that's where that uh, uh, money would be spent. The member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Minister, uh, after this particular question, I'm, gonna, I'm going to ask uh, several questions dealing with um, some projects that uh, the department's working at, like hospitals and so on, and uh, uh, community and so on. But uh, this, uh, this particular question here is, uh, can, can you explain what the uh, $40 million in contingency funds are earmarked for? Is, is this like are the projects that are going to be um, over budget? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, the uh, $40 million that it refers to in the uh, contingency section of the capital plan uh, rests, resides with the Department of Finance, and uh, I can't answer what, what the calculation is uh, in the overall billion dollar uh, capital plan as to how they arrived at that, but the Department of Finance would be better equipped to answer that question. The member for Pictou Centre. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> the uh, just uh, some uh, information, some updates, and some major projects. Uh, the first one dealing with the Cape Breton Regional Hospital relocated uh, parking. I think there was a uh, 1.7 million set aside to take care of that task. My my question with regard to the relocated parking uh, part is: uh, When do you think it'll be completed? That's one. And the second one is, uh, is it holding up the next phase of the Cape Breton Regional Hospital uh, project?
Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the uh, question. <clears throat> In terms of the, uh, if I could just uh, uh, speak for a moment about the uh, regional uh, facility, we're well underway there. Uh, there's no uh, delays associated with any of the activities in that uh, location. Uh, we have a very comprehensive uh, program uh, planned and underway for uh, Cape Breton healthcare rehabilitation in particular. But the opportunity arose at uh, New Waterford to develop the, uh, truly develop the hub concept uh, uh, for community schools. So <clears throat> in that particular instance, uh, we are uh, uh, doing the Collaborative Health Centre, uh, the uh, seniors' uh, beds, and uh, the brand new replacement for Breton Education Centre uh, under the one uh, uh, fiscal location to integrate all those facilities into one. It's, it's, it's. Uh, 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 the most bold expansion, I would say, of the hub concept that we would see in Nova Scotia, and one that we're very excited about, and the community is very excited about, uh, to combine all of those, uh, all of those uh, essential services uh, in the one location. And, and if you can think about it, you know we've got from the, from the youth to the nursing home in terms of the availability. And in that process, we are rebuilding and relocating the sports fields associated with the, uh, uh, the, the school, Breton Education Center, uh, where we had great cooperation from uh, CBRM in terms of acquiring uh, some additional footprint that was, uh, that was uh, seen to be essential for uh, the expansion of the overall uh, hub concept. <clears throat> but there is, we, we are full steam ahead. Uh, the uh, consultants are, RFP is on the street, as it were, uh, in that situation. We're not encountering any delays. We're in the design stage, and everything is uh, progressing uh, along the timelines that we had in place uh, for that. The member for Picto Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, my understanding is the RFC for clearing the uh, clearing the. Uh, uh, Highway 104 between the Sutherlands River and Anikinish twinning was approximately 1.1 million. In my understanding, it's, it's not it's not part of the P3. So I guess my question, Minister, would be when, when does the P3 part start? Um, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, uh, I must apologize. I wanted to introduce uh, uh, Gerard Jessam, uh, who was assisting us in that first question. And Gerard is the Executive Director uh, for Building uh, Project and Services for the Department and uh, a former acquaintance and colleague of mine when he was in uh, in Sydney, working hard uh, in, uh, the, uh, on the highway side of uh, the business, and now he's, he's in Halifax building things for us, Gerard, so thank you for that. Uh, in terms of the 104, yes, there are uh, parts of the uh, contracts, uh, the various contracts for the twinning, regardless if they're conventional or P3, and the 104 is a P3, uh, but the 107 isn't. But there are the clearing portion of these uh, projects uh, normally are uh, referred to as early works, 
and we get those done uh, in advance of the uh, project. And certainly in the instance of the 104, uh, that uh, was a, is a, is a 35 kilometer corridor and uh, really is the uh, longest uh, uh, continuous section of twinning that we are uh, uh, undertaking in our four, our four projects. Uh, so it was imperative that we get the uh, we get the uh, vegetation uh, removed in the meantime. And I think the member is right in terms of what the uh, uh, contract uh, cost was. It was in excess of a million dollars. And uh, anybody who uh, drives that section of road will see that it is uh, it is uh, progressing quite. Uh, rapidly, uh, and uh, uh, the cost of that work is outside of the P3 contract. So at the P3 contract, uh, Madam Chair, we have uh, selected, as has been announced publicly, the uh, preferred uh, uh, project partner that we are have decided uh, uh, the very uh, intensive system that we had set up to evaluate the three bidders that came forward uh, indicated the successful uh, bidder, which is the Dexter Nova Consortium, uh, had the best result for the project. And, so we are continuing with them towards finding, uh, signing a contract which will result in, uh, in financial close. Uh, as has been publicly said, I think we're very uh, hopeful that we will have that completed uh, in the spring, uh, which is not too far away. And uh, that I think the, the April month was uh, the time that we had uh, figured that it was going to uh, going to uh, be completely finalized. So at that point in time, the project will be turned over to that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, builder, and uh, by that time, the clearing will have been uh, uh, completed or to the point where uh, the contractor will be able to move in and start uh, uh, the work that they have, uh, they have uh, indicated that they will do uh, in the contract. The member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Minister, it's a, it's a major uh, piece of work from Sutherlands River to, uh, to push, Pushy's Road, I guess, uh, where it's going to cut off there. I guess my, my next question is, is it realistic that, the, uh, that they may be able to have this completed by 2023? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and uh, I thank the member for the question because it gives me an opportunity to illustrate uh, what I was talking about uh, in the previous uh, uh, discussion that we were having uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the NDP member around uh, predictability and one of the benefits of the P3 process, which is that uh, that uh, de-risking and the predictability that comes with the with the P3. Uh, the terms of the contract involve uh, the delivery point 
uh, specifically mentioned in the contract. And uh, uh, the contract tour uh, has undertaken uh, or will undertake uh, to uh, to honor that uh, period that we want this uh, this piece of highway in service by. <laughs> Uh, and uh, again, uh, this, this uh, I think highlights a, a benefit of the P3 uh, process and that it does guarantee that uh, predictability and the performance by the uh, private partner. I would uh, uh, draw the member's attention to the uh, example of the Cobgood Pass, which was actually 45 kilometers at that time. And interestingly enough, uh, one of the partners in this uh, particular bid is uh, uh, Nova Construction, was the major player in, in the Cobquid Pass uh, uh, project. And uh, that 45 kilometers was built in 22 months. Uh, so if we look at 20, uh, at the end of 23, we're three and a half years here for this uh, particular 35 uh, uh, kilometer stretch. 12 of which is Greenfield, and I have to, to point that out, is that 12 kilometers is new uh, four lane, because we're leaving the, uh, leaving the Marshy Hope section and uh, uh, coming over the mountain, over Weaver Mountain, <coughs> which uh, results in uh, uh, the construction uh, opportunity. There's a little bit different. This is you know, there's no traffic on that. There's no traffic control required. Uh, all of those kinds of uh, things that will exist on the other 24 kilometers, uh, uh, and where most of the structures are located. I think there's 27 new structures uh, envisaged, envisaged with the uh, uh, construction of the 10104. Uh, so it's uh, we have a lot of confidence in the. Uh, ability of the contractor to deliver in that uh, period of time, but it's on them. They signed a contract for delivery at that point in time. It's up to them to uh, deliver in that period of time. Thank you. The member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just one last question dealing with that uh, section of uh, twinning of the Highway 104 there. And I guess this could pertain to any large project. What? Uh, what happens if the project isn't completed by the time that they, uh, they agreed to with regard to like the cost over, overcomes? What, what happens when uh, the project isn't completed? That project or another large project similar to it? What, what, what transpires? What takes place? The minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and uh, thank the member for the question. Like any uh, contract, uh, and perhaps more particularly with the P3, uh, there are performance uh, uh, targets involved, and there are significant penalties for uh, the contractor. Uh, to uh, not be able to deliver uh, as was agreed to. Uh, and there's various stages of the financial censure that uh, exists there. Uh, and uh, also, uh, the thing that we have going for us with these companies is that they want to compete for future business, and their reputation is uh, important to them. So any kind of... Uh, 
failure to deliver or delay or dispute in particular, uh, they're not uh, uh, going to advance their, their uh, company's interests by engaging in the... So there's a lot of controls in there. Uh, some of them are, you know, sort of self-imposed by the contractors. Uh, but at the end of the day, if they don't deliver, they suffer f severe financial penalties. The member for Picto Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, my next question is dealing with the uh, Bridgetown Regional Community School Outdoor Sports Hub, which I believe $3.8 million was uh, set aside. My questions uh, concerning that, uh, my understanding is not completed, so that, that would be one. Uh, a second question, is it, is it true that it's over budget? It's, a, it's the second one. And I guess the third one would be, is the government responsible for the over costs? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank the member for the question. Uh, the uh, information that I have is that the project is uh, uh, almost totally finished. Uh, the winter closed in on us and uh, uh, stopped the residual amount from being done. Uh, the, the, the contract is within the uh, tolerances that were, uh, that were laid out when the contract was uh, uh, anticipated. Uh, and uh, it is in to be done in the 2019-20 uh, um, uh, uh, budget. The member for Picto Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, next question is dealing with the Valley Regional Hospital, the uh, dialysis unit edition. I believe uh, there's approximately 5.9 million set aside for that uh, dialysis unit. And I. I guess I've been hearing about it for about four years now. So my, my question is uh, a couple of questions. One, when will it be completed? And two, uh, in, in your opinion, will it be on budget? The Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank the member for the question. Uh, June of 2020 is the expected completion date, and it is uh, uh, also uh, uh, within the budget parameters uh, that were established for the project. The member for Picto Centre. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. The uh, next question, Minister, is dealing with the Soldiers Memorial Hospital Primary Health Care Centre. Uh, I believe, again, $6.7 million set aside there. And my, my understanding that it was under capacity before, um, I guess my question is what, what capacity will be there afterwards when it's completed? And I guess, uh, I'm not sure if you can answer this, where, where are the doctors coming from to uh, as far as the capacity of this uh, facility.
The Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank the member for the question. Uh, in that particular situation, uh, what's being uh, constructed and it's under construction uh, currently is a, a primary health centre. Uh, and uh, on the staffing question, uh, I, I'm a little hesitant to, to veer into the Department of Health's uh, area there, but uh, uh, what would be envisaged would be the uh, local practitioners uh, populating that uh, service from their own resources in the uh, in the uh, area uh, and using the uh, the primary uh, health center as a uh, uh, sort of a hub for the for their activities. Thank you. Member for Picto Center. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Minister, I'm going to switch over uh, to. Uh, contingency plans with regard to uh, bad weather, storms and so on, talking about the Cobequid Pass and, or any, any major uh, route that we have in our, our province. So that'll be the next, uh, next few questions. So my, my uh, Lead into this, uh, ministers. I mean, we in this province we have whiteouts and blizzards, and, and they'll continue to shut down major transportation links in our province. Uh, in particular, the Cobequid Pass. And I guess my my question is going to be around, you know, uh, has the department developed a contingency plan that provides clarity with regard to the roles and responsibilities when the weather causes the closure of uh, the Tra Trans Canada Highway? The Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank the member for the question. Yeah, the, the uh, Cobquid uh, Pass is an uh, uh, essential uh, uh, element of our uh, transportation uh, network in the province. It's certainly one we are very proud of, and uh, essentially uh, because of the P3 process, uh, one that is in probably the best condition of any stretch of highway that we have in Nova Scotia, at the same time that even though we have not increased the toll rate since 1994, we've still been able to accumulate uh, a good war chest that will enable us to, uh, when we uh, feel it's in the best interest of the, <clears throat> of the people of the province, to retire the, uh, the bonds and for us to make uh, 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 make uh, improvements in the uh, sorry about that make improvements in the in the facility itself uh, and uh, mr. chair I stand corrected I said 1994 I meant 2004 2004 at 16 years uh, and no increase uh, in the tolls uh, however, you know, it's a constant state of learning that we are here in this province, and really uh, because of the uh, matters that the member articulated himself and, and knowing uh, how much driving he, uh, he uh, undertakes also, uh, it's very important uh, uh, for us all in the province to be aware of the conditions in the wintertime, and they can get pretty, uh, pretty uh, nasty by times. Uh, that's the nature of our, uh, of our life here uh, in Nova Scotia, offset by the beautiful seasons that are coming up, and now we've got the winter behind us and we're headed into a, we're hopeful for, a, for a, an actual uh, fourth season this year, maybe we'll get a spring. So uh, <clears throat> as a result of the early uh, snow that we had in November, uh, we did a, a complete 
review of our processes around the pass and probably because we're reaching the period of time when we're going to uh, relieve some of the tolling that's there and um, accept that, that highway back into our uh, network and into our own uh, uh, cost structure uh, for the province. So what we did immediately, <clears throat> part of the problem is that we, we weren't nimble enough at that site. The plows that we had on big salt truck plows that were on there were cumbersome in the slick conditions that uh, made themselves apparent in November uh, and uh, also uh, were not able to get around the roadblocks that the jackknifed, uh, uh, jackknifed uh, um, uh, tractor trailers represented. So we immediately acquired uh, two half-ton plow vehicles uh, that uh, are, are deployed that can navigate those uh, particular conditions much uh, better. So that was an immediate response that, uh, <clears throat> that we made. Uh, further recommendation from uh, the uh, senior staff was the uh, introduction of something that we had been looking at for some time, which was, which is a, was a sort of quote unquote rest area, uh, it, it, it sort of halfway. And uh, that has articulated itself into a, uh, an area where there, there will be limited service, but will provide an opportunity for a pull off uh, for a rest, just to get out of the uh, uh, the, the, the traffic flow, <clears throat> which could also be uh, very handy in uh, the uh, uh, event of a storm. In addition to that, uh, there's plans at that juncture, and in conjunction with the pull-off, pull to establish a satellite service uh, area there. A, uh, mini uh, base with uh, uh, the things that we need to have uh, available to us in the event of a, of a storm, salt, sand, and maybe a, uh, a place for those uh, two half-ton uh, trucks that are there too. So that our, our ability to surveil and respond uh, with uh, better uh, quickness and, and nimbleness uh, to those kinds of uh, conditions which in that particular area can come on pretty quick will be significantly improved. So those plans are evolving. Uh, that is uh, now causing us to take a look at the volume of funds that we have available to invest in that particular improvement before we uh, comprehensively remove the tolling. Member for Pictou Center. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Minister, on November the 1st, 2019, winds were so strong in the Nova Scotia side of the marsh that a tractor trailer was blown over. The accident caused the uh, gas, the um, fuel tank to rupture, causing conditions to be more dangerous. The uh, Nova Scotia Department closed the highway on their side, but New Brunswick didn't. A couple questions I have with regard to that. Is there, is there a problem with cooperation between the two provinces? That's one. Two, is it true that protocols in place are not being followed on both sides of the provincial border?
Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Member, for the for the uh, question. <clears throat> the uh, uh, and certainly in my uh, time as uh, Minister of Transportation, uh, have found that the working relationship that we have with the province of New Brunswick is uh, like the PEI uh, relationship that we have, where we're joined by the the transportation system, uh, has been excellent. There's been great uh, cooperation. Um, I'm not aware at uh, at uh, the professional level that there's any uh, uh, lack of communication and I think there's an honest effort to coordinate activities uh, uh, generally in the process. However, there are inherent differences in the policies that would guide the uh, decisions that the Department of Transportation in New Brunswick would make and ours. So those protocols may not be the same. Uh, and. Uh, uh, that could could uh, lead to different decisions being made. But I think uh, your point is well taken. Uh, if you wanted to provide me on a sidebar some of the the information on, on what exactly uh, incident you're talking about, we'll undertake to get that, uh, uh, that particular information for you because this is a very important question. And uh, when we look at the border issue, which is what this is, we find that in almost everything that, that is being done in the border uh, areas is, is requires a, uh, a different lens than uh, uh, what's being done in the interior of either province because in New Brunswick, the gas prices might be different, the alcohol prices might be different, the tobacco prices might be different, and this causes different traffic uh, uh, circumstances uh, in uh, the communities that are border uh, towns like Sackville and Amherst uh, that are affected. So I understand uh, what you're saying. If, if you want to articulate that a little bit uh, more, I'll undertake to get you the, uh, uh, a more comprehensive reply. The member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I believe if my memory is correct, it was, I think it was a truck driver that had mentioned that to me, that uh, on November the 1st, 2019, the uh, extremely strong winds and a transfer truck had blown over, and, and Nova Scotia has shut down their side, New Brunswick didn't, and uh, I can remember him saying, the, uh, he was wondering if there's the protocols and the responsibilities and why didn't New Brunswick shut down their little section there and so on, but that's kind of where I was coming from there. We. Uh, we all realize that these circumstances are dangerous for all motors when, when this type of weather, weather pattern is happening. We, we have many motors on the highway. We have TIR personnel trying to keep the roads open. We have first responders who, uh, who have to arrive in these situations that are sometimes dangerous. Um, I, I guess uh, my next question, I just want a clarification. Does the, uh, does the TIR from New Brunswick have jurisdiction over that entire area, even coming into Nova Scotia, around the Marsh area, do they do they have the jurisdiction over over that area? Minister. The, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank the member for the question. Uh, the cooperation uh, between the two departments in that area I would characterize as being seamless. We've got a great relationship uh, with them. Uh, we work together uh, as much as we can in the process, but the responsibility for the uh, uh, New Brunswick uh, folk ends at the border and Nova Scotia takes over from there. We don't encroach into their uh, province and they don't encroach into ours because there's two separate jurisdictions. Thank you. The member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Minister, do we, have a, do we have enough plows in the fleet to clear and salt our roads during inclement weather? And I'm talking about the entire province there. Like, do we have uh, enough plows in the fleet to, to do, do an adequate job?
Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the for the question. It's a very rele relevant question. Um, just to be uh, to give the member and uh, the House some idea, we currently have 96 graders in the province, uh, 35 uh, plows, uh, 23 excavators, and 248 trailers. Uh, but the uh, overall picture is that we are very well resourced. Uh, we do have enough equipment now to meet our uh, our needs in the uh, in the province. <clears throat> uh, but there are peaks and valleys, so we plan for a steady state. And when we get the once in a 20-year storm. Uh, or whatever, in the, particularly in the winter time, then we have lots of resource out there that we can reach out to on a temporary basis so we can get, uh, again, back to New Brunswick. If you've ever traveled in northern New Brunswick and Campbell to Dalhousie in the winter time, as I have, you will find snow banks that are as high as these rails that we have here, and they're just straight walls. And they're, uh, they get a tremendous pile of snow there consistently, and they employ some huge blowers and there has been occasions when we have uh, had to call on them to get those blowers uh, into Nova Scotia where we, we rent them obviously from them pay them for it uh, to get the the one time uh, or one event use out of them uh, and then uh, it becomes a, an operating expense as opposed to a capital cost of having to invest in that uh, uh, kind of equipment ourselves for perhaps a, a single use uh, every every few years so in the overall picture we pay a lot of attention to our uh, uh, our heavy equipment and we try to uh, give our uh, folks who are, out, who are out there facing the uh, the perils of uh, winter and summer uh, uh, highway activity in this province uh, the best equipment that we can uh, afford uh, to give them uh, so we're, we're not frugal about supplying equipment in place, uh, but we are frugal about tying up capital dollars in uh, equipment that would only be a single-use uh, 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 piece of gear. The member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, <laughs> Minister, you answered my, my next question, so I'll move on. And uh, with, with a limited amount of time and uh, several colleagues wanting to... Uh, ask some local questions tomorrow. I'm going, to, I'm going to jump here to something else here. And next question is, uh, what is the department doing to expand the number of green jobs in, in Nova Scotia? And are there any particular types of green jobs that uh, the department will be targeting uh, in the future? Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Uh, <clears throat> in our department, uh, we are uh, constantly 
uh, dealing with uh, uh, matters of the environment. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how green we are in that regard. We have a lot of people who are involved in uh, uh, making sure that we are uh, compliant with the various uh, uh, requirements of, of our road construction uh, uh, and uh, who, who liaise with the Department of Environment in particular and uh, the Department of uh, Energy around uh, the, uh, uh, the, whole issue, the whole issue of the environment. And we have people who work directly at the environmental assessment in our, in our department. Uh, we were also uh, trying to expand some of that uh, in the Cape Breton area uh, to provide some uh, additional entry uh, level positions for uh, the green uh, side. But perhaps most importantly, our department um, administers the federal green initiative, uh, which provides uh, the disbursement of the uh, uh, funds associated with uh, green initiatives for the entire uh, province. Uh, so our appreciation, understanding, and involvement uh, in that side of the uh, of the, the ledger is uh, perhaps surprising to people, where we uh, are folks who you know we have a lot of engineers. We go out and build things. Uh, uh, we spread a lot of asphalt. Uh, and uh, uh, have a lot of heavy equipment, but we also have a strong commitment to uh, uh, the environment and work very closely with the, uh, uh, the department when it comes to permitting uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, construction of any of these projects. Now, they do tend to be, uh, uh, to be highly visible projects. They're on the highway. I'm thinking of the 102 interchange out there that just got completed on time and on budget and uh, was an excellent project and uh, went very smoothly. Behind the scenes there, there was a lot of work done on, uh, on uh, slate removal there uh, that exists in the, in the Halifax region that has to be um, uh, reconciled. Uh, and uh, we, had, we had people whose sole authority of responsibility there was to do that uh, kind of inspection. Order. Time has lapsed for the PC caucus. We'll move over to the NDP caucus for 24 minutes. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. The first thing I want to do is table a number of articles and documents, uh, which I referred to last hour. Um, and then at the end of my time last uh, hour, my question that the minister did not have a chance to answer, and I'm sure he's very uh, upset that he wasn't able to, but now he has another opportunity. Um, when we receive an estimate from a potential P3 proponent, <coughs> are we given a line-by-line -line breakdown, and are they required to provide us with anticipated rate of profit? The Minister. Madam Chair, I missed the second part of the question. I'm sorry. Oh, the member for Dartmouth North. So the second part was, uh, uh, is the P3 uh, proponent required to provide us with their anticipated rate of profit?
minister. The minister. The minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank the member for the uh, question. And I'm more than delighted to answer her questions, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, in terms of the line-by-line uh, -line financial uh, situation, there's a very comprehensive uh, um, articulation of the financial arrangement uh, that is inherent in the contract, which uh, is proprietary information uh, and uh, will remain so. And as far as the profit goes, uh, we're not uh, privy to what those levels might be. Uh, in the P3 uh, world, nor are we in the regular tendering world for the 300 odd million do uh, dollars that we put out for uh, regular tenders across Nova Scotia. Uh, we have uh, uh, essentially uh, professional people in the field who estimate uh, what the unit costs are for a particular service, put together a, a sort of a ghost bid so we know what to expect. That's taken to the market sometimes, and this is where the importance of the competitive market situation uh, becomes very relevant. Uh, depending on the nature of the contractor, the time of year, the amount of work that they have, their ability, the size of the job, we get uh, an estimate. Uh, a tender, a locked-in price for what it is that they want to uh, charge for the project. And that's the conventional system that we have, and in that system, uh, where we spend uh, approximately $300 million this current year, there is no uh, line that says profit in the, uh, in the uh, process there uh, uh, at all. And, and I, I, I think uh, that's not dissimilar to most uh, Retail kinds of operations that are out there, uh, uh, the uh, the information around profitability or margin, as it's called, or net back, uh, is normally proprietary. The member for Dartmouth North. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, um, and thank you for that answer. Thank the minister uh, for that answer. I'm going to move on a little bit. In December, uh, December last, the Halifax Chamber of Commerce wrote to the minister, and I have a, I can table a copy of the letter to express concern about the governance of the QE2 redevelopment. So my first question is: Has the minister replied to this letter? And if so, can uh, his response be tabled? Would the minister like a copy of that? Can I read it? Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank the member for the question. Uh, yes, I'm very familiar with the uh, correspondence, uh, and I know that uh, a draft has been uh, prepared and circulated for response, but I can't uh, say with certainty whether or not that has actually uh, been finalized, but I would undertake to uh, see where it's at and provide it uh, to the member uh, uh, if indeed it, it, it either has been been sent or is pending uh, to be sent. Thank you. The member for Dartmouth North. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on uh, to ask a couple questions about P3 highways. So, the decision to finance the Cabaquid Pass through a P3 contract cost the province more than $100 million more than it would have to finance it through a government bond issue, which carried a total investment cost of $38.5 million. 
We paid an um, 81 percent premium on the financing of that highway twinning and maintenance, and that's to say nothing of the millions that Nova Scotians have paid in toll since then. Can the minister explain why, based on, the exper on this experience, the department continues to pursue the P3 model? The Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I'd uh, uh, appreciate the question from the from the member, and I'd ask her to cast herself back 24 years, when I'm sure she didn't ever think she'd be sitting in front of <laughs> in this august uh, house uh, when the, when the bond rate uh, at the time uh, that the province could apprehend was uh, in the vicinity of 9%. And today, as you, uh, you know, uh, the bond rate is considerably lower and the Bank of Canada has dropped their, uh, their rate in anticipation of the coronavirus uh, yesterday. So uh, low interest rates have been the hallmark of the last decade in the country and uh, they tend to change. So uh, first of all, in terms of the uh, information that the member is uh, Quoting from, I would ask her if she would mind tabling that, uh, so we have a reference point uh, uh, in the uh, in the discussion, uh, because the the numbers that we have on the process are considerably different, and those numbers are different because we're tolling that particular section of highway, and the toll covers off everything in the uh, uh, in the in the process. It covers the uh, the, the bond financing, uh, the construction, the operating, the maintenance, and the capital replacement, uh, which in that is a bit unique in that situation uh, because we have the toll uh, revenue available uh, to us as opposed to the 104 where we don't. But uh, it would be uh, edifying for us to understand where the member gets the numbers uh, that she's uh, talking about uh, there. But 
it's a different time now in terms of financing. The costs are cons considerably uh, different in the in the uh, in the bond market, and uh, which would which would be an improvement over the uh, the cost situation. But it's all relative to the fact that we're tolling there anyway. And as I mentioned, we haven't increased the toll since 2004, and we have a healthy surplus that will enable us to uh, to to do the kinds of uh, renovations, improvements to that facility uh, and still hopefully have uh, a substantial amount of money to put towards the bond retirement early. The member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sure the minister will understand that I have a hard time casting my mind back 24 years when I am but 25 years old. So um, can't really remember back then. <laughs> um, but I will say also to the minister that, uh, in fact, one of the things I just tabled was that very report you're asking for, that very document you're asking for, uh, as is uh, uh, the document that I'm about to talk about. Um, a recent report from the CCPA estimated that f extra financing and construction costs together would add nearly 120 million to the price tag for the Sutherlands River to Anaganish expansion. Um, given that, cost uh, difference. I'm wondering how the department can justify the enormous, the enormous additional cost to, to build the highway in that, in that way. Minister. On that particular report, uh, Madam Chair, uh, we would agree to disagree. Uh, we don't accept the, those uh, premises uh, or the validity of the argument that exists in that particular document. Thank you. The member for Dartmouth North. Okay, well, uh, that's duly noted. Thank you. Um, I'm going to change um, my uh, tack. I'm going to talk about climate change. Um, so, as the minister may be aware, Canada's National Building Code is undergoing a major rewrite to avoid $300 billion in climate change driven infrastructure failures over the next decade. The changes will cover everything from how concrete is mixed for road construction to roofing standards uh, enabling buildings to withstand stronger storms and, manage, and plans to manage increased flooding. Can the minister tell us what the department is doing locally in Nova Scotia to prepare for these major changes? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank the member uh, for, the, uh, for the question. Uh, a department uh, with as many working parts as ours 
uh, certainly has a uh, very significant um, awareness of the uh, impacts of climate change uh, uh, across our, our network, uh, in our building section, in our highway section, uh, in, in all of the things that we undertake. Uh, on the building section, uh, as an example, uh, we are uh, acutely aware of the uh, National Building Code and the changes that <clears throat> emanate from that, the issues that are uh, uh, surfacing as a result of adaptation that needs to be, uh, uh, needs to be done uh, in view of how the, uh, the climate is, is uh, changing. Uh, as an example, uh, you know, uh, I can think of two, I can think of several, many, but I think of two in particular in this area. One is Lawrencetown Beach and another one is Queens, uh, Queens, it's Queensland. Uh, where we, in, in Nova Scotia, many of our roads are built at sea level because back in the day when roads were evolving, there were, uh, and before the invention of the steam shovel, uh, things were done by hand. So I mean, you couldn't climb mountains and cut rock and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of our, our uh, roads are vulnerable to climate change and to sea level rise, and we're seeing that uh, as, we, uh, uh, as we move uh, through the process here. So number one, we have a significant awareness of that in both our, uh, our uh, departments. But on the other hand, uh, uh, you know, if we look at the uh, isthmus, the Shignecto Isthmus, we have a <clears throat> real interesting partnership with the province of New Brunswick there, where we have, uh, and, uh, and together with the federal government, uh, are involved in a comprehensive review of what it's going to take to uh, armor that uh, vital transportation link uh, for both New Brunswick and Nova Scotia against uh, uh, the, uh, the relentless uh, rise of the Bay of Fundy in, in that particular uh, area. So we're, we, we're out there with our partners trying to uh, understand how that works. Uh, on a very significant other levels, we have something uh, from the federal government called the National Disaster Mitigation Fund. And in Nova Scotia, we have uh, a lot of abatos. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the last uh, few years, I have come to be very fluent in the abato uh, language uh, in, in, uh, in Nova Scotia. Because, because uh, yeah, I think it is. Uh, but I'll tell you, it was, it's very effective what was done with the engineering feats that uh, were done 100 years ago, 100 plus years ago uh, across the province. Uh, and we're very fortunate in that we were able to leverage uh, $25 million from the Disaster uh, Mitigation Fund to uh, match up with our $25 million to go at a comprehensive program to renew the abatos in uh, the province that are essential to our farming, uh, essential to our farming business. Uh, one in particular that we're very pleased uh, that we're able to do something about is the, the Highway uh, 101 twinning uh, that we're doing through, uh, 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 through Windsor, Falmouth through uh, to uh, uh, Windsor, <clears throat> and there's a very significant abateau in there, and uh, we have uh, been able to leverage $32 million from the uh, National Disaster Mitigation Fund uh, to match with $32 million that we're putting up to completely, comprehensively uh, redo that abateau and to restore the natural uh, migration of the fish in that area which has been impeded by the abateau that was put in there whenever that uh, section of highway was, uh, was built. So uh, as we progress through our uh, process here, uh, and there are many, many 
um, touch points that we have with the uh, uh, with the, the 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 green environment. As I mentioned uh, earlier uh, to our uh, colleague from Picto Center, uh, uh, there is a, a very comprehensive um, section in the department that is aimed at uh, uh, working with the Department of Environment and, and uh, 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 meeting our uh, green uh, uh, targets uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. So those are some examples of what we're looking at uh, doing. I recognize the member for Dartmouth North. Well, thank you to the minister for that answer. Um, good to know that um, the department's thinking about these things. Um, about, I just wanted to sort of refocus the question, which is about um, the, the changes in the National Building Code. And so Nova Scotia will have to comply with those, obviously. And so I'm wondering, um, kind of as a B part, how will the department ensure that all of our public infrastructure in Nova Scotia will be compliant with the new standards? Um, Yeah, I, I don't know when they come into effect, but in the next year, probably. The Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for the question. Certainly, as a responsible uh, government, uh, we are striving to comply with all the uh, regulations that are associated with uh, our activities that we undertake. Uh, we're also uh, uh, guided by a program that I'm sure the member is familiar with called the LEAD program, which has various levels of, uh, of uh, uh, certification. Uh, and we employ that uh, uh, LEAD certification in, in the uh, projects that we uh, undertake uh, uh, throughout uh, throughout uh, the, pro the, the province. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, it is uh, uh, vitally important to us, and that's this gentleman's uh, responsibility here, to make sure that we are constantly uh, in uh, compliance with the uh, uh, requirements under the National uh, Building Code, whatever we go to undertake. Uh, needs to have that certification. As the changes associated with climate change find their way into that aspect of our lives, which it's everywhere, uh, of course, then we will uh, adapt our practices to, uh, to meet those requirements. Order. Time has lapsed for uh, consideration of supply for today. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. At the, I move that the committee do now rise and that your report progress and beg leave to sit again. The motion is carried. The committee will now rise and report its business to the House. Speak to us Order, please. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on Supply will now report. That the Committee of the Whole House on Supply has met 
and has made some considerable progress and begs leave to sit again. Thank you very much. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call public bills for third readings? We'll now call public bills for third Sorry. readings. Sorry, everybody. Uh, Mr. Speaker, would you please call bill number 220, the Labour Standards Code, respecting leave? We'll now call bill number 220, the Labour Standards Code, respecting leave. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that bill number 220, entitled an act to amend chapter 246 of the revised statutes 1989, the Labour Standards Code, respecting leave, be now read a third time and due pass. The proposed amendments we put forward will provide our reservists of the Canadian Armed Forces with better job protection. Mr. Speaker, the reservists put their lives on hold and make significant sacrifices for us, and they deserve to be protected. These amendments are a step in the right direction. They will ensure our reservists have the ability to take the necessary leaves for training and deployment and have the comfort knowing they have a job to come home to. I would also like to note that these changes will align us with recent changes made to the federal government's reservist leave. Mr. Speaker, I can assure you that all of the feedback we received has been reviewed and considered in our, in our decision. At the end of the day, we need to make sure our reservists have the training and protection they need to serve our country and succeed. These changes are positive. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for introducing this uh, piece of legislation. Uh, nothing new to add, uh, the PC Caucus will support this bill. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, just a few short words on this bill. Um, we all know that reservists are important for the protection of Nova Scotia and Canada, and their leave should be protected. The interests of their employers should also be protected, as the <laughs> reservists' leave can have an impact on businesses, namely small businesses. Um, along with the provision of support for more components of the service process, including all deployment training, time tra uh, travel time and treatment, the broadening, of def uh, the broadening of the definition of service, specifically in terms of including mental health, is a, a, an important and welcome change in this bill. Um, we also wanted to highlight that the bill uh, um, highlights the ongoing issue of women's reproductive rights within the workforce, and pregnancy should not be a reason for a woman to be punished. <coughs> With those few uh, short words, I will uh, express my support for the bill and take my seat. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Labour. It will be to close third reading of Bill Number 220, the Labour Standards Code, respecting leave. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, everyone, for your comments and for your support on the bill. And, Mr. Speaker, I rise to close third reading on Bill Number 220. Motion is for third reading of Bill Number 220, the Labour Standards Code, respecting leave. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill Number 220, an act to amend Chapter 246 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Labour Standards Code, respecting leave. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 221, the Labour Standards Code. We'll now call Bill Number 221, the Labour Standards Code. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill Number 221, entitled an act to amend the Labour Standards Code, be now read a third time and do pass. The proposed changes to the Labour Standards Code will help address Nova Scotia's gender wage gap. Mr. Speaker, women play a vital role in our economic growth. However, the gender wage gap remains a major issue facing women. Mr. Speaker, on average, women are being paid less than men in their jobs in every sector, and this is unacceptable. The proposed amendments brought forward will prohibit employers from asking job applicants and current employees about their previous salaries. They will also prohibit employers from banning employees from discussing or disclosing their own wages or other employees' wages. Mr. Speaker, these changes will help bring more transparency to the salary of both women and men and ensure that employees are paid a wage that reflects their qualifications, experience and value. Additionally, these changes will expand the equal pay provisions currently in the Labour Standards Code to employees who do not identify exclusively or at all as men or women. They will also allow government to expand through regulation equal pay provision to employees who possess certain characteristics such as those related to race or ethnicity. 
Mr. Speaker, these are important steps to ensure our regulations reflect our diverse workforce. And these amendments further allow government to establish, through regulations, administrative penalties. These amendments set the foundation for a stronger and fairer and just workforce in Nova Scotia. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think this legislation is a great step forward in reducing the uh, gender wage gap in this province. And uh, I'm looking forward to what regulations bring, and the PC Caucus will support this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dermot North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, hate to disappoint the House, but I'm going to say a few uh, a slightly longer words on this one. Um, uh, yes, it is important that we uh, that significant changes are made to the Labour Standards Code uh, that address the gender wage gap. Um, it, the code must be updated to meet contemporary needs and demands. We know that the, the wage gap is remarkably high in Nova Scotia, 73 cents on the dollar, and strong legislation is needed in order to change this. Systemic issues impact the wage gap in Nova Scotia, including gender, base, gender biases and racism, which need a comprehensive and pointed approach from this government. And while this bill establishes penalties for non-compliance, it does not change the systemic issue of wage inequality we face. The bill does not propel any meaningful changes associated to institutionalized patriarchal values, which clearly and conclusively impact women's wages. And why is the gender wage gap so wide in Nova Scotia, and, 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 and why is this a problem? Because patriarchy. Patriarchy and misogyny are alive and well in Nova Scotia. Alive and well and living in Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, it begs pointing out that some of the leaders in, and many of the leaders in fighting gender wage gaps are labor unions. In many ways, it is the labor movement that has addressed systemic issues that affect women. And so another way we could address this issue is by strengthening our Trade Union Act. We could respect collective bargaining processes, and we could address labor laws that make it difficult for workers to form unions in the first place. These are places we have to go to address this issue. International Women's Day, March 8th, is only a few days away. This is the ideal time to illuminate the struggles faced by women, particularly racialized women, in regards to the systemic and insidious issue of wage inequality. While this bill re represents a small step forward, the work remaining in this area remains significant. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. And the status of women, Mr. Speaker, and it's in that particular role that I'll be making my remarks here today. Uh, I, I would... I would like to note that since we introduced this bill, uh, I've had I've had the opportunity to meet with a number of women, particularly at some um, um, International Women's Day events uh, throughout this week. I've, I've I've attended quite a few this week, and. Um, I, I, I told the story at, at, at one of them about uh, Engineers Nova Scotia, which several years ago uh, actually uh, posted the the wages, the, the median wages of engineers at every year along uh, the, their career path, and they and they posted them for men and they posted them for women, and at every single stage along the way, women made less than men. So the minute they got out of university, no matter what their marks were, no matter how successful they were, women were making less than men. And what Engineers Nova Scotia found was that as a result of posting these salaries, when women went in for job interviews, they could in fact say, and this is what we were hearing was happening, they could say, yes, I'd like to work for you, but I want the male salary, not the women's salary. And so, Mr. Speaker, I do believe that this bill has value, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my honourable colleague for bringing it forward. Um, it, I believe it is one way that we can help narrow that gender wage gap. Yes, when we look at all employees in Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, um, women make 73 cents on the dollar. When we look at full-time employees, the gap is much smaller, Mr. Speaker, but there is still a gap. And it can't be explained by things like experience or education. Um, 
It may, in fact, be explained by patriarchy. It may be explained by unconscious bias, Mr. Speaker. We assume men are competent, and experience would show that's not always the case. We assume... <laughs> So much fun this week, I have to say. Um, we assume, we, and so there's there's a competence bias in favor of men. There's there's a, there's a, a compassion bias in, in in favor of women, and women aren't always compassionate either. So I will just say that uh, on behalf of uh, my sex. But what I will say, Mr. Speaker, is that this is one step down the road. We know that employers can choose to hire rather than saying, "What did you make in your last job?" Uh, they can choose to hire, Mr. Speaker based on what they're willing to pay. And so this, this bill helps us move us along this way. I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for introducing the bill. I'd like to thank um, uh, those of my colleagues in the House who are going to support it. And uh, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues on this side of the House for supporting it as well. Thank you. I want to recognize the Honourable Minister of Labour. It will be to close third reading of Bill Number 221, the Labour Standards Code. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, hard to follow up that one. I would agree with pretty much everything she said, um, especially the term about competence. I think uh, there's always incompetence uh, wherever you are, and uh, you know the goal is to have uh, less of it, and you know. Being in this place, sometimes we uh, witness it and we feel it ourselves after these long hours. And Mr. Speaker, with those few words, I rise to close third reading on Bill 221. The motion is for third reading of Bill number 221, the Labour Standards Code. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 221, an act to amend chapter 246 of the revised statutes 1989, the Labour Standards Code. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call bill number 223, the University Foundations Act. Now call bill number 223, the University Foundations Act. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, I move that bill number 223 entitled an act to amend the University Foundations Act be now read a third time and do pass. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is a housekeeping bill. The, uh, Every university in the province is legislated to have a university foundation. When this was put in uh, place many decades ago, it was actually uh, due to the tax laws in Canada and the foundations gave uh, preferential tax treatment to our universities. Uh, those laws are no longer in place, so there's actually no, um, there's no preferential treatment to the university foundations versus the universities. So approximately, I believe, seven of the ten universities have expressed their um, desire to dissolve their foundations and all the reporting requirements with it. Three of them have actually expressed the desire to keep their foundations. So what we've done in this bill is we're leaving the option up to the universities, and if they'd like to keep the foundations, it's their call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I spoke to the stakeholders that will be impacted by this legislation who are all supportive, and uh, so our, our caucus will support this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dermot North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad to stand and speak to Bill 223. It's a logical change. We're happy to support it. Uh, however, I am compelled to take this opportunity <laughs> to raise a number of issues related to our universities. <clears throat> Most students have deregulated tuition fees, Mr. Speaker, which can rise by any amount. This is coupled with an only 1% increase in university funding, which effect, effect, effectively amounts to a cut. Nova Scotian students are now facing the highest tuition fees in the country. Tuition has increased more than 20% since this government came into power. This is disappointing, and we will continue to push for better in Nova Scotia. That being said, we support this bill. Thank you. <laughs> Fine to recognize the Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. It will be to close third reading of Bill Number 223, the University Foundations Act. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for all the comments. Um, universities are very important for this government. Um, in this current um, budget, 
there was actually a 6% um, increase for this year given to universities to address their uh, deferred maintenance. Universities have uh, many buildings, many assets, and in terms of um, a cost pressure, it's very high, and that 6% equates to $20 million. The MOU actually has a 2% increase, 1% to operating. 1% is targeted to sexual violence and to mental health, which is uh, two very key areas on campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Speaker, last year's budget, we brought in great supports in our universities for low-income Nova Scotians. We made university tuition um, in terms of when you get your Nova Scotia student loan fully forgivable, which is up to $7,200 per year. And this year, we're extending that to the Nova Scotia Community Colleges. And with those few words, Mr. Speaker, I rise to close third reading on Bill 223. Thank you. The motion is for third reading of Bill number 223, the University Foundations Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. 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 Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill number 223, an act to amend Chapter 8 of the Acts of 1991, the University Foundations Act. Ordered that this bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill number 225, the Elections Act. We'll now call Bill number 225, the Elections Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill number 225 be read a third time and do pass. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I, had, I think I spoke enough at length on, uh, on second reading. I did, uh, I did raise the possibility of an election. <laughs> I always like to look at people's eyes to see if they can give something away when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker, I uh, will be supporting this bill. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise and uh, speak to Bill Number 225. Uh, we will also be supporting this bill, as we noted at second reading. It does cover most of the requests made uh, by Elections Nova Scotia. I would be remiss if I didn't note that it does not, in fact, uh, enshrine fixed election dates into law, something which I respectfully disagree with the Minister and would say does work. Um, but we can continue to have that debate as the days and months wear on. Um, I, I do think it would do a service to Nova Scotians to have more certainty around when they head to the polls. And I also think it would do a service to the government uh, to not have every move of theirs constantly speculated upon uh, and to always have people wondering whether it's a political stunt or real policy. Uh, so we in the NDP caucus will continue to push for fixed election dates, uh, but beyond that, uh, we're pleased with this bill and we're happy to support it. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice. It will be to close third reading of Bill Number 225, the Elections Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the comments and support of my colleagues. With those uh, few comments, I rise to close debate on Bill 225, the Elections Act. <laughs> motion is for third reading of Bill Number 225, the Elections Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 225, an act to amend Chapter 5 of the Acts of 2011, the Elections Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill number 226, the Companies Act. We'll now call Bill number 226, the Companies Act. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill number 226, the Companies Act, be read a third time and do pass. <laughs> the amendments we're making to the Companies Act, Mr. Speaker, speak to our commitment to protect and promote Nova Scotians as a province where people can work and safely, work, safely work and succeed. We're amending the Companies Act to put appropriate safeguards in place, safeguards that will increase transparency and help to prevent the misuse of Nova Scotia companies for illegal activities such as tax evasion, money laundering, corruption, and the financing of terrorist activities. Introducing these legislative changes is part of a commitment that was made by the federal, provincial, territorial ministers and means that companies incorporated in our province will be required to collect, maintain and update information about who owns, controls or benefits from a company and the income it generates. Law enforcement and tax authorities will then be able to access this information from the company to help counter illegal activity. 
Similar amendments, Mr. Speaker, are already in effect federally and in Manitoba, Prince Edward Island, and British Columbia. Helping to prevent companies operating in our province from being used for illegal activity will protect our citizens and support a strong economy. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I, I can say that we support the legislation. We hope that it works. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Ditto. <laughs> Great debate here in the legislature this evening. Yeah. The honor, if I'm to recognize the Honourable uh, Minister of Service, Nova Scotia, will be to close third reading of Bill Number 226, the Companies Act. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm totally like printing off the Hansard for tonight and like framing it in my office somewhere. Uh, and with that, I rise to close uh, third reading for Bill Number 226, the Companies Act. The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 226, the Companies Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? aye. Contrary-minded, nay. <laughs> motion is carried. Bill number 226, an act to amend chapter 81 of the revised statutes 1989, the Companies Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call bill number 227, the Legal Aid Act. We'll now call bill number 227, the Legal Aid Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move the bill number 227 an act to amend Chapter 252 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Legal Aid Act, be read a third time and do pass. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are pleased to support the changes contained in Bill 227 to modernize the Legal Aid Act. Thank the Minister and his department for bringing this forth and the consultation that they had with the Legal Aid Commission. Thanks. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise and speak to Bill 227, the Legal Aid Act. Uh, the NDP caucus also supports these changes. Um, I want to also thank the staff that worked on this and the Legal Aid Commission for their hard work. Uh, we believe that this act uh, is a not only modernizes the legislation, which it needed to do, but also gives the Commission more latitude to do the good work that they are doing. Um, and we also want to thank the government for bringing, the, bringing in the amendment asked for by the Commission, which will allow their good chair uh, to stay on a little bit longer and delay the coming into force of one of the um, provisions in the Act. Uh, and with those few words, I'll take my seat. If I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice, it will be to close third reading of Bill Number 227, the Legal Aid Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to close debate on Bill 227, the Legal Aid Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 227, an act to amend chapter 252 of the revised statutes 1989, the Legal Aid Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call bill number 228, the Housing Nova Scotia Act. We'll now call bill number 228, the Housing Nova Scotia Act. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to move third reading of uh, Bill Number 228, the Housing Nova Scotia Act. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for bringing this forward. We do support, on the progressive conservative side of the House, this Act. What we're really looking forward to, although this is an enabler to make money flow to those who need it and to improve the housing in Nova Scotia, it's one of those things that you now have the capacity and you have the ability to do it. We're looking forward to seeing what happens next week and uh, when we talk about the budget, I'd like to really see how that money, an ex explanation as to what it's going to do, how it's going to do it, and the fact that now we have this is good. Now, we do support this and I look forward to the very few words from the NDP. Thank you. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm glad to stay to stand today, tonight, and uh, speak to Bill 228, an act to amend the Housing Nova Scotia Act. Um, we've spoken at length in this House about uh, the crisis that we are witnessing in our constituency offices and in our communities uh, as it regards to housing. 
I um, do not object to the government adding this particular tool of portable rent supplements to its toolbox, but I would argue um, that uh, it is a variation um, it's a variation on the tool that they have used over and over and over again, despite uh, much evidence that other other measures, other um, other strategies are required to actually make a difference in uh, in our housing market. And for so many Nova Scotians, so many Nova Scotians who are truly struggling to um, have housing stability and the stability in their financial lives and in their family lives as unpredictable rent increases and rent evictions um, are, uh, are, are making it difficult for them to, to maintain a, a roof over their heads. And I would say that um, I, I think that this government has been, has been slow to, to really capture and, and, and comprehend um, the scale and the depth of, of the, the housing situations, um, of the housing crisis that many Nova Scotians are experiencing. Um, and, and so I, I look forward to the, to the <laughs> I don't know what I look forward to. I look, for, I look forward to, um, yeah, <laughs> adjournment might be it. I look, I look forward to late, but, uh, but adequate uh, action in the face of the situation that we're actually in. And this bill is not it, but I don't object to it. Thank you very much. I want to recognize the Honourable Minister of Housing. It will be to close third reading of Bill Number 228, the Housing Nova Scotia Act. The Honourable Minister of Housing. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and um, I would thank my uh, honourable colleagues for their comments. Although I would respectfully disagree with the previous comments that were just made with regards to us moving slowly. And Mr. Speaker, uh, I want all Nova Scotians to know, and all members of this House, we've stood many times in this House and talked about the challenges around housing. That's why this government is making the investments that they're making and have not just started making them, Mr. Speaker. This government has been investing in housing for years with tune of millions and millions of dollars. We'll continue that. We're working hard every single day. Staff work hard every single day in this province to do better by the people who are looking for affordable housing and options in this province, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to do that. I think it's important to make that point clear. This isn't something we just started today. We've been working at it. We'll continue to work at it. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. With those few comments tonight, I will move to close debate on Bill 228. The, the, the enthusiastic motion is to close bill, uh, debate on uh, Bill number 228, the Housing Nova Scotia Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 228, an act to amend chapter 213 of the revised statutes 1989, the Housing Nova Scotia Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call bill number 230, Municipal Government Act and the an act to amend Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting ministerial approvals. We'll now call bill number 230, the Municipal Government Act, an act to amend the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting ministerial approvals. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I move debate, uh, third reading uh, for bill number 230. The Honourable Member for Sackville, Cobbequid. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, we, the Progressive Conservatives, absolutely support anything that is a process improvement, eliminating waste. You don't need two minister signatures when one will do. And also, too, the fact that uh, it's, there is still aud audibility with both the municipality of HRM, they have a $500,000 spending limit. When you put that over a couple of years, there's audit procedures in the municipality that will look at that, so you don't need the minister to continuously look at that. Nor with the non-HRM municipalities where it's a $100,000 spending limit over a couple of years, you don't need another signature to do that. But you know, one of the other aspects of this was where two departments are required, and you have to sign off from one department. Why do you need the Minister of Municipal and Housing to sign off at it as well? So it improves it, saves you time, saves everybody time. It's a good thing. Thank you. 
The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Speaker, um, Yes, this is a process of improvement and, and a relatively um, modest change to both the Municipal Government Act and also to the HRM Charter. I will note that we have on the order paper numerous other uh, relatively modest um, uh, amendments to both of those acts uh, that have been requested by municipalities, including, for example, uh, 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 an act that would give um, permanent residents uh, the right to vote in municipal elections. Uh, we're coming up on, on one of those in the fall, and it has been uh, three years since Halifax asked for uh, for that amendment to the Halifax Charter. It's it's unfortunate that the government has not chosen to open up these bills a, a few more times in response to I think very reasonable and well reasoned and well researched uh, requests from from the Halifax municipality and from other municipalities. Inclusive zoning is the one that I talked about the other day. Um, Anyhow, we'll see you here another time, and maybe we'll maybe we'll see both of these acts opened up for more robust purposes. I, I'm glad to see it happen once. Thank you. Unrecognized, the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs, be to close third reading of the Municipal Government Act, an act to amend the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting ministerial approvals. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and with a little less enthusiasm, I'll move to close debate. <laughs> third reading of Bill Number Two Three Zero. The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 230, the Municipal Government Act, an act to amend in the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting ministerial approvals. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill Number 230, an act to amend Chapter 18 of the Acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act, and Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting ministerial approvals. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 232, the Electricity Act? We'll now call Bill Number 232, the Electricity Act. The Honourable. <laughs> the, the Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Uh, I think they heard enough in estimates tonight. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that bill number 232 be read for a third time and do pass. The Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. Mr. Speaker, we were doing so well. <laughs> but I can assure you this is not an opposition that's just going to roll over. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I don't have enough information. On this, uh, on this bill and, and what it's doing to, uh, to put my support behind it. Um, I th I, a number of things, I've raised them on, on second reading. Um, renewable energy can be a wonderful thing. Uh, but my concern here is that, um, my concern is with one-offs and with governments. Uh, and in this case, I'm not looking directly at the, this government, but I'm looking at the federal government with, with one-offs uh, my concern is that sometimes governments are more concerned with looking good than doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And in this case, for the environment. Um, and I, I would use as, a, as an example of the past, the ComFit program, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look at the pricing for wind power versus uh, large wind farms, Mr. Speaker. Uh, much more affordable renewable power. So any which way you look at it, it would have been cheaper or you could have added more renewable power on the grid for the same price. So, so that's my concern, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, with this bill. Um, I think about um, when renewable energy is added to the grid, um, if it's uh, management of coal plants, uh, we know they produce a lot of emissions. Uh, if they're not running as efficiently as, as they should be, uh, that could be causing more pollution. So I don't have enough information to support this bill. And uh, I'll close with this, Mr. Speaker. I, I don't know what to make of the fellow running the country up in Ottawa. And if I may borrow a quote from the late Malcolm McEachern and Judick, and I think he was referring to the Tories at the time, but I think they've gone clear, clean, clip to the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, 
I am really glad to stand up and speak to this bill today and act to amend the Electricity Act. Uh, been talking all night, Mr. Speaker, about electricity, about energy efficiency, um, and I'm going to keep doing it for a few more minutes. Um, we are glad to see this program in place, and it's a really good start, uh, though we believe that there is a vast array of improvements that need to be made to our energy regime to address the climate crisis. Without details or targets about this program, it's difficult to say what impact it will have on the province's emissions. As wind and solar energy become more cost competitive and as storage technologies advances, adv technology advances, it will be more and more possible to continue to add renewable energy to the grid. But Mr. Speaker, we need to make sure that our regulatory regime enables the shift. Uh, as I said on second reading, uh, it would be great if the provincial government would lead the way by using this, uh, this um, uh, system as a, uh, the, mm -hmm, sorry, I'll start that again. It would be good if the provincial government would lead the way by making use of the procurement, procurement pathway for its own uh, buildings and uh, fleets. Uh, we need to also make it easier for communities and individuals to generate their own renewable energy. We've talked about virtual net metering. Uh, we talked about it in estimates a little bit. The minister says it's coming. Uh, it's one way that we can enable this, as we heard about uh, at law amendments from the Canadian Solar Industries Association. It sounds like a great idea, especially given uh, the fact that we've heard from the minister tonight that uh, one of the priorities for the department is people that live on low incomes or with low incomes. Um, it would allow for accessible and affordable renewable energy by, people, uh, by uh, allowing people to subscribe to a, to a community solar or wind farm. So these programs uh, exist in other parts of the world. They make a lot of sense. Um, we can build on them and expand on them. At the same time, we need to be vi vigilant to signals from Nova Scotia Power that they are attempting to limit net metering programs for individuals who generate their own electri uh, renewable electricity. So we should be encouraging this and making it accessible as possible and not allowing Nova Scotia Power to limit community generation. We also, Mr. Speaker, need a total energy strategy that considers the generation and use of all kinds of energy for heating, transportation and electricity. Of course, I, I couldn't sit down without mentioning uh, targets. Uh, the NDP has advocated for aggressive targets for renewable energy generation, energy efficiency, system-wide building retrofits, and electrification of transportation. And we need a just transition away from uh, coal and oil. Um, and all of this is underpinned by the need for more aggressive greenhouse gas emissions targets. That is why the NDP has pushed for 50% below 1990 levels by 2030. Nova Scotia's fair share of what's required to keep global warming below catastrophic levels. I, I recognize that we are leaders in the country, but we need to do more. No doubt this program is a good start, Mr. Speaker, but we can and we must do much more, which is why we in the NDP are pushing at every chance we get for meaningful, substantial action on climate change and renewable energy growth. Thank you. Time to recognize the Honourable Minister of Mines and Energy. It will be to close uh, third reading on Bill Number 232, the Electricity Act. The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank my colleagues for the comments. Uh, this is green choice, so they will pay a premium rate for this. This will not impact rates, and this will result in tens of millions of dollars of green construction in the province. So, this is a good bill moving forward. So, I appreciate everybody's comments, and with that, I rise to close debate on Bill 232, the Electricity Act. Motion is for third reading of Bill Number. 232, the Electricity Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. nay. The motion is carried. Bill number 232, an act to amend Chapter 25 of the Acts of 2004, the Electricity Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honorable Deputy Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Everybody still having fun? Want to continue? That, that concludes government business for today. I move that the House now rise to meet again tomorrow, Friday, March 6th, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 11.59 p.m. Following the daily routine in QP, business will include Committee of the Whole House on Bills, Bill 191, 233, 234, 236, 
238 and 240. Uh, also note that the uh, Committee on Law Amendments will be meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m. to consider bills 242, 243, and 241. Thank you. Motion is for the House to adjourn to rise again tomorrow, Friday, March the 6th, uh, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 11.59 p.m. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. House now stands adjourned until tomorrow at 1 p.m.